Section One of the Broad Highway. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Leader. The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. Section One. To Shirley Byron Jevons, the friend of my boyish ambitions, this book is dedicated as a mark of my gratitude, affection, and esteem. J. F. Ante Scriptum As I sat of an early summer morning in the shade of a tree, eating fried bacon with a tinker, the thought came to me that I might some day write a book of my own, a book that should treat of the roads and by-roads, of trees and wind in lonely places, of rapid brooks and lazy streams, of the glory of dawn, the glow of evening, and of the purple solitude of night. A book of wayside inns and sequestered taverns, a book of country things and ways and people, and the thought pleased me much. But, objected the tinker, for I had spoken my thought aloud, trees and such like don't sound very interesting, leastways not in a book, for after all, a tree's only a tree, and an inn an inn. No, you must tell of other things as well. Yes, said I, a little damped. To be sure, there there is a highwayman. Come, that's better, said the tinker encouragingly. Then, I went on, ticking off each item on my fingers, come Tom Cragg, the pugilist. Better and better, nodded the tinker. A one-legged soldier of the peninsula, an adventurer at a lonely tavern, a flight through woods at midnight pursued by desperate villains, and a most extraordinary tinker. So far so good, I think, and it all sounds adventurous enough. What? cried the tinker. Would you put me in your book, then? Assuredly. Why, then, said the tinker, it's true I mends kettles, sharpens scissors and such, but I likewise peddles books and novels, and what's more I reads em. So if you must put me in your book, you might call me a literary cove. A literary cove, said I. Ah, said the tinker, it sounds better, a sight better. Besides, I never read a novel with a tinker in it, as I remember. They're generally dukes, or earls, or baronites. And nobody wants to read about a tinker. That all depends, said I. A tinker may be much more interesting than an earl, or even a duke. The tinker examined the piece of bacon upon his knife-point with a cold and disparaging eye. "'I've read a good many novels in my time,' said he, shaking his head, "'and I knows what I'm talking of.' Here he bolted the morsel of bacon with much apparent relish. "'I've made love to duchesses, run off with heiresses, and fought duels, all by the hundred, all between the covers of some book or other, and I enjoyed it uncommonly well, especially the duels. If you can get a little blood into your book, so much the better. There's nothing like a little blood in a book.' not a great deal, but just enough to give it a, a tang, so to speak. If you could kill your highwayman to start with, it would be a very good beginning to your story. I could do that, certainly, said I, but it would not be according to fact. <laughs> so much the better, said the tinker. Who wants facts in a novel? Hmm, said I. And uh, then again, what more, I inquired. "'Love,' said the tinker, wiping his knife-blade on the leg of his breeches. "'Love?' I repeated. "'And plenty of it,' said the tinker. "'I'm afraid that is impossible,' said I, after a moment's thought. "'How impossible?' "'Because I know nothing about love.' Oh, "'That's a pity,' said the tinker. <laughs> "'Under the circumstances it is,' said I. "'Not a doubt of it.' said the tinker, beginning to scrub out the frying-pan with a handful of grass. Though, to be sure, you might learn. You're young enough. Yes, I might learn, said I. Who knows? Ah, who knows, said the tinker. And, after he had cleansed the pan to his satisfaction, he turned to me with dexter finger upraised and brow of heavy portent. Young fellow, said he, no man can write a good novel without he knows something about love. It ought to be expected. So the sooner you do learn, the better. 
Hmm, said I. And then, as I said afore, and I say it again, they wants love in a book nowadays, and what's more, they will have it. They, said I, and the focus will read your book, after it is written. Ah, to be sure, said I, somewhat taken aback, I had forgotten them. "'Forgotten them?' repeated the tinker, staring. "'Forgotten that people might want to read it after it is written.' "'But,' said the tinker, rubbing his nose hard, "'books are written for people to read, aren't they?' Oh, "'Not always,' said I. Hereupon the tinker rubbed his nose harder than ever. Many of the world's greatest books, those masterpieces that have lived and shall live on for ever, were written, as I believe, for the pure love of writing them. Oh, said the tinker. Yes, said I, warming to my theme, and with little or no idea of the eyes of those unborn generations which were to read and marvel at them. Hence it is we get those sublime thoughts untrammeled by passing tastes and fashions, unbounded by narrow creed or popular prejudice. Ah, said the tinker. Many a great writer has been spoiled by fashion and success, for, so soon as he begins to think upon his public how best to please and hold their fancy, which is ever the most fickle of mundane things, straightway genius spreads abroad his pinions and leaves him in the mire. "'Poor cove,' said the tinker. "'Young man, you smile, I think.' "'No,' said I. "'Well, suppose a writer never had no genius. How then?' "'Why, then?' said I, he should never dare to write at all. <laughs> young fellow, said the tinker, glancing at me from the corners of his eyes, are you sure you're a genus, then? Now, when my companion said this, I fell silent for the very sufficient reason that I found nothing to say. Lord love you, said he at last, seeing me thus hipped. Don't be downhearted. Don't be dashed afore you begin. We can't all be genuses. It aren't to be expected. But some of us is a good deal better than most, and that's something after all. As for your book, what you have to do is to give him a little blood now and then, with plenty of love, and you can't go far wrong. Now whether the tinker's theory for the writing of a good novel be right or wrong, I will not presume to say. But in this book that lies before you, though you shall read, if you choose, of country things and ways and people, yet because that part of my life herein recorded was a sometimes hard, rough life, you shall read also of blood, and, because I came, in the end, to love very greatly, so shall you read of love. Wherefore, then, I am emboldened to hope that when you shall have turned the last page and closed this book, you shall do so with a sigh. P. V. London Chapter 1 chiefly concerning my uncle's last will and testament and to my nephew morris vibbert i bequeath the sum of twenty thousand pounds in the fervent hope that it may help him to the devil within the year or as soon after as may be here mr granger paused in his reading to glance up over the rim of his spectacles while sir richard lay back in his chair and laughed loudly gad he exclaimed still chuckling I'd give a hundred pounds if he could have been present to hear that. And the baronet went off into another roar of merriment. Mr. Granger, on the other hand, dignified and solemn, coughed a short dry cough behind his hand. Help him to the devil within the year, <laughs> repeated Sir Richard, still chuckling. Pray proceed, sir, said I, motioning towards the will. But instead of complying, Mr. Granger laid down the parchment, and, removing his spectacles, began to polish them with a large silk handkerchief. "'You are, I believe, unacquainted with your cousin, Sir Morris Vibbert?' he inquired. "'I have never seen him,' said I. "'All my life has been passed either at school or the university, but I have frequently heard mention of him nevertheless.' "'Egad!' cried Sir Richard. "'Who hasn't heard of Buck Vibbert? "'Beat Ted Jarrow, eh, of Swansea in five rounds. "'Drove coach and four down Whitehall, on sidewalk. "'Ran away with a French marquise while but a boy of twenty, "'and shot her husband into the bargain. "'Devilish celebrated figure in sporting circles, "'a friend of the Prince Regent.' "'And so I understand,' 
said I. Altogether as complete a young blackguard as ever swaggered down St. James. Having said which, Sir Richard crossed his legs and inhaled a pinch of snuff. Twenty thousand pounds is a very handsome sum, remarked Mr. Granger, ponderously, and uh, as though more with the intention of saying something rather than remain silent just then. Indeed it is, said I, and might help a man to the devil as comfortably as need be, but— though pursued mr granger much below his expectations and sadly inadequate to his present needs i fear that is most unfortunate said i but his debts said mr granger busy at his spectacles again his debts are very heavy i believe then doubtless some arrangement can be made to but continue your reading i beg said i Mr. Granger repeated his short, dry cough, and, taking up the will, slowly and almost as though unwillingly, cleared his throat and began as follows. Furthermore, to my nephew Peter Vibbert, cousin to the above, I will and bequeath my blessing and the sum of ten guineas in cash, wherewith to purchase a copy of Zeno or any other of the Stoic philosophers he may prefer. Again Mr. Granger laid down the will, and again he regarded me over the rim of his spectacles. "'Good God!' cried Sir Richard, leaping to his feet. "'The man must have been mad! Ten guineas! Why, it's an insult! Damn, it's an insult! You'll never take it, of course, Peter.' "'On the contrary, sir,' said I. "'But ten guineas!' bellowed the baronet. "'On my soul now, George was a cold-blooded fish, "'but I didn't think even he was as capable of such a despicable trick. "'No, curse me if I did. "'Why, it would have been kinder to have left you nothing at all. "'But it was like George, bitter to the end. <laughs> ten guineas is ten guineas,' said I, "'and when one comes to think of it, much may be done with ten guineas.' Sir Richard grew purple in the face, but before he could speak, Mr. Granger began to read again. Moreover, the sum of five hundred thousand pounds, now vested in the funds, shall be paid to either Morris or Peter Vibbert aforesaid, if either shall, within one calendar year, become the husband of the Lady Sophia Sefton of Camburn. Good God! exclaimed Sir Richard. Failing which, read Mr. Granger, the said sum, namely five hundred thousand pounds, shall be bestowed upon such charity or charities as the trustees shall select. Signed by me this tenth day of April, eighteen hundred and George Vibbert, duly witnessed by Adam Penfleet, Martha Trent. Here Mr. Granger's voice stopped, and, I remember, in the silence that followed, the parchment crackled very loudly as he folded it precisely and laid it on the table before him. I remember also that Sir Richard was swearing vehemently under his breath as he paced to and fro between me and the window. "'And that is all?' I inquired at last. "'That,' said Mr. Granger, not looking at me now, "'is all.' "'The Lady Sophia,' murmured Sir Richard as to himself. "'The Lady Sophia!' And then, suddenly stopping before me in his walk, "'Oh, Peter!' said he, clapping his hand down upon my shoulder. "'Oh, Peter, that settles it. You're done for, boy. A crueler will was never made.' "'Marriage,' said I to myself. "'Hum! A damnable iniquity!' exclaimed Sir Richard, striding up and down the room again. "'The Lady Sophia Sefton of Camburn,' said I, rubbing my chin. "'Why, that's just it,' roared the baronet. "'She's a reigning toast, most famous beauty in the country. London's mad over her. She can pick and choose from all the finest gentlemen in England. Oh, it's good-bye to all your hopes of the inheritance, Peter, and that's the devil of it.' "'Sir, I, I fail to see your argument,' said I. "'What?' cried Sir Richard, facing round on me. "'Do you think you have a chance with her, then?' "'Why not?' <laughs> 
without friends, position, or money? Pish, boy! Don't I tell you that every buck and dandy, every mincing macaroni in the three kingdoms would give his very legs to marry her, either for her beauty or her fortune? spluttered the baronet. And let me inform you further that she's devilish high and haughty with it all. They do say she even rebuffed the Prince Regent himself. But then, sir, I consider myself a better man than the Prince Regent, said I. Sir Richard sank into the nearest chair and stared at me open-mouthed. Sir, I continued, you doubtless set me down as an egoist of egoists. I freely confess it. So are you. So is Mr. Granger yonder. So are we all of us egoists in thinking ourselves as, as good as some few of our neighbours, and better than a great many. Deuce take me, said Sir Richard. Referring to the Lady Sophia, I have heard that she once galloped her horse up the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral. And down again, Peter, added Sir Richard. Also she is said to be possessed of a temper, I continued, and is above the average height, I believe, and I have a natural antipathy to termagants, more especially tall ones. Termagant! cried Sir Richard. "'Why, she's the handsomest woman in London, boy! "'She's none of your milk-and-watery, meek-mouthed misses. "'Curse me, no! "'She's all fire and blood and high metal. "'A woman, sir, glorious, divine, a damn, sir, a black-browed goddess, a positive plum.' "'Sir Richard,' said I, "'should I ever contemplate marriage, which is most improbable,' My wife must be sweet and shy, gentle-eyed and soft of voice, instead of your bold, strong-armed, horse-galloping creature. Above all, she must be sweet and clinging. Sweet and sticky, oh, the devil! Hark to the boy, Granger, cried Sir Richard. Hark to him, and one glance of the glorious Sefton's bright eyes, one glance only, Granger, and he'd be at her feet, on his knees! on his confounded knees, sir. The question is, how do you propose to maintain yourself in the future? said Mr. Granger at this point. Life under your altered fortunes must prove necessarily hard, Mr. Peter. And yet, sir, I answered, a fortune with a wife tagged on to it must prove a very mixed blessing after all. And then again, there may be a certain amount of satisfaction in stepping into a dead man's shoes but I, very foolishly perhaps, have a hankering for shoes of my own. Surely there must be some position in life that I am competent to fill, some position that would maintain me honourably and well. I flatter myself that my years at Oxford were not altogether barren of result. By no means, put in Sir Richard. You won the high jump, I believe. Sir, I did, said I, also throwing the hammer. "'And spent two thousand pounds per annum?' said Sir Richard. "'Sir, I did, but between whiles managed to do fairly well in the tripos, to finish a new and original translation of Quintilian, another of Petronius Arbiter, and also a literal rendering into the English of the memoirs of Sieur de Branton.' "'For none of which you have hitherto found a publisher?' inquired Mr. Granger. "'Oh, not as yet.' said i but i have great hopes of my brantome as you are probably aware this is the first time he has ever been translated into english hm said sir richard ha and in the meantime what do you intend to do on that head i have as yet come to no definite conclusion sir i answered i have been wondering began mr granger somewhat diffidently if you would care to accept a position in my office. Uh, To be sure, the remuneration would be small at first, and quite insignificant in comparison to the income you have been in receipt of. But it would have been money earned, said I, which is infinitely preferable to that for which we never turn a hand. At least I think so. Then you accept? No, sir, said I, though I am grateful to you, and thank you most sincerely for your offer. Yet I have never felt the least inclination to the practice of law. Where there is no interest, one's work must necessarily suffer. 
and I have no desire that your business should be injured by any carelessness of mine. What do you think of a private tutorship? It would suit me above all things, were it not for the fact that the genus boy is the most aggravating of all animals, and that I am conscious of a certain shortness of temper at times, which might result in pain to my pupil, loss of dignity to myself, and general unpleasantness to all concerned. Otherwise, a, a private tutorship would suit most admirably." Here Sir Richard took another pinch of snuff, and sat frowning up at the ceiling, while Mr. Granger began tying up that document which had so altered my prospects. As for me, I crossed to the window, and stood staring out at the evening. Everywhere were trees tinted by the rosy glow of sunset, trees that stirred sleepily in the gentle wind, and far away I could see that famous highway, built and paved for the march of Roman legions, winding away to where it vanished over distant Shooter's Hill. "'And pray,' said Sir Richard, still frowning at the ceiling, "'what do you propose to do with yourself?' Now, as I looked out upon this fair evening, I became, of a sudden, possessed of an overmastering desire, a great longing for field and meadow and hedgerow, for wood and coppice and shady stream, for sequestered inns and wide, wind-swept heaths, and ever the broad highway in front. Thus I answered Sir Richard's question unhesitatingly, and without turning from the window. "'I shall go, sir, on a walking tour through Kent and Surrey into Devonshire, and thence probably to Cornwall. "'And with a miserable ten guineas in your pocket? A preposterous! Absurd!' retorted Sir Richard. "'On the contrary, sir,' said I, "'the more I ponder the project, the more enamoured of it I become.' "'And when your money is all gone, how then?' "'I shall turn my hand to some useful employment,' said I. "'Digging, for instance.' "'Digging!' ejaculated Sir Richard. "'And you a scholar! And what is more a gentleman?' "'My dear Sir Richard,' said I, "'that all depends upon how you would define a gentleman.' To me he would appear, of late years, to have degenerated into a creature whose chief end in life is to spend money he has never earned, to reproduce his species with a deplorable frequency and promiscuity, habitually to drink more than is good for him, and, between whiles, to fill in his time hunting, cock-fighting, or watching entranced while two men pound each other unrecognizable in the prize-ring. Occasionally he has the good taste to break his neck in the hunting-field, or get himself gloriously shot in a duel, but the generality live on to a good old age, turn their attention to matters political, and, following the dictates of their class, damn reform with a whole-hearted fervour equalled only by their rancour. "'Deuce take me!' ejaculated Sir Richard feebly, while Mr. Granger buried his face in his pocket-handkerchief. "'To my mind,' I ended, "'the man who sweats over a spade or follows the tail of a plough "'is far nobler and higher in the scheme of things "'than any of your young bloods driving his coach "'and four to Brighton to the danger of all and sundry.' "'Sir Richard slowly got up out of his chair, "'staring at me open-mouthed. "'Good God!' he exclaimed at last. "'The boy's a revolutionary!' I smiled and shrugged my shoulders, but before I could speak, Mr. Granger interposed, sedate and solemn as usual. "'Referring to your proposed tour, Mr. Peter, when do you expect to start?' "'Early to-morrow morning, sir.' "'I will not attempt to dissuade you, well knowing the difficulty,' said he with a faint smile. "'But a letter addressed to me at Lincoln's Inn will always find me and receive my most earnest attention.' So saying, he rose, bowed, and, having shaken my hand, left the room, closing the door behind him. "'Peter!' exclaimed the baronet, striding up and down. "'Peter, you're a fool, sir, a hot-blooded, self-sufficient, pragmatical young fool, sir. Curse me!' "'I am sorry you should think so,' I answered. "'And,' he continued, regarding me with a defiant eye, I shall expect you to draw upon me for any sum that, uh, that you may require for the present. Friendship's sake, uh, boyhood, and, uh, 
and all that sort of thing, and, er, uh, oh, damn, you understand, Peter? Sir Richard, said I, grasping his unwilling hand, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, Pooh, Peter, damn it, said he, snatching his hand away, and thrusting it hurriedly into his pocket, out of further reach. Thank you, sir, I reiterated. Be sure that should I fall ill, or any unforeseen calamity happen to me, I, I will most gladly, most gratefully, accept your generous aid in the spirit in which it is offered. But— But, exclaimed Sir Richard, until then— Oh, the devil! said Sir Richard, and, ringing the bell, ordered his horse to be brought to the door, and thereafter stood with his back to the empty fireplace, his fists thrust down into his pockets, frowning heavily and with a fixed intentness at the nearest armchair. Sir Richard Anstruther is tall and broad, ruddy of face, with a prominent nose and great square chin, whose grimness is offset by a mouth singularly sweet and tender and the kindly light of blue eyes. He is in very truth a gentleman. Indeed, as he stood there in his plain blue coat, with his high roll-collar and shining silver buttons, his spotless moleskins and heavy square-toed riding-boots, he was as fair a type as might be of the English country gentleman. It is such men as he, who, fearless upon the littered quarter-decks of reeling battleships, undismayed amid the smoke and death of stricken fields, their duty well and nobly done, have turned their feet toward home, to pass their latter days amid their turnips and cabbages, beating their swords into pruning-hooks, and glad enough to do it. "'Peter,' said he suddenly, "'Sir,' said I, "'you never saw your father to remember, did you?' "'No, Sir Richard.' "'Nor your mother?' "'Nor my mother.' "'Poor boy! Poor boy! You knew my mother?' "'Yes, Peter, I, I knew your mother,' said Sir Richard, staring very hard at the chair again, and saw that his mouth had grown wonderfully tender. "'Yours has been a very secluded life hitherto, Peter,' he went on after a moment. "'Entirely so,' said I, with the exception of my never-to-be-forgotten visits to the hall. <laughs> "'Ah, yes! I taught you to ride, remember?' "'You are associated with every boyish pleasure I ever knew,' said I, laying my hand upon his arm. Sir Richard coughed, and grew suddenly red in the face. "'Why, uh, you see, Peter,' he began, picking up his riding whip and staring at it, "'you see, your uncle was never fond of company at any time, whereas I—' <laughs> whereas you could always find time to remember the lonely boy left when all his companions were gone on their holidays, left to his books and the dreary desolation of the empty schoolhouse and echoing cloisters. Pooh! exclaimed Sir Richard, redder than ever. Bosh! Do you think I can ever forget the glorious day when you drove over in your coach and four, and carried me off in triumph, and how we raced the white-hatted fellow at the Tilbury? And beat him! added Sir Richard. "'Took off his near wheel on the turn,' said I. Uh, "'The fool's own fault,' said Sir Richard. "'And left him in the ditch cursing us,' said I. "'He got, yes, Peter. Oh, but those were fine horses, and though I say it, no better team in the south country. You remember the, the off-wheeler broke his leg shortly after, and had to be shot, oh, poor devil.' "'And later at Oxford,' I began, "'What now, Peter?' said Sir Richard, frowning darkly. "'Do you remember the bronze vase that used to stand on the mantelpiece in my study?' "'Bronze vase?' repeated Sir Richard, intent upon his whip again. "'I used to find banknotes in it after you had visited me, and when I hid the vase they turned up just the same in most unexpected places. "'The young fellow uh, must have money uh, necessary uh, now and then.' muttered Sir Richard. At this juncture, with a discreet knock, the butler appeared to announce that Sir Richard's horse was waiting. Hereupon the baronet, somewhat hastily, caught up his hat and gloves, and I followed him out of the house and down the steps. Sir Richard drew on his gloves, thrust his toe into the stirrup, and then turned to look at me over his arm. "'Peter,' said he, 
Sir Richard, said I, regarding your walking tour. Yes. I think it's all damned tomfoolery, said Sir Richard, and, after saying which, he swung himself into the saddle with a lightness and ease that many younger might have envied. I'm sorry for that, sir, because my mind is set upon it. With ten guineas in your pocket? That, with due economy, should be ample, until I can find some means to earn more. A fiddlestick, sir, an accursed fiddlestick, snorted Sir Richard. How is a boy, an unsophisticated, hot-headed young fool of a boy, to earn his own living? Others have done it, I began. Pish, said the baronet, and been the better for it in the end. Tush, said the baronet and I have a great desire to see the world from the viewpoint of the multitude. Bah! said the baronet, so forcibly that his mare started. This comes of your damnable revolutionary tendencies. Let me tell you, want is a hard master, and the world a bad place for one who is moneyless and without friends. You forget, sir, I shall never be without a friend. God knows it, boy answered Sir Richard, and his hand fell and rested for a moment upon my shoulder. Peter, said he very slowly and heavily, I'm growing old, and I shall never marry, and sometimes, Peter, of an evening, I get very lonely, and uh, lonely, uh, Peter. He stopped for a while, gazing away towards the green slopes of distant Shooter's Hill. "'Oh, boy,' said he at last, "'won't you come to the hall and help me to spend my money?' Without answering, I reached up and clasped his hand. It was the hand which held his whip, and I noticed how tightly he gripped the handle, and wondered. "'Sir Richard,' said I at last, "'wherever I go I shall treasure the recollection of this moment. "'But—' "'But, Peter?' "'But, sir—' "'Oh, damn it!' he exclaimed, and set spurs to his mare. Yet once he turned in his saddle to flourish his whip to me ere he galloped out of sight. End of section one. Section two of The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book one. CHAPTER TWO I SET OUT The clock of the square-towered Norman church, a mile away, was striking the hour of four as I let myself out into the morning. It was dark as yet, and chilly, but the east was already a faint glimmer of dawn. Reaching the stables, I paused with my hand on the door-hasp, listening to the hiss-hissing that told me Adam, the groom, was already at work within. As I entered, he looked up from the saddle he was polishing, and touched his forehead with a grimy forefinger. "'He'll be early abroad, Mr. Peter.' "'Yes,' said I. "'I wish to be on Shooter's Hill at sunrise. But first I came to say good-bye to Wings.' "'To be sure, sir,' nodded Adam, picking up his lantern. Upon the ensuing interview I will not dwell. It was affecting both to her and to myself, for we were mutually attached. "'Sir,' said Adam, when at last the stable door had closed behind us. That there mare knows is you relieving her. I think she does, Adam. Horses be wonderful wise, sir. Yes, Adam. This is a bad day for wings, sir, and all of us for that matter. I hope not, Adam. You be a-going away, they tell me, sir? Yes, going away, I nodded. Wonder what'll become of the mare, sir. Ah, yes. I wonder, said I. Everything to be sold under the wheel, I think, sir. Everything, Adam. Excuse me, sir, said he, knuckling his forehead. You won't be wanting ever a groom, will you? No, Adam, I answered, shaking my head. I shan't be wanting a groom. Nor yet a body-servant, sir? No, Adam, nor yet a body-servant. Here there ensued a silence, during which Adam knuckled his right temple again, and I tightened the buckle of my knapsack. "'I think, Adam,' said I, 
I think it is going to be a fine day. Yes, sir. Good-bye, Adam, said I, and held out my hand. Good-bye, sir. And having shaken my hand, he turned and went back into the stable. So I set off, walking beneath an avenue of trees, looming up gigantic on either hand. At the end was the lodge, and ere I opened the gates, for John, the lodge-keeper, was not yet astir, ere I opened the gates, I say, I paused for one last look at the house that had been all the home I had ever known since I could remember. As I stood thus with my eyes upon the indistinct mass, I presently distinguished a figure running towards me, and, as he came up, recognized Adam. "'It ain't much, sir, but it's all I have,' said he, and thrust a short, thick, well-smoked clay pipe into my hand, a pipe that was fashioned to the shape of a negro's head. "'It's a good pipe, sir,' he went on, "'a mortal good pipe, and as sweet as a nut.' Saying which, he turned about and ran off, leaving me standing there with his parting gift in my hand. And having put the pipe into an inner pocket, I opened the gate and started off at a good pace along the broad highway. It was a bleak, desolate world that lay about me, a world of shadows, and a white, low-lying mist that filled every hollow and swathed hedge and tree, a lowering earth and a frowning heaven infinitely depressing. But the eastern sky was clear with an ever-growing brightness. Hope lay there, so as I walked I kept my eyes toward the east. Being come at last to that eminence which is called Shooter's Hill, I sat down upon a bank beside the way and turned to look back upon the wonderful city. And as I watched, the pearly east changed little by little to a varying pink which in turn slowly gave place to reds and yellows, until up came the sun in all his majesty, gilding vane and weathercock upon a hundred spires and steeples, and making a glory of the river. Far away, upon the white ribbon of road that led across Blackheath, a chase was crawling, but, save for that, the world seemed deserted. I sat thus a great while gazing upon the city, and marvelling of the greatness of it. Truly, said I to myself, nowhere in the whole world is there such another city as London. And presently I sighed, and, rising, set my back to the city, and went on down the hill. Yes, the sun was up at last, and at his advent the mists rolled up and vanished, the birds awoke in brake and thicket, and lifting their voices sang together, a song of universal praise. Bushes rustled, trees whispered, while from every leaf and twig, from every blade of grass, there hung a flashing jewel. With the mists my doubts of the future vanished too, and I strode upon my way, a very god, king of my destiny, walking through a tribute world where feathered songsters caroled for me, and blossoming flowers wafted sweet perfume upon my path. So I went on gaily down the hill, rejoicing that I was alive. In the knapsack at my back I had stowed a few clothes, the strongest and plainest I possessed, together with a shirt, some half-dozen favorite books, and my translation of Branton. Quintilian and Petronius I had left with Mr. Granger, who had promised to send them to a publisher, a friend of his, and in my pocket was my Uncle George's legacy namely, ten guineas in gold. And, as I walked, I began to compute how long such a sum might be made to last a man. By practicing the strictest economy, I thought I might manage well enough on two shillings a day, and this left me some hundred odd days in which to find some means of livelihood, and if a man could not suit himself in such time, then, thought I, he must be a fool indeed." Thus my thoughts caught something of the glory of the bright sky above and the smiling earth about me, as I strode along that broad highway, which was to lead me I know not whither, yet where disaster was already lying in wait for me, as you shall hear. Book One, Chapter Three, concerns itself mainly with a hat. 
As the day advanced, the sun beat down with an ever-increasing heat, and, what with this and the dust, I presently grew very thirsty. Wherefore, as I went, I must needs conjure up tantalizing visions of ale, of ale that foamed gloriously in tankards, that sparkled in glasses, and gurgled deliciously from the spouts of earthen pitchers, and I began to look about me for some inn where these visions might be realized, and my burning thirst nobly quenched, as such a thirst deserved to be. On I went through this beautiful land of Kent, past tree and hedge and smiling meadow, by hill and dale and sloping upland, while ever the sun grew hotter, the winding road the dustier, and my mighty thirst the mightier. At length, reaching the brow of a hill, I espied a small inn or hedge tavern that stood back from the glare of the road, seeming to nestle in the shade of a great tree, and joyfully I hastened toward it. As I approached I heard loud voices, raised as though in altercation, and a hat came hurtling through the open doorway and bounding into the road, rolled over and over to my very feet. And looking down at it, I saw that it was a very ill-used hat, frayed and worn, dented of crown, and broken of brim. Yet, beneath its sordid shabbiness, there lurked the dim semblance of what it had once been, for, in the scratched and tarnished buckle, in the jaunty curl of the brim, it still preserved a certain pitiful air of rakishness. Wherefore I stooped, and, picking it up, began to brush the dust from it as well as I might. I was thus engaged when there arose a sudden bull-like roar, and, glancing up, I beheld a man who reeled backwards out of the inn, and who, after staggering a yard or so, thudded down into the road, and so lay, staring vacantly up at the sky. Before I could reach him, however, he got upon his legs, and, crossing unsteadily to the tree I have mentioned, leaned there, and I saw there was much blood upon his face, which he essayed to wipe away with the cuff of his coat. Now, upon his whole person, from the crown of his unkempt head down to his broken, dusty boots, there yet clung that air of jaunty, devil-may-care rakishness which I had seen and pitied in his hat. Observing as I came up how heavily he leaned against the tree, and noting the extreme pallor of his face and the blank gaze of his sunken eyes, I touched him upon the shoulder. "'Sir, I trust you are not hurt,' said I. "'Thank you,' he answered, his glance still wandering. "'Not in the least, I assure you. Merely tap on the nose, sir. Unpleasant, damnably, but no more, no more.' "'I think,' said I, holding out the battered hat, "'I think this is yours.' His eye encountering it in due time, he reached out his hand somewhat fumblingly, and took it from me with a slight movement of the head and shoulders that might have been a bow. "'Thank you. Yes.' "'Should know it among a thousand, said he dreamily. "'An old friend, and a tried, a very much tried one. Many thanks.' With which words he clapped the much-tried friend upon his head, and, with another movement that might have been a bow, turned short round and strode away. And as he went, despite the careless swing of his shoulder, his legs seemed to falter somewhat in their stride, and once I thought he staggered. Yet— as I watched, half-minded to follow after him, he settled his hat more firmly with a light tap upon the crown, and, thrusting his hands into the pockets of his threadbare coat, fell to whistling lustily, and so, turning a bend in the road, vanished from my sight. And presently, my thirst recurring to me, I approached the inn, and, descending three steps, entered its cool shade. Here I found four men, each with his pipe and tankard, to whom a large, red-faced, big-fisted fellow was holding forth in a high state of heat and indignation. "'What's England a-coming to? That's what I wants to know,' he was saying. "'What's England a-coming to, when thieving robbers can come a-walkin' in on you, a-stealin' a pint of your best ale out of your very own tankard under your very own nose? What's it a-coming to?' "'Ah!' nodded the other solemnly. "'That's it, Joel. What?' "'Why,' growled the red-faced innkeeper, bringing his big fist down with a bang, "'it's a-comin' to perdition. 
that's what it's a-coming to. "'And what?' inquired a rather long, bony man, with a face half hidden in sandy whisker. "'What might perdition be, Joel? Likewise, where?' "'You must be a danged fool, Tom, my lad,' retorted he, whom they called Joel, redder in the face than ever. "'Ay, that you must,' chorused the others. "'I only asked what and where.' "'Only asked, did ye?' repeated Joel scornfully. "'Ah!' nodded the other. "'That's all.' "'But you're always a axin' you are,' said Joel gloomily. "'Which I notice,' retorted the man Tom, blowing into his tankard, "'which I notice is you ain't never over-fond o' answerin'. "'Oh, I ain't, ain't I?' "'No, you ain't,' repeated Tom. "'No how.' Here the red-faced man grew so very red indeed that the others fell to coughing, all together, and shuffling their feet and giving divers other evidences of their embarrassment, all save the unimpressionable Tom. Seizing the occasion that now presented itself, I knocked loudly upon the floor with my stick, whereupon the red-faced man, removing his eyes slowly and by degrees from the unconcerned Tom, fixed them darkly upon me. Supposing said I, supposing you are so very obliging as to serve me with a pint of ale. Then, supposing you show me the colour of your money, he growled. Come money first. I aren't to take no more risks. For answer, I laid the coins before him, and having pocketed the money, he filled and thrust a foaming tankard towards me, which I emptied forthwith and called upon him for another. Where's your money? Here, said I, tossing a sixpence to him, and you can keep the change. Why, uh, you see, sir, he began, somewhat mollified, it be precious art to know who's a gentleman and who ain't, who's a thief, and who ain't these days. How so? Why, only a little while ago, just afore you, chap comes a walking in here, no account much to look at, but very haughty for all that comes a walkin in here he do and calls for a pint of ale you heard him all in ye he broke off turning to the others you all heard him call for a pint of ale ah we heard him they nodded comes a walkin in here he do bold as brass i calls for a pint of ale drinks it off and hands me is at you all seen a man me is at he inquired once more addressing the others every man of us the four chimed in, with four individual nods. "'What's this here?' says I, turning it over. "'It's a hat, or once was,' says he. "'Well, I don't want it,' says I. "'Since you've got it, you better keep it,' says he. "'What for?' says I. "'Why,' says he, "'it's only fair seeing I've got your ale. "'It's a case of exchange,' says he. "'Oh, is it?' says I, "'and pitched the thing out into the road, "'and him after it.' and so it ended. And what, said the red-faced man, nodding his big head at me, what do you think of that now? Why, I think you were perhaps a trifle hasty, said I. Oh, you do, do you? Yes, I nodded. On for why? Well, you will probably remember that the hat had a band around it. Eh, hey, I'll water away it were, too and that in the band was a buckle. Eh, all scratched and rusty it were. Well? Well, that tarnished buckle was of silver. Silver! gasped the man, his jaw falling. And easily worth five shillings, perhaps more, so that I think you were, upon the whole, rather hasty. Saying which, I finished my ale, and taking up my staff, stepped out into the sunshine book one chapter four i meet with a great misfortune that day i passed through several villages stopping only to eat and drink thus evening was falling as having left fair seven oaks behind i came to the brow of a certain hill a long and very steep descent which i think is called the river hill and here, rising stark against the evening sky, was a gibbet, and, standing beneath it, a man, a short, square man in a somewhat shabby coat of a bottle green, 
and with a wide-brimmed beaver hat sloped down over his eyes who stood with his feet well apart sucking the knob of a stick he carried while he stared up at that which dangled by a stout chain from the cross-beam of the gibbet something black and shriveled and horrible that had once been human as i came up the man drew the stick from his mouth and touched the brim of his hat with it in salutation in object lesson sir said he and nodded towards the loathsome mass above a very hideous one said i pausing and i think a very useless one he was as fine a fellow as ever thrust toe into stirrup the man went on pointing upwards with his stick though you'd never think so to look at him now it's a horrible sight said i it is nodded the man it's a sight to turn a man's stomach that it is you knew him perhaps said i knew him repeated the man staring at me over his shoulder knew him all oh, that is uh, i knew of him a highwayman nick swope his name was answered the man with a nod hung at maidstone assizes last year and a very good end he made of it too and here he be hung up in chains all natural and regular is a warning to all and sundry the more shame to england said i to my thinking it is a scandal that her highways should be rendered odious by such horrors and as wicked as it is useless Odd rot me cried the fellow slapping a cloud of dust from his coat with his stick ark to that now what said i do you think for one moment that such a sight horrible though it is could possibly deter a man from robbery or murder whose mind is already made up to it by reason of circumstances or starvation well but it's an old custom as old as this here road true said i and that of itself proves my argument for men have been hanged and gibbeted all these years yet robbery and murder abide with us still and are of daily occurrence why as to that sir said the man falling into step beside me as i walked on down the hill i won't say yes and i won't say no but what i do say is as many a man might think twice afore running the chance of coming to that look and he stopped to turn and point back at the gibbet with his stick nick can't last much longer though i've knowed him hang a good time but they made a botch of nick not enough tar you could see where the sun catches him there once more though my whole being revolted at the sight i must needs turn to look at the thing the tall black shaft of the gibbet and the grisly horde that dangled beneath with its chains and iron bands and from this back again to my companion to find him regarding me with a curiously twisted smile and a long-barreled pistol held within a foot of my head well said i staring sir said he tapping his boot with his stick i must trouble you for the shiner i see a winking at me from your cravat likewise your watch and any small change you may have for a moment i hesitated glancing from his grinning mouth swiftly over the deserted road and back again likewise said the fellow i must ask you to be sharp about it it was with singularly clumsy fingers that i drew the watch from my fob and the pin from my cravat and passed them to him now your pockets he suggested turn em out this command i reluctantly obeyed bringing to light my ten guineas which were as yet intact and which he pocketed forthwith and two pennies which he bade me keep for said he twill buy you a draught of ale sir and there's good stuff to be at at the white art yonder and there's nothing like a good draught of ale to comfort a man in any such small adversity like this here as to that knapsack now he pursued eyeing it thoughtfully it looks heavy and might hold valuables but then on the other end it might not and those there straps takes times to unbuckle and he broke off suddenly, for from somewhere on the hill below us came the unmistakable sound of wheels, whereupon the fellow very nimbly ran across the road, turned, nodded, and vanished among the trees and underbrush that clothed the steep slope down to the valley below. Book One, Chapter Five The Bagman I was yet standing there, half stunned by my loss and the suddenness of it all, 
when a tilbury came slowly round a bend in the road, the driver of which nodded lazily in his seat, while his horse, a sorry jaded animal, plodded wearily up the steep slope of the hill. As he approached I hailed him loudly, upon which he suddenly dived down between his knees and produced a brass-bound blunderbuss. "'What's to do?' cried he, a thick-set, round-faced fellow. "'What's to do, eh?' and he covered me with the wide mouth of the blunderbuss. "'Thieves!' said I. "'I've been robbed, and not three minutes since.' "'Oh!' he exclaimed in a tone of great relief, and, with the colour returning to his plump cheeks, "'Is that the way of it?' "'It is,' said I, "'and a very bad way. The fellow has left me but two pence in the world.' Two pence, all? Oh. "'Come!' I went on. "'You are armed, I see. The thief took to the brushwood here not three minutes ago. We may catch him yet.' "'Catch him?' repeated the fellow, staring. "'Yes, don't I tell you he has stolen all the money I possess?' "'Except twopence,' said the fellow. "'Yes. Well, twopence ought to be sneezed out, and if I was you—' "'Come, we're losing time,' said I, cutting him short. "'But my mare, what about my mare?' "'She'll stand,' I answered. "'She's tired enough.' The bagman, for such I took him to be, sighed, and, blunderbuss in hand, prepared to alight, but, in the act of doing so, paused. "'Was the rascal armed?' he inquired, over his shoulder. "'To be sure he was,' said I. The bagman got back into his seat and took up the reins. "'What now?' I inquired. "'It's that accursed mare of mine,' he answered. "'She'll bolt again, do you see?' "'Twice yesterday, and once the day before, she bolted, sir, and on a road like this. "'Then lend me your blunderbuss.' "'I can't do that,' he replied, shaking his head. "'But why not?' said I impatiently. "'Because this is a dangerous road, and I don't intend to be left unarmed on a dangerous road. "'I never have been, and I never will. "'And there's an end of it, do you see?' "'Then do you mean to say that you refuse your aid to a fellow traveller? that you will sit there and let the rogue get away with all the money I possess in the world? Oh, no, not on no account. Just you get up here beside me and we'll drive to the White Hart. I'm well known at the White Hart. We'll get a few honest fellows at our heels and have this thieving rascally villain in the twinkling of an— He stopped suddenly, made a frantic clutch at the blunderbuss, and sat staring. Turning short round, I saw the man in the beaver hat standing within a yard of us, fingering his long pistol, and with the same twisted smile upon his lips. "'I've a mind,' said he, nodding his head at the bagman, "'I've a great mind to blow your face off.' The blunderbuss fell to the roadway with a clatter. "'Thieving rascally villain, was it? Damn, I think I will blow your face off.' "'No, don't do that,' said the bagman, in a strange jerky voice. "'What would be um, the good?' Why, that there poor animal wouldn't have to drag that fat carcass of yours up and down hills, for one thing. I'll get out and walk, and it might learn you to keep a civil tongue in your head. I, I didn't mean any offence. Then chuck us your purse, growled the other, and be quick about it. The bagman obeyed with wonderful celerity, and I heard the purse chink as the footpad dropped it into the pocket of his greatcoat. As for you, said he, turning to me, you get on your way and never mind me. Forget you ever had ten guineas, and don't go a risking your valuable young life. Come, up with you. And he motioned me into the Tilbury with his pistol. What about my blunderbuss? expostulated the bagman, as I seated myself beside him. You'll give me my blunderbuss? Cost me five pound it did. More fool you, said the highwayman, and picking up the unwieldy weapon, he hove it into the ditch. "'As to our argument regarding Gibbeton, sir,' said he, nodding to me, "'I'm rather inclined to think you was in the right on it after all.' Then, turning towards the bagman, "'Drive on, fat face,' said he, "'and sharps the word.' Whereupon the bagman whipped up his horse, and, as the tired animal struggled forward over the crest of the hill, I saw the highwayman still watching us. Very soon we came in view of the white heart an inn I remembered to have passed on the right-hand side of the road, and scarce were we driven up to the door than down jumped the bagman, leaving me to follow at my leisure, and, running into the tap, 
forthwith began recounting his loss to all and sundry, so that I soon found we were become the centre of a gaping crowd, much to my disgust. Indeed, I would have slipped away, but each time I attempted to do so, the bagman would appeal to me to corroborate some statement. Gallopin' Dick himself, or I'm a Dutchman, he cried for the twentieth time. Up he comes, bold as brass, bless you, and a horse pistol in each hand. Hold hard, says I, and ups with my blunderbuss. Do you remember as I ups with my blunderbuss? he inquired, turning to me. Quite well, said I. Ah, but you should have seen the fellow's face when he saw my blunderbuss ready at my shoulder. Green it was, green as grass, for if ever there was death in a man's face, and sudden death at that, there was sudden death in mine when, all at once, my mare, my accursed mare, jibbed. Yes, yes, cried half a dozen breathless voices. What then? Why then, gentlemen, said the bagman, shaking his head and frowning round upon the ring of intent faces, why then, gentlemen, being a resolute, determined fellow, I did what any other man of spirit would have done. I dropped your blunderbuss, said I. Uh, to be sure, I, I did. And he pitched it into the ditch, said I. A eh? nodded the bagman dubiously, while the others crowded near. And then he took your money, and called you fool and fat face, and so it ended, said I. With which I pushed my way from the circle, and, finding a quiet corner beside the chimney, sat down, and with my last twopence, paid for a tankard of ale. End of section two. Section three of the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book one, chapter six. What befell me at the White Hart. When a man has experienced some great and totally unexpected reverse of fortune, has been swept from one plane of existence to another, that he should fail at once to recognize the full magnitude of that change, is but natural, for his faculties must of necessity be numbed more or less by its very suddenness. Yesterday I had been reduced from affluence to poverty with an unexpectedness that had dazed me for the time being, and from the poverty of an hour ago, I now found myself reduced to an utter destitution, without the wherewithal to pay for the meanest night's lodging. And contrasting the careless ease of a few days since with my present lamentable situation, I fell into a gloomy meditation, and the longer I thought it over, the more dejected I became. To be sure, I might apply to Sir Richard for assistance, but my pride revolted at even the thought, more especially at such an early stage. Moreover, I had determined beforehand to walk my appointed road unaided from the first. From these depressing thoughts I was presently aroused by a loud, rough voice at no great distance, to which, though I had been dimly conscious of it for some time, I had before paid no attention. Now, however, I raised my eyes from the spot upon the floor where they had rested hitherto, and fixed them upon the speaker. He was a square-shouldered, bullet-headed fellow, evidently held in much respect by his companions, for he occupied the head of the table, and I noticed that whenever he spoke, the others held their peace, and hung upon the words with an appearance of much respect. "'Yes, sirs,' says I, he began louder than before, and with a flourish of his long-stemmed pipe, "'Yes, sirs, Tom Cragg's my name, and Croggy my nature. I be hard, sirs. Devilish hard, and uncommon rocky. Here's a face as like Squad Knox, I says. Why, when I fought Crib Burke of Bristol, he broke his and again my jaw. So he did, and I scarce knowed he had hit me, till I see him open with the pain of it. Come, sirs, says I, who'll give me a black eye? A fiver's all I ask. Well, up comes a young buck, ready and willing. Tom, says he, I'll take two flaps at that flagger at a yarn for seven guineas. Come, what do you say? I says, done, says I. So my fine gentleman lays by his hat and cane, strips off his right hand glove, and even back lets fly at me. Bang comes his fist against my jaw, and there's my gentleman a dabbing at his broken knuckles with his anchor chair. 
Come, my lord, says I, fair is fair, take your other whack. Damnation, says he, take your body and go to the devil, says he. I thought you was flesh and blood, and not cast iron. Craggy, my lord, says I, gathering up the rhino. Crag is my name, and craggy by nature, my lord, says I. Hereupon ensued a roar of laughter, with much slapping of thighs and stamping of feet, while the bullet-headed man solemnly emptied his tankard, which was the signal for two or three of those nearest to vie for its possession, during which Tom Cragg sucked dreamily at his pipe and stared placidly up at the ceiling. And now, Tom, says a tall, bony individual, chiefly remarkable in possessing but one eye, and that so extremely pale and watery as to give one the idea that it was very much overworked. And now, Tom, said he, setting down the refilled tankard at the great man's elbow with a triumphant flourish, tell us how you shook hands with the Prince Regent. Ah, tell us, chimed the rest. Well, said the bullet-headed man, stooping to blow the froth from his ale, it was arter I beat Jack Nolan of Brummingham. The prince he come a-running to me, he did, as I sat on my corner a-working at a loose tusk. Tom, he says, Tom, you be a wonder. I done Jack Nolan a-proper, I think, your highness, says I. Tom, says he, with tears in his eyes, you have, and if I had my way, says he, I'd make you prime minister to-morrow, he says, and slapped me on the back, he did, with his merry own hand, and likewise gave me this here pin. Saying which, he pointed to a flaming diamond horseshoe which he wore stuck through his neckerchief. The stones were extremely large and handsome, looking very much out of place on the fellow's rough person, and seemed in some part to bear out his story. Though indeed, as regarded his association with the Prince Regent, whose tastes were at all times peculiar, to say the least, and whose love for the fancy was notorious, I thought it on the whole very probable for despite Craggy's words, foolishly blatant though they sounded, there was about him in his low, retreating brow, his small, deep-set eyes, his great square jowl and heavy chin, a certain air there was no mistaking. I also noticed that the upper half of one ear was unduly thick and swollen, which is a mark, I believe, of the professional pugilist alone. "'Tom!' cried the one-eyed man. What's all this we year to tub jar away a Swansea being knocked out in five rounds by this here uh, Lord Vibbit up in London? Vibbit, repeated Cragg, frowning into his tankard. I haven't heard of no Vibbit, neither Lord Earl nor Duke. Come, Tom, coaxed the other. Everybody's here to buck Vibbit. Him they calls the fight in Baronite. If, said Cragg, rolling his bullet head, if you was to ask me who put Ted Jarraway to sleep, I should answer you Sir Maurice Vibbert, commonly called Buck Vibbert, and it took ten rounds to do it, not five. As may be expected at this mention of my cousin's name, I pricked up my ears. And what's all this about him putting out Tom Cragg in three? At this there was a sudden silence, and all eyes were turned towards the speaker a small red-headed fellow with a truculent eye. Come, said he, blowing out a cloud of tobacco smoke, in three rounds. What do you say to that now? Come. Cragg had started up in his chair, and now sat scowling at his inquisitor open-mouthed, and in the hush I could hear the ticking of the clock in the corner, and the crackle of the logs upon the hearth. Then, all at once, Cragg's pipe shivered to fragments on the floor, and he leapt to his feet, in one stride, as it seemed, he reached the speaker, who occupied the corner opposite mine, but, even as he raised his fist, he checked himself before the pocket pistol which the other held leveled across the table. Calm, calm, none of that, said the red-headed man, his eye more truculent than ever. I ain't a fightin' cove myself, and I don't want no trouble. All I asks is, what about Buck Vibbert putting out Tom Cragg in three rounds? That's a civil question, ain't it? What do you say now? Come. I says, cried Tom Cragg, flourishing a great fist in the air, I says, as he done it, on a foul. And he smote the table a blow that set the glasses ringing. Done it on a foul, cried three or four voices. On a foul, repeated Cragg. Think again, said the red-headed man. Twere said as it was a very clean knockout. And I says it were done on a foul, reiterated Craig, with another blow of his fist. 
And what's more, if Buck Vibbert stood afore me, ah, oh, in this ere very room, I'd prove my words. Hm, said the red-headed man. They do say as he's wonderful quick with his mowlies and can hit like a sledgehammer. Quick with his hands he may be, and I better give a goodish thump. But as for beating me, it's all me, I, and Betty Martin. And you can lay to that, my lads. I would put him to sleep any time and anywhere. And I'd like, ah, I'd like to see the cove as says contrary. And here the pugilist scowled round upon his hearers, more especially the red-headed man, so blackly that one or two of them shuffled uneasily, and the latter individual appeared to become interested in the lock of his pistol. "'I'd like,' repeated Craig, "'ah, I'd like to see the covers says contrary.' "'No one ain't a-goin' to, Tom,' says the one-eyed man, soothingly. "'Not a soul, Lord bless you.' "'I only wish they would,' growled Craig. "'Ain't there nobody to oblige the gentleman?' inquired the red-headed man. I'd fight any man as ever was born. Wish I may die, snorted Craig. You always was so fiery, Tom, purred the one-eyed man, blinking his pale orb. I were, cried the prize-fighter, working himself into another age. Ah, and I'm proud of it. I'd fight any man as ever wore breeches. Why, burn me, I'd give any man ten shillings as could stand up to me for ten minutes. Ten shillings, said I to myself. Ten shillings, when one comes to think of it, is a very handsome sum, more especially when one is penniless and destitute. "'Wish I may die!' roared Cragg, smiting his fist down on the table again. "'A guinea! A golden guinea to the man as could stand on his pins and fight for me for five minutes! And as for Buck Vibbert, curse him, I say as he won on a foul!' "'A guinea,' said I to myself, "'is a fortune!' and setting down my empty tankard, I crossed the room and touched Crag upon the shoulder. "'I will fight you,' said I, "'for a guinea.' Now, as the fellow's eyes met mine, he rose up out of his chair, and his mouth opened slowly. But he spoke no word, backing from me until he was stayed by the table, where he stood staring at me. And once again there fell a silence, in which I heard the tick of the clock in the corner, and the crackle of the logs upon the hearth. You, said he, recovering himself with an effort, you, and as he spoke I saw his left eyelid twitch suddenly. Exactly, I answered, I think I can stand up to even you for five minutes. Now as I spoke he winked at me again. That it was meant for me was certain, seeing that his back was towards the others, though what he intended to convey I could form no idea, so I assumed as confident an air as possible and waited. Hereupon the one-eyed man broke into a sudden raucous laugh, in which the others joined. "'Ock to him, lads!' he cried, pointing to me with the stem of his pipe. "'He be a fine to stand up to Tom Craig, I don't think. Tell him to go and learn himself to grow whiskers first. cried a second. "'Ee, to be sure, he aren't got so much as our old cat!' <laughs> grinned a third. "'Stay!' cried the one-eyed man, peering up at me beneath his hand. Is these whiskers a peepin' at me over his cravat, or do my eyes deceive me? Which pleasantry called forth another roar of laughter at my expense. Now, very foolishly, perhaps, this nonsense greatly exasperated me, for I was, at the time, painfully conscious of my bare lips and chin. It was, therefore, with an effort that I mastered my quickly rising temper, and once more addressed myself to Cragg. I am willing, said I, to accept your conditions and fight you, for a guinea, or any other man here for that matter, except the humorous gentleman with the watery eye, who could name his own price. The fellow in question stared at me, glanced slowly round, and, sitting down, buried his face in his tankard. Come, Tom Cragg, said I, a while ago you seemed very anxious for a man to fight. Well, I'm your man and with the words I stripped off my coat and laid it across a chair-back. This apparent willingness on my part was but a cloak for my real feelings, for I will not here disguise the fact that the prospect before me was anything but agreeable. Indeed, my heart was thumping in a most unpleasant manner, and my tongue and lips had become strangely parched and dry as I fronted Cragg. Truly, he looked dangerous enough, with his beetling brow, his great depth of chest, and massive shoulders, 
and the possibility of a black eye or so, and a general pounding from the fellow's knotted fists, was daunting in the extreme. Still, the chance of earning a guinea, even under such conditions, was not to be lightly thrown away. Therefore I folded my arms, and waited with as much resolution as I could. "'Sir,' said Cragg, speaking in a very altered tone, "'sir, you seem uncommon eager for it.' "'I shall be glad to get it over,' said I. "'If,' um, he went on slowly, "'if I said anything against uh, you-know-who, I'm sorry for it, me uh, having the greatest respect for... Um, you know who you understand me i think and herewith he winked three separate and distinct times no i don't understand you in the least said i nor do i think it at all necessary all that i care about is the guinea in question come tom cried one of the company knock his head off to begin with Eh, hey, shut about it tom cut your gab and finish him and here came the clatter of chairs as the company rose can't be done said cragg shaking his head leastways not here i'm not particular said i if you prefer we might manage it very well in the stable with a couple of lanterns the barn would be the very place suggested the landlord bustling eagerly forward and wiping his hands on his apron the very place plenty of room and nice and soft to fall on if you would only put off your fight until to-morrow we might cry it through the villages it would be a big draw a card we might make a purse of twenty pound if only you would think it over think it over to-morrow i hope to be a good distance from here said i come the sooner it is over the better show us your barn so the landlord called for lanterns and led the way to a large outbuilding at the back of the inn into which we all trooped it seems to be a good place and very suitable said i you may well say that returned the landlord it's many a fine bout has been brought off in here the time jam belcher beat the young ruffian the prince of wales sat in a chair over in that there corner and that was a day if you please if tom cragg is ready said i turning up the wristbands of my shirt why so am i here it was found to every one's surprise and mine in particular that tom cragg was not in the barn surprise gave place to noisy astonishment when after much running to and fro it was further learned that he had vanished altogether the inn itself the stables and even the haylofts were ransacked without avail tom cragg was gone as completely as though he had melted into thin air and with him all my hopes of winning the guinea and a comfortable bed it was with all my old dejection upon me therefore that i returned to the tap-room and refusing the officious aid of the one-eyed man put on my coat readjusted my knapsack and crossed to the door on the threshold i paused and looked back if said i glancing round the ring of faces if there is any man here who is at all willing to fight for a guinea ten shillings or even five i should be very glad of the chance to earn it but seeing how each wilfully avoided my eye held his peace i sighed and turning my back upon them set off along the darkening road book one chapter seven of the further puzzling behavior of tom cragg the pugilist evening had fallen and i walked along in no very happy frame of mind the more so as the rising wind and flying rack of clouds above through which a watery moon had peeped at fitful intervals seemed to presage a wild night it needed but this to make my misery the more complete for as far as i could tell if i slept at all and i was already very weary it must of necessity be beneath some hedge or tree as i approached the brow of the hill i suddenly remembered that i must once more pass the gibbet and began to strain my eyes for it presently i spied it sure enough its grim gaunt outline looming through the murk and instinctively i quickened my stride so as to pass it as soon as might be i was almost abreast of it when a figure rose from beneath it and slouched into the road to meet me i stopped there and then and grasping my heavy staff waited its approach be that you sir 
said a voice, and I recognized the voice of Tom Cragg. "'What are you doing, and there of all places?' "'Oh, I ain't afeard of him,' answered Cragg, jerking his thumb towards the gibbet. "'I ain't afeard of none as ever drawed breath, dead or living, except it be his Highness the Prince Regent. "'And what do you want with me?' "'I hopes as there's no offence, my lord,' said he, knuckling his forehead and speaking in a tone that was a strange mixture of would-be comradeship and cringing servility. "'Cragg is my name, and Cragg is my nature, but I know when I'm beat.' I knowed ye as soon as I laid my peepers on ye, and if I said it were a foul, why, when a man's in his cups, do you see, he's apt to shoot rather wide of the gospel, do you see, and there was no offence, me lord, strike me blind. I know you, and you know me, Tom Craig by name, and Craggy by— But I don't know you, said I, and for that matter, neither do you know me. Why— he ain't got no whiskers, me lord, leastways not with you now, but— And what the devil has that got to do with it? said I angrily. He disguises, perhaps, said the fellow with a sly leer, after that there kidnapping, and me having laid out Sir Jasper Trent in Wick Street, according to your orders, me lord, the prince gave me words to clear out, cotton run for it, till it blowed over, and I thought perhaps, knowing as you and him had had words, um, I thought as you had— uh, caught stick too. And I think that you are manifestly drunk, said I, if you still wish to fight for any sum, no matter how small, put up your hands. If not, get out of my road. The craggy one stepped aside somewhat hastily, which done, he removed his hat and stood staring and scratching his bullet head as one in sore perplexity. I seen a many rum goes in my time, said he, but I never see so rummy a go as this here. Strike me dead. So I left him, and strode on down the hill. As I went, the moon shot out a feeble ray through some rift in the rolling clouds, and, looking back, I saw him standing where I had left him beneath the gibbet, still scratching his bullet head and staring after me down the hill. Now, the whole attitude and behavior of the fellow was puzzling to no small degree. My mind was too full of my own concerns to give much thought to him. Indeed, scarce was he out of my sight, but I forgot him altogether. For what with my weariness, the long dark road before and behind me, and my empty pockets, I became a prey to great dejection. So much so that I presently sank wearily beside the way, and— resting my chin in my hands, sat there, miserably enough, watching the night deepen about me. And yet, said I to myself, if, as Epictetus says, to despise a thing is to possess it, then am I rich, for I have always despised money. And if, weary as I am, I can manage to condemn the luxury of a feather bed, then to-night, lying in this grassy ditch beneath the stars, I shall slumber as sweetly as ever I did between the snowy sheets. Saying which, I rose and began to look about for some likely nook in the hedge where I might pass the night. I was thus engaged when I heard the creak of wheels and the pleasant rhythmic jingle of harness on the dark hill above, and in a little while a great wagon or wain, piled high with hay, hove into view, the driver of which, rolled loosely in his seat with every jolt of the wheels, so that it was a wonder he did not roll off altogether. As he came level with me I hailed him loudly, whereupon he started erect and brought his horses to a stand. Hello, he bellowed in the loud strident tone of one rudely wakened. "'What do you want with I?' "'A lift,' I answered. "'Will you give a tired fellow a lift on his way?' "'What? I don't know.' "'Be you a talking chap?' "'I don't think so,' said I. "'Because if you be a talkin' chap, "'I bean't a goin' to give you a lift no how. "'Not if I knows it. "'Give a chap a lift to other day, I did. "'Took him up to other side of Seven Oaks, "'and he talked me up hill and down hill, he did. "'Dang me if I could get a wink of sleep "'all the way to Tonbridge. "'So, if you're a talkin' chap, "'you don't get no lift with I.' "'I am generally a very silent chap,' said I. "'Besides, I am too tired and sleepy to talk, even if I wished.' "'Sleepy?' yawned the man. "'Then up you get, my chap. 
I'm sleepy too. I always am. Lord love you. There's no like sleep. Up with you, my chap. Forthwith up I clambered, and, laying myself down among the fragrant hay, stretched out my tired limbs and sighed. Never shall I forget the delicious sense of restfulness that stole over me as I lay there upon my back, listening to the creak of the wheels, the deliberate hoof-strokes of the horses, muffled in the thick dust of the road, and the gentle snore of the driver who had promptly fallen asleep again. On he went as if born on air, so soft was my bed, now beneath the far-flung branches of trees, sometimes so low that I could have touched them with my hand, now beneath a sky heavy with sombre masses of flying cloud, or bright with the soft radiance of the moon. On I went, careless alike of destination, of time, and of future, content to lie there upon the hay and rest. And so, lulled by the gentle movement, by the sound of wheels and harness, and the whisper of the soft wind about me, I presently fell into a most blessed sleep. End of section 3section 4 of the broad highway by geoffrey farnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john leader book 1 chapter 8 which concerns itself with a farmer's whiskers and a waistcoat how long i slept i have no idea but when i opened my eyes it was to find the moon shining down on me from a cloudless heaven the wind also had died away it seemed my early fears of a wild night were not to be fulfilled, and for this I was sufficiently grateful. Now as I lay, blinking up to the moon, I presently noticed that we had come to a standstill, and I listened expectantly for the jingle of harness and creak of the wheels to recommence. Strange, said I to myself, after having waited vainly some little time, and wondering what could cause the delay, I sat up and looked about me. The first object my eyes encountered was a haystack, and, beyond that, another, with, a little to one side, a row of barns, and again beyond these a great rambling farmhouse. Evidently the wain had reached its destination, wherever that might be, and the sleepy wagoner, forgetful of my presence, had tumbled off to bed the which I thought so excellent an example, that I lay down again, and, drawing the loose hay over me, closed my eyes, and once more fell asleep. My second awakening was gradual. I at first became conscious of a sound, rising and falling with a certain monotonous regularity, that my drowsy ears could make nothing of. Little by little, however, the sound developed itself into a somewhat mournful melody or refrain, chanted by a not unmusical voice. I yawned, and, having stretched myself, sat up to look and listen. And the words of the song were these. When a man who muffins cries, cries not when his father dies, tis a proof that he would rather have a muffin than his father. The singer was a tall, strapling fellow with a good-tempered face, whose ruddy health was set off by a handsome pair of black whiskers. As I watched him, he laid aside the pitchfork he had been using, and approached the wagon, but, chancing to look up, his eye met mine, and he stopped. "'Hello!' he exclaimed, breaking short off in the middle of a note. hello hello said I. "'What be doing up there?' "'I was thinking,' I returned, "'that under certain circumstances I, for one, could not blame the individual mentioned in your song for his passionate attachment to muffins. At this precise moment a muffin, or say five or six, would be highly acceptable personally.' "'Be you partial to muffins, then?' "'Yes, indeed,' said I, more especially seeing I have not broken my fast since midday yesterday.' "'Well, and what be doing in my hay?' "'I have been asleep,' said I. "'Well, and what business have you got a-sleepin' and a-snorin' in my hay?' 
I was tired, said I, and uh, in nature her custom holds, let shame say what it will. Still, I do not think I snored. How do I know that? Or you, for that matter, rejoined the farmer, stroking his glossy whiskers. How swell, if you be quite awake, come on down out of my hay. As he said this, he eyed me with rather a truculent air. Likewise, he clenched his fist. Thinking it wisest to appear unconscious of this, I nodded affably, and, letting myself down from the hay, was next moment standing beside him. "'Supposin' I was to thump you on the nose?' he inquired. "'What for?' "'For makin' so free with my hay.' "'Why, then,' said I, "'I should earnestly endeavour to thump you on yours.' The farmer looked me slowly over from head to foot, with a dawning surprise. "'Thought you was a common tramper, I did,' said he. "'Why, so I am,' I answered, brushing the clinging hay from me. "'Trampers of the road don't wear gentlemen's clothes. Leastways I never see one as did.' Here his eyes wandered over me again, from my boots upward. Halfway up they stopped, evidently arrested by my waistcoat, a flowered satin of the very latest cut, for which I had paid forty shillings in the haymarket, scarcely a week before, and as I looked down at it, I would joyfully have given it, and every waistcoat that was ever cut, to have had that forty shillings safe back in my pocket again. That be a mighty fine waistcoat, sir. Do you think so? said I. Ah, that I do. What might be the cost of a waistcoat the like of that now? I paid forty shillings for it in the haymarket in London scarcely a week ago, I answered. The fellow very slowly closed one eye at the same time striking his nose three successive raps with his forefinger. Come on, said he. Nonetheless, it's true, said I. Any man as would give forty shillin' for a garment as is no mortal good again the cold, not reachin' far enough, even if it do be silk, it all worked with little flowers is a damned fool. Assuredly, said I, with a nod. Howsomever, he continued, it's a handsome waistcoat, there's no denying, and well worth a woman's looking at, with a proper man inside of it. Not a doubt of it, said I. I mean, said he, scratching his ear, and staring hard at the handle of the pitchfork, a chap with a fine pair of whiskers, say. Hmm, said I. Now, woman, he went on, shifting his gaze to the top button of his left gaiter, woman is uncommon fond a good pair of whiskers, leastways, so I've heard. Indeed, said I. Few women can look upon such things unmoved, I believe, and nothing can set off a pair of fine black whiskers better than a flowered satin waistcoat. That's so, nodded the farmer. But, unfortunately said I, passing my hand over my smooth lip and chin. I have no whiskers. No, returned the farmer, with a thoughtful shake of the head. Leastways none as I can observe. Now you have, said I. So they do tell me, he answered modestly. And the natural inference is that you ought to have a flowered waistcoat to go with them. Why, that's true, to be sure. He nodded. The price of this one is fifteen shillings, said I. That's a lot of money, master, said he, shaking his head. It's a great deal less than forty, said I. And ten is less than fifteen, and a ten shilling is my price. What do you say? Come now. You drive a hard bargain, said I, but the waistcoat is yours at your own price. So saying, I slipped off knapsack and coat, and, removing the garment in question, having first felt through the pockets, handed it to him, whereupon he slowly counted the ten shillings into my hand, which done, he sat down upon the shaft of a cart nearby, and, spreading out the waistcoat on his knees, looked it over with glistening eyes. Forty shillin' you paid for an up to London?' said he. Forty shillin' it were, I think.' Forty shillings, said I. Ecard, it's a sight of money. But it's a grand waistcoat, ah, that it is. So you believe me now, do you? 
said I, pocketing the ten shillings. Well, he answered slowly, I won't go so fur as that, but tis a mighty fine waistcoat there's no denying, and must a cost a sight o' money, a powerful sight. I picked up my knapsack, and, slipping it on, took my staff, and turned to depart. There's a mug o' home-brewed, and a slice of fine roast beef up at the house, if you should be so inclined. Why, as to that, said I, over my shoulder, I neither eat nor drink with a man who doubts my word. Meaning those forty shillin? Precisely. Well, said he, twisting his whisker with a thoughtful air, if you could manage to make it twenty, or even twenty-five, I might make some shift to believe it. Though it would be a strain. But forty! No, Tam, I can't swallow that. Then neither can I swallow your beef and ale, said I. Where be goin'? he inquired, rising and following as I made for the gate. To the end of the road, I answered. Then ye be goin' pretty fur. That there road leads to the sea. Why, then, I'm going to the sea, said I. What to do? I haven't the ghost of an idea, I returned. Can you work? Yes, said I. Can you thatch a rick? No said I. Shear a sheep? No, said I. Guide a plough? No, said I. Shoe a horse? No, said I. Then you can't work. Lord love me. Where have you been? At a university, said I. Where, master? At a place warranted to turn one out a highly educated incompetent, I explained. Why, I don't hold with education, nor book learning myself, master. Here I be, with a good farm, and money in the bank, and can't write my own name, said the farmer. And here am I, a first in literae humaniores, selling my waistcoat that I may eat, said I. Being come to the gate of the yard, I paused. There is one favour you might grant me, said I. As what, master? Five minutes under the pump yonder, and a clean towel. The farmer nodded, and, crossing to one of the outhouses, presently returned with a towel, and, resting the towel upon the pump-head, he seized the handle, and sent a jet of clear, cool water over my head, and face, and hands. "'You've got a tidy, sizable arm,' said he, as I dried myself vigorously. "'Likewise a good, strong back and shoulders. There's the makings of a man in you as might do summit. Uh, say, in the plough or smithin' way. But it's easy to see as you're a gentleman. More's the pity, and won't. Howsoever, sir, if you've a mind to a cut o' good beef and a mug o' fine ale, say the word. First, said I, do you believe it was forty shillings, yes or no? The farmer twisted his whisker and stared very hard at the spout of the pump. Tell you what said he at length. Make it thirty, and I give you my Bible oath to do the best with it I can. Then I must needs seek my breakfast at the nearest inn, said I. And that is the old cock, a mile and a half nearer Tunbridge. Then the sooner I start the better, said I, for I'm mightily sharp set. Why, as to that, said he, busy with his whisker again, I might stretch a pint or two and call it thirty-five. At a pinch. What do you say? Why, I say good morning, and many of them. And, opening the gate, I started off down the road at a brisk pace. Now, as I went, it began to rain. Book One, Chapter Nine, in which I stumble upon an affair of honour. There are times, as I suppose, when the most aesthetic of souls will forget the snow of lilies and the down of a butterfly's wing to revel in the grosser joys of, say, a beefsteak. One cannot rhapsodize upon the beauties of a sunset, or contemplate the pale witchery of the moon with any real degree of poetic fervor, or any degree of comfort, while hunger gnaws at one's vitals. For comfort is essential to your aesthete, and after all, soul goes hand in hand with stomach. 
Thus I swung along the road beneath the swaying green of trees, past the fragrant, blooming hedges, paying small heed to the beauties of wooded hill and grassy dale, my eyes constantly searching the road before me for some sign of the old cock tavern. And presently, sure enough, I espied it, an ugly, flat-fronted building, before which stood a dilapidated horse trough and a battered sign. Despite its uninviting exterior, I hurried forward, and, mounting the three worn steps, pushed open the door. I now found myself in a room of somewhat uninviting aspect, though upon the hearth a smouldering fire was being kicked into a blaze by a sulky-faced fellow to whom I addressed myself. "'Can I have some breakfast here?' said I. "'Why, it's all according, master,' he answered in a surly tone. "'According to what?' said I. "'According to what you want, master.' "'Why, as to that,' I began, "'because,' he went on, administering a particularly vicious kick to the fire, "'if you was to ask me for a French hortelon, or even the ump of a camel, being a very truthful man, I should say no.' "'But I want no such things,' said I. "'And how am I to know that? How am I to know, as you ain't set your art on the ump of a camel? I tell you I want nothing of the sort, said I. A chop would do. Chop, sighed the man, scowling threateningly at the fire. Chop! Or steak, I hastened to add. No, it's a steak, said the man, shaking his head ruefully, and turning upon me a doleful eye. A steak, he repeated. Of course it would be. I suppose you'd turn up your nose at ham and eggs. It's only to be expected. On the contrary, said I, ham and eggs will suit me very well. Why couldn't you have mentioned them before? Why, you never asked me, as I remember, growled the fellow. Slipping my knapsack from my shoulders, I sat down at a small table in a corner, while the man, with a final kick at the fire, went to give my order. In a few minutes he reappeared with some billets of wood beneath his arm, and followed by a merry-eyed, rosy-cheeked lass, who proceeded, very deftly, to lay a snowy cloth and thereupon, in due season, a dish of savoury ham and golden-yoked eggs. "'It's a lovely morning,' said I, lifting my eyes to her comely face. "'It is indeed, sir.' said she, setting down the cruet with a turn of her slender wrist. "'Which I make so bold as to deny,' said the surly man, dropping the wood on the hearth with a prodigious clatter. "'How can any morning be lovely, and there ain't no love in it? No, not so much as would fill a thimble. I say it ain't a lovely morning, not by no manner of means, and what I says I ain't ashamed on, being a naturally truthful man.' with which words he sighed, kicked the fire again, and stumped out. "'Our friend would seem somewhat gloomy this morning,' said I. "'He've been that way a fortnight now, come Saturday,' replied the slim lass, nodding. "'Oh?' said I. "'Yes,' she continued, checking a smile, and sighing instead. "'It's very sad. He've been crossed in love, you see, sir.' "'Poor fellow,' said I. "'Can't you try to console him?' "'Me, sir? Oh, no. And why not? I should think you might console a man for a great deal.' "'Why, you see, sir,' said she, blushing and dimpling very prettily, "'it do so happen, as I'm the one as crossed him.' "'Ah, I understand,' said I. "'I'm to be married to a farmer down the road yonder, and leastways I haven't quite made up my mind yet.' "'A fine, tall fellow?' I inquired. "'Yes. Do we know him, sir?' "'With a handsome pair of black whiskers,' said I. "'The very same, sir. And they do be handsome whiskers, though I do say it. "'The finest I ever saw. I wish you every happiness,' said I. "'Thank you, sir, I'm sure,' said she, and, dimpling more prettily than ever, she tripped away and left me to my repast. And when I had assuaged my hunger— I took out the pipe of Adam, the groom, the pipe shaped like a negro's head, and calling for a paper of tobacco, I filled and lighted the pipe, and sat staring dreamily out of the window. 
happy is that man who, by reason of an abundant fortune, knows not the meaning of the word hunger. But thrice happy is he who, when the hand of famine pinches, may stay his craving with such a meal as this of mine. Never before, and never since, have I tasted such eggs, and such ham. So tender, so delicate, so full of flavor. It is a memory that can never fade. Indeed, sometimes, even now, when I grow hungry, about dinner-time, I see once more the surly-faced man, the rosy-cheeked waiting-maid, and the gloomy chamber of the old cock tavern as I saw them upon that early May morning of the year of grace, eighteen... Hmm. So I sat, with a contented mind, smoking my pipe and staring out at the falling summer rain. And presently, chancing to turn my eyes up the road, I beheld a chase that galloped in a smother of mud. As I watched its rapid approach, the postilion swung his horses toward the inn, and a moment later had pulled up before the door. They had evidently travelled fast and far, for the chase was covered with dirt, and the poor horses, in a lather of foam, hung their heads, while their flanks heaved distressfully. A chase door was now thrown open, and three gentlemen alighted. The first was a short, plethoric individual, bull-necked and loud of voice, for I could hear him roundly cursing the post-boy for some fault. The second was a tall, languid gentleman, who carried a flat, oblong box beneath one arm, and who paused to fondle his whisker, and look up at the inn with an exaggerated air of disgust, while the third stood mutely by, his hands thrust into the pockets of his greatcoat, and stared straight before him. The three of them entered the room together, and while the languid gentleman paused to survey himself in the small cracked mirror that hung against the wall, the plethoric individual bustled to the fire, and loosening his coats and neckerchief, spread out his hands to the blaze. "'A good half-hour before our time,' said he, glancing towards the third gentleman, who stood looking out of the window with his hands still deep in his pockets. "'We did the last ten miles well under the hour. "'Come, what do you say to a glass of brandy?' "'At this the languid companion turned from the mirror, "'and I noticed that he too glanced at the silent figure by the window. "'By all means,' said he, "'though Sir Jasper would hardly seem in a drinking humour. "'And with the very slightest shrug of the shoulders "'he turned back to the mirror again. "'No.' "'Mr. Chester, I am not in a drinking humour,' answered Sir Jasper, without turning round or taking his eyes from the window. "'Sir Jasper,' said I to myself, "'now where and in what connection have I heard such a name before?' He was of a slight build, and seemingly younger than either of his companions by some years, but what struck me particularly about him was the extreme pallor of his face. I noticed also a peculiar habit he had of moistening his lips at frequent intervals with the tip of his tongue, and there was, besides, something in the way he stared at the trees, the wet road, and the grey sky, a strange wide-eyed intensity that drew and held my attention. "'Devilish weather! Devilish! On my life and soul!' exclaimed the short red-faced man in a loud peevish tone, tugging viciously at the bell-rope. Hot one day, cold the next. Now sun, now rain. Oh, damn it! Now, in France, ah, what a climate! Heavenly, positively divine. Say what you will of a Frenchman, damn him by all means, but the climate, the country, and the women, who would not worship him. Exactly said the languid gentleman, examining a pimple upon his chin with a high degree of interest. Always dored a Frenchwoman myself. They are so, so, ah, uh, so deuced French. Though mark you, Selby, he broke off as the rosy-cheeked maid appeared with the brandy and glasses. Though mark you, there's much to be said for your English country wenches, after all. Saying which, he slipped his arm about the girl's round waist. There was the sound of a kiss, a muffled shriek, and she had run from the room, slamming the door behind her, 
whereupon the languid gentleman went back to his pimple. "'Oh, as to that, Chester, I quarrel only with the climate. God made England, and the devil sends the weather.' "'Selby,' said Sir Jasper, in the same repressed tone that he had used before, and still without taking his eyes from the grey prospect of sky and tree and winding road, there is no fairer land in all the world than this england of ours it were a good thing to die for england but that is a happiness reserved for comparatively few and with the words he sighed a strange fluttering sigh and thrust his hands deeper into his pockets die repeated the man selby in a loud boisterous way who talks of death deuced unpleasant subject said the other, with a shrug at the cracked mirror. Something so infernally cold and clammy about it, like the weather. And yet it will be a glorious day later. The clouds are thinning already, Sir Jasper went on. Strange, but I never realized until this morning how green and wonderful everything is. The languid Mr. Chester forgot the mirror, and turned to stare at Sir Jasper's back with raised brows, while the man Selby shook his head and smiled unpleasantly. As he did so, his eye encountered me, where I sat, quietly in my corner, smoking my negro-head pipe, and his thick brows twitched sharply together in a frown. "'In an hour's time, gentlemen,' pursued Sir Jasper, "'we shall write finis.' to a more or less interesting incident, and I beg of you, in that hour, to remember my prophecy, that it would be a glorious day later. Mr. Chester filled a glass, and, crossing to the speaker, tendered it to him without a word. As for Selby, he stood stolidly enough, his hands thrust truculently beneath his coat-tails, frowning at me. Come, said Mr. Chester persuasively, just a bracer. Sir Jasper shook his head, but next moment reached out a white, unsteady hand, and raised the brandy to his lips. Yet, as he drank, I saw the spirit slop over and trickle from his chin. "'Thanks, Jester,' said he, returning the empty glass. "'Is it time we started yet?' "'It's just half-past seven, answered Mr. Chester, consulting his watch, "'and I'm rather hazy as to the exact place.' Deep Dean Wood, said Sir Jasper dreamily. You know the place? Oh, yes. Then we may as well start, if, if you are ready. Yes, it will be cool and fresh outside. Settle the bill, Selby. We'll walk on slowly, said Mr. Chester, and, with a last glance at the mirror, he slipped his arm within Sir Jasper's, and they went out together. Mr. Selby, meanwhile, rang for the bill, frowning at me all the time. "'What the devil are you staring at?' he demanded suddenly, in a loud, bullying tone. "'If you are pleased to refer to me, sir,' said I, "'I would say that my eyes were given for use, and that having used them upon you, I have long since arrived at the conclusion that I don't like you.' "'Ah!' said he, frowning fiercer than ever. Yes, said I, though whether it is your person, your manner, or your voice that displeases me most, I am unable to say. But impertinent young jackanapes, said he, damnation, I think I'll pull your nose. Why, you may try, and welcome, sir, said I, though I should advise you not, for should you make the attempt, I should be compelled to throw you out of the window. At this moment the pretty maid appeared, and tendered him the bill with a courtesy. He glanced at it, tossed some money upon the table, and turned to stare at me again. "'If ever I meet you again,' he began, "'you'd probably know me,' I put in. "'Without a doubt,' he answered, putting on his hat and buttoning his befrogged surtout. "'And should you,' he continued, drawing on his gloves, should you stare at me with those damned impertinent fish's eyes of yours, I should most certainly pull your nose for you, on the spot, sir. And I should as certainly throw you out of the window, I nodded. An impertinent young Japanapes, said he again, and went out, banging the door behind him. 
Glancing from the window, I saw him catch up with the other two, and all three walk on together down the road. Sir Jasper was in the middle, and I noticed that his hands were still deep in his pockets. Now, as I watched their forms getting smaller and smaller in the distance, there grew upon me a feeling that he who walked between would never more come walking back, and, in a little, having knocked out my negro-head pipe upon my palm, I called for and settled my score. As I rose, the pretty chambermaid picked up my knapsack from the corner, and, blushing, aided me to put it on. "'My dear, thank you,' said I, and kissed her. This time she neither shrieked nor ran from the room. She merely blushed a trifle rosier. "'Do you think I have fish's eyes, my dear?' "'La, no, sir. Handsome they be, I'm sure. So bright and black, with little lights a-dancing in them.' there sir do her done and go along with you by the way i said pausing upon the worn steps and looking back at her by the way how far is it to deep dean wood book one chapter ten which relates the end of an honourable affair some half mile along the road upon the left hand was a stile and beyond the stile a path a path that led away over field and meadow and winding stream, to the blue verge of distant woods. Now, midway between these woods and the place where I stood, there moved three figures, and far away, though they were, I could still make out that the middle one walked with his hands, those tremulous, betraying hands, thrust deep within his pockets. And presently I climbed the stile and set off along the path. "'Sir Jasper,' said I to myself, somewhere in the background of my consciousness I had a vague recollection of having heard mention of such a name before, but exactly when and where I could not for the life of me remember. "'Sir Jasper,' said I to myself again, "'it is a very uncommon name, and should be easy to recollect. I had often prided myself on possessing a singularly retentive memory.' more especially for names and faces, but upon the present occasion the more I pondered the matter, the more hazy I became. So I walked on through the sweet wet grass, racking my brain for a solution of the problem, but finding none. When I again looked up, the three figures had vanished where the path took a sharp bend round a clump of pollard oaks, and determined not to lose them, I hurried my steps." but when i in turn rounded the corner not a soul was in sight the path sloped up gently before me with a thick hedge upon my right and after crossing a brawling stream lost itself in the small wood or coppice that crowned the ascent wondering i hastened forward and then happening to look through the hedge which grew very thick and high i stopped all at once on the other side of the hedge was a strip of meadow bounded by the brook I have mentioned. Now across this stream was a small rustic bridge, and on this bridge was a man. Midway between this man and myself stood a group of four gentlemen, all talking very earnestly together, to judge by their actions, while somewhat apart from these, his head bent, his hands still thrust deep in his pockets, stood Sir Jasper and from him, for no apparent reason, my eyes wandered to the man upon the bridge, a tall, broad-shouldered fellow, in a buff-coloured greatcoat, who whistled to himself, and stared down into the stream, swinging his tasselled riding-boot to and fro. All at once, as if in response to some signal, he rose, and, unbuttoning his surtout, drew it off and flung it across the handrail of the bridge. Mr. Chester was on his knees before the oblong box, and I saw the glint of the pistols as he handed them up. The distance had already been paced and marked out, and now each man took his ground. Sir Jasper, still in his greatcoat, his hat over his eyes, his neckerchief loose and dangling, one hand in his pocket, the other grasping his weapon. 
his antagonist, on the contrary, jaunty and debonair, a dandy from the crown of his hat to the soles of his shining boots. Their arms were raised almost together. The man Selby glanced from one to the other, a handkerchief fluttered, fell, and in that instant came the report of a pistol. I saw Sir Jasper reel backward, steady himself, and fire in return. Then, while the blue smoke yet hung in the still air, he staggered blindly and fell. Mr. Chester and two or three more ran forward and knelt beside him, while his opponent shrugged his shoulders and, taking off his hat, pointed out the bullet-hole to his white-faced second. And in a little while they lifted Sir Jasper in their arms, but, seeing how his head hung, a sudden sickness came upon me, for I knew, indeed, that he would go walking back never more. Yet his eyes were wide and staring, staring up at the blue heaven with the same fixed intensity as they had done at the inn. Then I, too, looked up at the cloudless sky and round upon the fair earth, and in that moment I, for one, remembered his prophecy of an hour ago. And indeed, the day was glorious. End of section four. Section five of the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book one, chapter eleven which relates a brief passage-at-arms at the Chequers Inn. In due season I came into Tunbridge Town, and, following the high street, presently observed a fine inn upon the right-hand side of the way, which, as I remember, is called the Chequers. And here were divers loiterers, lounging round the door, or seated upon the benches, but the eyes of all were turned the one way. And presently, as I paused before the inn, to look up at its snow-white plaster and massive cross-beams, there issued from the stable-yard one in a striped waistcoat, with top boots and a red face, who took a straw from behind his ear, and began to chew it meditatively, to whom I now addressed myself. "'Good afternoon,' said I. "'Afternoon,' he answered. "'A fine day,' said I. "'Is it?' said he. "'Why, to be sure it is, said I, somewhat taken aback by his manner. To be sure it is. Oh, said he, and shifted the straw very dexterously from one corner of his mouth to the other, by some unseen agency, and stared up the road harder than ever. What are you looking at? I inquired. Ill, said he. And why do you look at the hill? Mile, said he. Oh, said I. Ah, said he. Is it the London coach? Ah, said he. Does it stop here? Ah, said he. Do you ever say anything much beside ah? I inquired. He stopped chewing the straw, and with his eyes on the distance, seemed to turn this question over in his mind, having done which, he began to chew again. Ah, said he. "'Why, then you can, perhaps, tell me how many miles it is. Five, said he. "'I was about to ask how far it was to—' "'The Wales,' said he. "'Why, yes, to be sure, but how did you know that?' "'It's use,' said he. "'What do you mean?' "'They all ask,' said he. "'Who do?' "'Tromps,' said he. "'Oh, so you take me for a tramp?' "'Aw,' said he. And you, said I, put me in mind of a certain semi-quavering friar. Eh? Hey, said he, frowning a little at the hill. You've never heard of Rabelais or Panurge, of course, said I. The ostler took out his straw, eyed it thoughtfully, and put it back again. No, said he. More's the pity, said I, and was about to turn away, when he drew the nearest fist abruptly from his pocket, and extended it towards me. Look at that! he commanded. "'Rather dirty,' I commented. "'But otherwise a good, useful member, I make no doubt.' "'It's a-goin,' 
said he, alternately drawing in and shooting out the fist in question, "'it's a-goin' to fill your eye up.' "'Is it?' said I. "Ah," oh, said he. "'But what for?' "'I aren't a semi, nor yet a quaver, and as for friars,' said he very deliberately, "'why, friar yourself,' says I. "'Nevertheless,' said I, you are gifted with a certain terse directness of speech that greatly reminds me of Joe, he called out suddenly over his shoulder, Mail Joe. Lifting my eyes to the brow of the hill, I could see nothing save a faint haze, which, however, gradually grew denser and thicker, and out from this gathering cloud, soft and faint with distance, stole the silvery notes of a horn. Now I saw the coach itself, and, as I watched it rapidly descending the hill, I longed to be upon it, with the sun above, the smooth road below, and the wind rushing through my hair. On it came at a gallop, rocking and swaying, a good fifteen miles an hour. On it came, plunging into the green shade of trees, and out into the sun again, with ever the gathering dust cloud behind, while clear and high rang the cheery note of the horn. And now, from the cool shadows of the inn-yard, there rose a prodigious stamping of hoofs, rattling of chains, and swearing of oaths, and out came four fresh horses, led by two men, each of whom wore top-boots, a striped waistcoat, and chewed upon straws. And now the coach swung round the bend, and came thundering down upon the checkers, chains jingling, wheels rumbling, horn braying, and, with a stamp and ring of hoof, pulled up before the inn. And then what a running to and fro, what a prodigious unbuckling and buckling of straps, while the jovial-faced coachman fanned himself with his hat, and swore jovially at the ostlers, and the ostlers swore back at the coachman, and the guard, and the coach, and the horses, individually and collectively. In the midst of which confusion, down came the window with a bang, and out of the window came a flask and a hand and an arm, and last of all a great fat-faced round and mottled and roaring as it came. Oh ho! I say, damn it! Damn everybody's eyes and bones! Brandy! Oh, yo ho, house! I say, brandy! God, landlord, ostlers! brandy do you hear i say what the devil am i to die for want of a drop of brandy ho oh, ho now little by little i became conscious how i cannot define that i was the object of a close and persistent scrutiny that i was being watched and stared at by some one near by shifting my eyes therefore from the mottled face at the coach window I cast them swiftly about until they presently met those of one of the four outside passengers, a tall, roughly clad man who leaned far out from the coach roof, watching me intently, and his face was thin and very pale, and the eyes which stared into mine glowed beneath a jagged prominence of brow. At the time, though I wondered at the man's expression and the fixity of his gaze, I paid him no further heed but turned my attention back to Mottle Face, who had, by this time, bellowed himself purple. Howbeit, in due time, the flask having been replenished and handed to him, he dived back into the recesses of the coach, jerked up the window, and vanished as suddenly as he had appeared. But now the four fresh horses were in and harnessed, capering and dancing with an ostler at the head of each, the driver tossed off his glass of rum and water, cast an eye up at the clouds, remarked, "'Wind by Jiminy!' settled his feet against the dashboard, and gathered up the reins. And now, too, the guard appeared, wiping his lips as he came, who also cast an eye up at the heavens, remarked, "'Dost by Jingo!' and swung himself up into the rumble. "'All right behind!' sang out the driver over his shoulder. "'All right!' sang back the guard. "'Then let him go!' cried the driver, whereupon the ostlers jumped nimbly back, the horses threw up their heads, and danced undecidedly for a moment, the long whip cracked, hooves clattered, sparks flew, and, rumbling and creaking, off went the London mail with such a flourish of the horn as woke many a sleepy echo near and far. As I turned away I noticed that there remained but three outside passengers, 
The pale-faced man had evidently alighted, yet, although I glanced round for him, he was nowhere to be seen. Hereupon, being in no mind to undergo the operation of having my eye filled up, and, moreover, finding myself thirsty, I stepped into the tap, and there, sure enough, was the outside passenger staring moodily out of the window, and with an untouched mug of ale at his elbow. Opposite him sat an old man in a smock frock, who leaned upon a holly-stick, talking to a very short, fat man behind the bar, who took my twopence with a smile, smiled as he drew my ale, and, smiling, watched me drink. "'Be you from London, sir?' inquired the old man, eyeing me beneath his hoary brows as I set down my tankard. "'Yes,' said I. "'Well, think of that now. I've been a-going to London this five-and-forty year. Started out twice, I did, but I never got no further nor seven oaks.' "'How is that?' I inquired. "'Why, there's the White Hart at Seven Oaks, and they brews fine ale at the White Hart, do you see, and one glass begets another.' <laughs> "'And they sent you back in the carrier's cart,' said the fat man, smiling broader than ever. "'Ever see the Lord Mayor a-riding in his gould coach, sir?' pursued the old man. "'Yes,' said I. "'Ever speak to him?' "'Why, no.' "'Ah, oh, well, I once knowed a man is spoke to the Lord Mayor of London's coachman.' but he's dead took the smallpox the year afterwards and died he did at this juncture the door was thrown noisily open and two gentlemen entered the first was a very tall man with black hair that curled beneath his hat brim and so luxuriant a growth of whisker that it left little of his florid countenance exposed the second was more slightly built with a pale hairless face wherein were set two small very bright eyes rather close together separated by a high thin nose with nostrils that worked and quivered when he spoke a face whose most potent feature was the mouth coarse and red with a somewhat protuberant underlip yet supported by a square determined chin below a sensual mouth with more than a suspicion of cruelty lurking in its full curves and the big teeth which gleamed white and serrated when he laughed indeed the whole aspect of the man filled me with an instinctive disgust they were dressed in that mixture of ultra fashionable and horsey styles peculiar to the corinthian or buck of the period and there was in their air an overbearing yet lazy insolence towards all and sundry that greatly annoyed me. Fifteen thousand a year, by God! exclaimed the taller of the two, giving a supercilious sniff to the brandy he had just poured out. Yes, ha, ha, and a damnably pretty filly into the bargain. You always were so infernally lucky, retorted the first. Call it rather the reward of virtue, answered his companion with a laugh that showed his big white teeth. And what of Beverly, poor devil? inquired the first. "'Beverly,' repeated the other, "'had he possessed any spirit, he would have blown his brains out like a gentleman. As it was, he preferred merely to disappear.' And herewith the speaker shrugged his shoulders, and drank off his glass with infinite relish and gusto. "'And a pretty fiddle, you say?' "'Oh, I believe you. Country bred, but devilish well-blooded. Trust Beverly for that.' "'He got, yes.' Beverly had a true eye for beauty or breed, poor devil. This expression of pity seemed to afford each of them much subtle enjoyment. Harking back to this filly, said the big man, checking his merriment, how if she jibs and cuts up rough, kicks over the traces? Devilish awkward, eh? His companion raised his foot, and rested it carelessly upon the settle nearby, and upon the heel of his slim riding-boot I saw a particularly cruel-looking, long-necked spur. "'My dear Mostyn,' said he, his nostrils working, "'for such an emergency there is nothing like a pair of good sharp persuaders.' Here he tapped the spur, lightly with the slender gold-mounted cane he carried." "'And I rather fancy I know just how and when to use him, Mostyn.' And once again I saw the gleam of his big white teeth. All this I heard as they lolled within a yard of me, manifesting a lofty and contemptuous disregard for all save themselves, waited upon most deferentially by the smiling fat fellow, and stared at by the aged man with as much admiring awe as if they had each been nothing less than a Lord Mayor of London at the very least.' 
But now they leaned their heads together and spoke in lowered tones, but something in the leering eyes of the one and the smiling lips of the other told me that it was not of horses that they spoke. "'Bring her to reason, by gad!' said the slighter of the two, setting down his empty glass with a bang. "'Oh, trust me to know their pretty skittish ways! Trust me to manage em! I've never failed yet, by gad!' "'Curse me, that's true enough!' said the other, and here they sank their voices again. My ale being finished, I took up my staff, a heavy knotted affair, and turned to go. Now, as I did so, my foot, by accident, came in contact with the gold-mounted cane I have mentioned, and sent it clattering to the floor. I was on the point of stooping for it when a rough hand gripped my shoulder from behind, twisting me savagely about, and thus found myself staring upon two rows of sharp white teeth. "'Pick it up!' said he, motioning imperiously to the cane on the floor between us. "'Heaven forbid, sir,' said I. "'Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing?' "'I told you to pick it up!' he repeated, thrusting his head towards me. "'Are you going to do so, or must I make you?' And his nostrils worked more than ever. For answer I raised my foot and sent the cane spinning across the room. Somebody laughed, and next moment my hat was knocked from my head. Before he could strike again, however, I raised my staff, but suddenly remembering its formidable weight, I altered the direction of the blow and thrust it strongly into the very middle of his gaily flowered waistcoat. So strongly did I thrust, indeed, that he would have fallen but for the timely assistance of his companion. "'Come, come,' said I, holding him off on the end of my staff. "'Be calm now, and let us reason together like logical beings.' I knocked down your cane by accident, and you my hat by intent. Very well, then, be so good as to return me my property from the yonder corner, and we will call it quits. No, by God, gasped my antagonist, bending almost double. Wait, only wait until I get my wind. I'll choke the infernal life out of you. Only wait, by God. Willingly, said I, but whatever else you do, you will certainly reach me my hat. Otherwise, just so soon as you find yourself sufficiently recovered, I shall endeavor to throw you after it. Saying which, I laid aside my staff and buttoned up my coat. Why, he began, you infernally low, dusty, ditch trotting blackguard! But his companion, who had been regarding me very closely, twitched him by the sleeve and whispered something in his ear. Whatever it was, it affected my antagonist strangely, for he grew suddenly very red, and then very white, and abruptly turned his back upon me. "'Are you sure, Mostyn?' said he in an undertone. "'Certain. Well, I'd fight him were he the devil himself. Pistols, perhaps, would be—' "'Don't be a fool, Harry!' cried the other, and, seizing his arm, drew him farther away, and, though they lowered their voices, I caught such fragments as, What of George? Changes since your time. Ruin your chances at the start. Dead shot. Sir, said I, my hat, in the corner yonder. Almost to my surprise, the taller of the two crossed the room, followed by his friend, to whom he still spoke in lowered tones, stooped, picked up my hat, and, while the other stood scowling, approached and handed it to me with a bow. "'That my friend Sir Harry Mortimer lost his temper is regretted both by him and myself,' said he, "'but is readily explained by the fact that he has been a long time from London. While I laboured under a, uh, a disadvantage, sir, until your hat was off.' Now, as he spoke, his left eyelid flickered twice in rapid succession. "'I beg you won't mention it,' said I, putting on my hat. "'But, sir, why do you wink at me?' "'No, no!' cried he, laughing and shaking his head. "'Ha, <laughs> ha! Devilish good! By the way, they tell me George himself is in these parts. In cog, of course.' "'George?' said I, staring. "'Cursed rich! On my life and soul!' cried the tall gentleman, shaking his head and laughing again. "'Mum's the word, of course, and I swear a shaven face becomes you most devilishly.' "'Perhaps you will be so obliging as to tell me what you mean,' said I, frowning. "'Oh, my God!' he cried, fairly hugging himself with delight. 
Oh, the devil! This is too rich, too infernally rich, on my life and soul it is! Now all at once there recurred to me the memory of Tom Cragg and the pugilist, of how he too had winked at me, and of his incomprehensible manner afterwards beneath the gibbet on River Hill. Sir, said I, do you happen to know a pugilist, Tom Cragg by name? Tom Cragg? Well, I should think so. Who doesn't, sir? Because, I went on, he too seems to labor under the delusion that he is acquainted with me, and— Acquainted! repeated the tall gentleman. Acquainted! Oh, God! And immediately hugged himself in another ecstasy. If— said I, you will have the goodness to tell me for whom you evidently mistake me. Mistake you? he gasped, throwing himself upon the settle and rocking to and fro. <laughs> mistake you? Seeing I did but waste my breath, I turned upon my heel and made for the door. As I went, my eye, by chance, lighted upon a cheese that stood at the fat landlord's elbow, and upon which he cast amorous glances from time to time. "'That seems a fine cheese,' said I. "'It is, sir, if I might make so bold. A noble cheese,' he rejoined, and laid his hand upon it with a touch that was a caress. "'Then I will take three pennyworth of your noble cheese,' said I. "'Cheese!' faintly echoed the gentleman upon the saddle. Three pennyworth! Oh, I shall die! Positively burst!' "'Also a loaf!' said I, and when the landlord cut the cheese with great nicety, a generous portion, and had wrapped it into a parcel, I put it, together with the loaf, into my knapsack, and, giving him good day, strode to the door. As I reached it, the tall gentleman rose from the settle and bowed. Uh, referring to George, sir. George, said I shortly, to the devil with George. Now I could not help being struck by the effect of my words, for Sir Harry let fall his cane, and stared open-mouthed, while his companion regarded me with an expression between a frown and wide-eyed dismay. "'Now I wonder,' said I to myself, as I descended the steps, "'I wonder who George can be.' Before the inn there stood a yellow-wheeled Stanhope, with a horse which, from his manner of trembling all over for no conceivable reason, and manifest desire to stand upon his hind legs, I conceived to be a thoroughbred, and, hanging grimly to the bridle, now in the air, now on terra firma, alternately coaxing and cursing, was my friend the semi-quavering ostler. He caught sight of me just as a particularly vicious jerk swung him off his legs. "'Damn your liver!' he cried to the horse, and then to me, "'If you'll just call Joe to old this here black varmin for me, I'll feel your eye up!' thanks said i but i much prefer to keep it as it is really there is no need to trouble joe and as for you i wish you good morning and when i had gone a little way chancing to glance back over my shoulder i saw the outside passenger stood upon the inn steps and was staring after me book one chapter twelve the one-legged soldier following the high road i came in a little to where the ways divided, the one leading straight before me, the other turning sharp to the left, where, as I remember, is a very steep hill. And at the parting of the ways was a finger-post with the words, To London, to Tunbridge Wells, to Pembry. Now as I stood beneath the finger-post, debating which road I should take, I was aware of the sound of wheels, and, glancing about, saw a carrier's cart approaching. The driver was a fine, tall, ruddy-faced fellow, very spruce as to his person, who held himself with shoulders squared and bolt upright, and who shouted a cheery greeting to me. "'If so be you are for Pembury or thereabouts, sir,' said he, bringing his horses to a standstill, "'why, jump up, sir, that is, if you be so minded.' "'My course lies anywhere,' said I. "'Then, if you be so minded.' "'I am so minded,' said I. "'Then, sir, jump up,' said he. "'Thanks,' said I. So I climbed upon the seat beside him, and then I saw that he had a wooden leg, and straightway understood his smart bearing and general neat appearance. "'You have been a soldier?' said I. "'And my name's Tom, and I could tell you a sight about them Spanishers and Frenchies, that is, if you be so minded.' 
I am so minded. Fire away, Tom. Well, he began, fixing his eyes on the wheeler's ears, the Frenchies ain't so bad as is thought, though they do eat frogs, but what I say is, if they be so minded, my frogs let it be. To be sure, said I. And after all, they're well worth fighting, and that's more than you can say for a many. True, said I. One generally has a certain respect for the man one fights. Then there's old Boney. Have you ever seen him? I have, sir. I were captured outside the lines of Torres Vedras, and I saw old Boney eating his breakfast off a drumhead, with one hand, and a right in a dispatch with the other. A little fat man, not so high as my shoulder, look you. There's some as says old Boney lives on newborn babies, but I know different. Because why, says you? Because I've seen with these here peepers, says I. Bread it were, and cheese and garlic, and an uncommon lot at that. And where did you lose your leg, Tom? Victoria. I happened to be carrying my officer, Ensign Standish his name, barely eighteen year old. Shot through the lung he were, and are trying to tell me to put him down and go, the fire being uncommonly hot there, you'll understand, sir, and as I say, he were trying to tell me to drop him and run for it, and blowin' blood bubbles with every word, when all at once I feels a sort of a shock, and there I was on my back, and him atop o' me. And when I went to get up, <laughs> damn, there was my leg gone below the knee, and no pleasant sight, neither. And afterward? Afterwards? he repeated. Why, that were the end of my soldiering, you see. We lay in the same hospital, him and me, side by side, and he swore as I'd saved his life, which I hadn't, look ye, and likewise swore as he'd never forget it. And he never has, either, for here am I, with my own horse and cart. Tom Price, by name, carrier by trade, and very much at your service, sir, I'm sure. Thus we climbed the hill of Pembry by tree and hedge and lonely cottage, by rolling meadow and twilight wood, Tom the soldier and I. Much he told me of lonely night watches, of death sudden and sharp, of long weary marches and stricken fields, of the bloody doings of the Spanish guerrillas, of Mina and his deviltries and in my ears was the roar of guns, and before my eyes the gleam and twinkle of bayonets. By the side of Tom the soldier I waited the thunderous charge of French dragoons, saw their stern set faces, and the flash of their brandished steel as they swept down upon our devoted square, swept down to break in red confusion before our bristling bayonets, and the air was full of the screams of smitten horses, and the deep-throated shouts and groans of men. By the side of Tom the soldier I stormed through many a reeking breach, swept by fire and slippery with blood. And all for the love of it, the munificent sum of eight pence per day, and that which we call glory. Bravo, Tom the soldier! And presently I became aware that he had stopped his horses, and was regarding me smilingly. Tom, said I, you are a wonderful talker. And you, sir, said he, are a better listener. And look you, a good listener is mighty hard to come by. Howsomever, here's the end of my journey, more's the pity. But if you, Tom, said I suddenly, you never heard of Tom Cragg, did you? I can't say I have, he answered, stroking his chin thoughtfully, though there was a Dick Snagget in the thirty-ninth, I remember. "'And you don't know who George is, of course,' I continued musingly. "'Why, I've known a many Georges in my time,' said he. "'And then there's George, Prince of Wales, the Prince Regent, as they calls him now.' "'George, Prince of Wales,' said I, staring. "'By heavens, Tom, I believe you've hit it.' And, with the word, I sprang down from the cart. "'My cottage is nearby, sir, and I should be proud for you to eat supper with me. That is if you be so minded. Many thanks, said I, but I am not so minded. And so, good-bye, Tom. And with the words, I wrung the soldier's honest hand in mine, and went upon my way. George, Prince of Wales, said I to myself, could this be the George they had meant? If so, then who and what had they supposed me? Hereupon, as I walked, I fell into a profound meditation, 
in which I presently remembered how that Tom Craig had also mentioned the prince, giving me to understand that his highness had actually ordered him, Tom Craig, to leave London. And why? After that there kidnapping, and me having laid out Sir Jasper Trent, according to your orders. Sir Jasper Trent! I stopped stock still on the road. Sir Jasper Trent! At last I remembered the name that had eluded me so persistently. Remembered it? Nay, indeed, it was rather as if the pugilist had whispered the words into my ear, and I glanced round almost expecting to see him. Arter that there kidnapping, and me having laid out Sir Jasper Trent, according to your orders. According to my orders, or, rather, the orders of the man for whom he, in common with the two gentlemen at the checkers, had mistaken me. But who was that man? Of him I knew two facts, namely that he was much like me in person, and had formerly worn, or possibly still wore, whiskers. And beyond these two facts I could get no farther, revolve the matter how I might, so I presently shrugged my shoulders, and, banishing it from my thoughts for the time being, set forward at a good pace. End of section five. Section six of the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book one, chapter thirteen, in which I find an answer to my riddle. The sun was already westering when I came to a pump beside the way, and seizing the handle, I worked it vigorously, then, placing my hollowed hands beneath the gushing spout, drank and pumped alternately, until I had quenched my thirst. I now found myself prodigiously hungry, and, remembering the bread and cheese in my knapsack, looked about for an inviting spot in which to eat. On one side of the road was a thick hedge, and, beneath this hedge, a deep, dry, grassy ditch, and here, after first slipping off my knapsack, I sat down, took out the loaf and the cheese, and, opening my clasp-knife, prepared to fall to. At this moment I was interrupted in a rather singular fashion, for hearing a rustling close by, I looked up, and into a face that was protruded through a gap in the hedge above me. It needed but a glance at the battered hat with its jaunty brim and great silver buckle, and the haggard devil-may-care face below, to recognize the individual whom I had seen thrown out of the hedge tavern the morning before. It was a very thin face, as I have said, pale and hollow-eyed, and framed in black curly hair, whose very blackness did but accentuate the extreme pallor of the skin, which was tight, and drawn above the cheek-bones and angle of the jaw. Yet as I looked at this face, worn and cadaverous though it was, in the glance of the hollow eyes, in the line of the clean-cut mouth, I saw that mysterious something which marks a man, what we call, for want of a better word, a gentleman. "'Good evening,' said he, and lifted the battered hat. "'Good evening,' I returned. "'Pardon me,' said he, but I was saluting the bread and cheese. Indeed, said I. Indeed, he rejoined, it is the first edible I have been on speaking terms with, so to speak, for rather more than three days, sir. You are probably hungry, said I. It would be foolish to deny it, sir. Then, if you care to eat with me in the ditch here, you are heartily welcome, said I. "'With all the pleasure in life,' said he, vaulting very nimbly through the hedge. "'You shall not ask me twice, or the very deuce is in it. Believe me, I—' Here he stopped very suddenly, and stood looking at me. "'Ah!' said he gently, and with a rising inflection, letting the ejaculation escape in a long-drawn breath. "'Well?' I inquired. Now as I looked up at him, the whole aspect of the man, from the toes of his broken boots to the crown of the battered hat, seemed to undergo a change, as though a sudden, fierce anger had leapt into life, and been controlled but by a strong effort. "'On my life and soul now,' 
said he, falling back a step, and eyeing me with a vaguely unpleasant smile, this is a most unexpected, a most unlooked-for pleasure. It is. I, I vow it is. You flatter me, said I. Oh, no, sir, no. To meet you again, some day, somewhere, alone, quite alone, sir, is a pleasure I have frequently dwelt upon, but never hoped to realize. As it is, sir, having in my present condition no chance of procuring better weapons than my fists, allow me to suggest that they are, none the less, entirely at your service. Do me the infinite kindness to stand up. Sir, I answered, cutting a slice from the loaf, you are the third person within the last forty-eight hours who has mistaken me for another. It really gets quite wearisome. Mistaken you, he broke in, and his smile grew suddenly bitter. Do you think it possible that I could ever mistake you? I am sure of it, said I. Furthermore, pray do not disparage your fists, sir. A bout at fisticuffs never did a man any harm that I ever heard. A man's fists are good, honest weapons, supplied by a beneficent providence. Far better than your unnatural swords and murderous hair triggers, at least so I think, being, I trust, something of a philosopher. Still, in this instance, never having seen your face or heard your voice until yesterday, I shall continue to sit here and eat my bread and cheese, and if you are wise, you will hasten to follow my so excellent example while there is any left, for, I warn you, I am mightily sharp-set. "'Come, come,' said he, advancing upon me threateningly, "'enough of this foolery!' "'By all means,' said I, "'sit down, like a sensible fellow, and tell me for whom you mistake me.' "'Sir, with all the pleasure in life,' said he, clenching his fists, and I saw his nostrils dilate suddenly. I take you for the greatest rogue, the most gentlemanly rascal but one, in all England. Yes, said I, and my name? Sir Maurice Vibbert. Sir Maurice Vibbert? I sprang to my feet, staring at him in amazement. Sir Maurice Vibbert is my cousin, said I and so we stood for a long minute, immobile and silent, eyeing each other above the bread and cheese. Book One, Chapter Fourteen, Further Concerning the Gentleman in the Battered Hat Sir, said my companion at last, lifting the battered hat, I tender you my apology, and I shall be delighted to eat with you in the ditch, if you are in the same mind about it. Then you believe me? Indubitably, sir he answered with a faint smile, had you indeed been Sir Maurice, either he or I, and most probably I, would be lying flat in the road by this. So without more ado, we sat down in the ditch together, side by side, and began to eat. And now I noticed that when he thought my eye was upon him, my companion ate with a due deliberation and nicety, and when he thought it was off, with a veracity that was painful to witness. And after we had eaten a while in silence, he turned to me with a sigh. Oh, this is very excellent cheese, said he. The man from whom I bought it, said I, called it a noble cheese, I remember. I never tasted one of a finer flavor, said my companion. Hunger is a fine sauce, said I, and you are probably hungry. Hungry? he repeated, bolting a mouthful, and knocking his hat over his eyes with a slap on its dusty crown. "'Egad, Mr. Vibbert, so would you be, so would any man be who has lived on anything he could beg, borrow, or steal, with an occasional meal of turnips, in the digging of which I am become astonishingly expert, and unripe blackberries, which latter I have proved to be a very trying diet in many ways.' hungry oh damn and after a while when there nothing remained of loaf or cheese save a few scattered crumbs my companion leaned back and gave another sigh sir said he with an airy wave of the hand in me you behold a highly promising young gentleman ruined by a most 
implacable enemy. Himself, sir. In the first place you must know my name is Beverly. Beverly? I repeated. Beverly, he nodded. Peregrine Beverly, very much at your service. Late of Beverly Place, Surrey, now of nowhere in particular. Beverly, said I again, I have heard that name before. It is highly probable, Mr. Vibbert, a fool of that name, fortunate or unfortunate as you choose to classify him, lost houses, land, and money in a single night's play. I am that fool, sir, though you have doubtless heard particulars ere now. Not a word, said I. Mr. Beverley glanced at me with a faint mingling of pity and surprise. My life, I explained, has been altogether a studious one, with the not altogether unnatural result that I also am bound for nowhere in particular, with just eight shillings and sixpence in my pocket. And mine, as I tell you, said he, has been an altogether riotous one. Thus each of us, though by widely separate roads, you by the narrow and difficult path of virtue, and I by the broad and easy road of folly, have managed to find our way into this howling destitution, which we call nowhere in particular. Then how does your path of virtue better my road of evil? The point to be considered, said I, is not so much what we are now, but rather what we have done, and may ultimately be and do. Well, said he, turning to look at me, for my own achievements hitherto, I continued, I have won the high jump and throwing the hammer, also translated the works of Quintilian, with the satirican of Petronius Arbiter, and the life, lives, and memoirs of the Seigneur de Branton, which last, as you are probably aware, has never before been done into English. Ha! exclaimed Mr. Beverley, sitting up suddenly with his ill-used hat very much over one eye. There we have it! Who ever heard of old Quinn what's-his-name, or cared, except perhaps a few bald-headed bookworms and withered literatures? While you were dreaming of life, and reading the lives of other fellows, I was living it. In my career, episodically brief though it was, I have met and talked with all the wits and celebrated men, have drunk good wine, and worshipped beautiful women, Mr. Vibbert. And what has it all taught you? said I. That there are an infernal number of rogues and rascals in the world, for one thing, and that is worth knowing. Yes, said I. That, though money can buy anything, from the love of a woman to the death of an enemy, it can only be spent once, and that is worth knowing also. Yes, said I, and that I am a most preposterous ass, and that last, look you, is more valuable than all the others. Solomon, I think, says something about a wise man being truly wise who knoweth himself a fool, doesn't he? Something of the sort. Then, said he, flinging his hat down upon the grass beside him, what argument can you advance in favour of your narrow and thorny? The sum of eight shillings and sixpence, a loaf of bread, and a slice of noble cheese, now no more, said I. Egad, said he, looking at me from the corners of his blue eyes, the argument is unanswerable, more especially the cheese part against which I'd say nothing, even if I could. Having remarked which, he lay flat on his back again, staring up at the leaves and the calm serenity of the sky beyond, while I filled my negro head pipe from my paper of tobacco, and forthwith began to smoke. And presently, as I sat alternately watching the blue wreaths of my pipe, and the bedraggled figure extended beside me, he suddenly rolled over on his arm, and so lay watching me. "'On my soul!' he exclaimed at length. "'It is positively marvellous. What is, I inquired, the resemblance between you and your famous cousin? It would appear so, said I, shrugging my shoulders, though personally I was unaware of this fact up till now. Do I understand that you have never seen Sir Maurice Vibbert? Never seen Buck Vibbert? Never, said I. Too much occupied in keeping to the narrow and thorny, I suppose. 
"'Your cousin's is the broad and flowery with a vengeance.' "'So I understand,' said I. "'Nevertheless, the resemblance between you, both in face and figure, is positively astounding, with the sole exception that he wears hair upon his face and is of a ruddy complexion, while you are pale and smooth-cheeked as... as a boy.' "'Or yourself,' said I. <laughs> "'Ah, exactly.' he answered, and passed his fingers across his chin tentatively, and fell again to staring lazily up into the sky. "'Do you happen to know anything about that most remarkable species of the genus Homo, calling themselves Bucks or Corinthians?' he inquired after a while. "'Very little,' said I, and that only by hearsay. "'Well, up to six months ago I was one of them, Mr. Vibbert, until fortune—' and I think now, wisely, decreed it otherwise. And herewith, lying upon his back, looking up through the quivering green of leaves, he told mad tales of a reckless prince, of the placid Brummel, of the dashing Vibbert, the brilliant Sheridan, of Fox and Graton, and many others, whose names are now a byword one way or the other. He recounted a story of wild prodigality, of drunken midnight orgies, of days and nights, and very reverently, he spoke of a woman, of her love, and faith, and deathless trust. Of course, he ended, I might have starved very comfortably, and much quicker in London, but when my time comes, I prefer to do my dying beneath some green hedge, or in the shelter of some friendly rick with the cool, clean wind upon my face. Besides, she loved the country. Then there are some women who can't be bought, said I, looking at his glistening eyes. Mr. Vibbert, said he, so far as I know, there are two. The Lady Helen Dunstan and the glorious Sefton. The Lady Sophia Sefton of Camburn, said I. "'And the Lady Helen Dunstan,' he repeated. "'Do you know the Lady Sophia Sefton?' "'I have had the honour of dancing with her frequently,' he answered. "'And is she so beautiful as they say?' "'She is the handsomest woman in London, one of your black-browed, deep-eyed goddesses, tall and gracious, and most nobly shaped. Though, sir, for my own part, I prefer less fire and ice.' a more gentle beauty. As, for instance, the Lady Helen Dunstan, said I. <laughs> exactly, nodded Mr. Beverley. Referring to the Lady Sophia Sefton, I pursued, she is a reigning toast, I believe? Gad, yes, her worshippers are legion, and chief among them his royal highness, and your cousin, Sir Maurice, who has actually had the temerity to enter the field as the prince's avowed rival. No one but Buck Vibbert could be so madly rash. A most fortunate lady, said I. Mr. Vibbert, exclaimed my companion, cocking his battered hat, and regarding me with a smouldering eye. Mr. Vibbert, I object to your tone. The noble Sefton's virtue is proud and high, and above even the breath of suspicion. And yet my cousin would seem to be no laggard in love, and— as to the prince, his glance is contamination to a woman. Sir, returned Mr. Beverley very earnestly, disabuse your mind of all unworthy suspicions, I beg. Your cousin she laughs to scorn, and his royal highness she had rebuffed as few women have, hitherto dared to. It would almost seem, said I, after a pause, that, uh, from what I have inadvertently learned, my cousin has some dirty work afoot, though exactly what I cannot imagine. My dear Mr. Vibbert, your excellent cousin is for ever up to something or other, and has escaped the well-merited consequences, more than once, owing to his friendship with, and the favour of his friend. George, said I, exactly, said my companion, raising himself on his elbow and nodding. George. "'Have you ever heard mention of Tom Cragg the pugilist?' I inquired, blowing a cloud of smoke into the warm air. "'I won ten thousand guineas when he knocked out Ted Jarraway of Swansea,' yawned my companion. "'A good fighter, but a rogue, like all the rest of them, 
and a creature of your excellent cousins. I guessed as much. I nodded, and forthwith plunged into an account of my meeting with the craggy one, the which seemed to amuse Mr. Beverley mightily, more especially when I related Cragg's mysterious disappearance. Oh, God! cried Beverley, wiping his eyes on the tattered lapel of his coat. The resemblance served you luckily there. Your cousin gave him the thrashing of his life, and poor Tom evidently thought he was in for another. That was the last you saw of him, I'll be bound? No. I met him afterwards beneath the gibbet on River Hill, where, among other incomprehensible things, he gave me to understand that he recognized me despite my disguise, assumed, as he supposed, on account of his having kidnapped some one or other, and laid out a certain Sir Jasper Trent in Wick Street according to my orders, or, rather it would seem, my cousin's orders, the author of which outrage Sir Jasper had evidently found out. The devil! exclaimed Mr. Beverley, and sat up with a jerk. And furthermore, I went on, he informed me that the prince himself had given him the word to leave London until the affair had blown over. Now, while I spoke, Mr. Beverley had been regarding me with a very strange expression. His cheeks had gone even paler than before, his eyes seemed to stare through and beyond me, and his hands were tight-clenched at his sides. "'Mr. Beverley,' said I, "'what ails you?' For a moment he did not speak, then answered with the same strange look. "'Sir Jasper Trent is my cousin, sir.' My negro-head pipe slipped suddenly and fell into the grass, happily without injury. "'Indeed,' said I. "'Can you not see what this means, sir?' he went on hurriedly. "'Jasper will fight.' "'Indeed,' said I again, "'I fear so. Jasper was always a bit of a fish, and with no particular affection for his graceless kinsman, but I am his only relative, and, and he hardly knows one end of a pistol from the other, while your cousin is a dead shot.' "'My cousin!' I exclaimed. Then it was he. To be sure, I saw only his back. Sir Jasper is unmarried, has no relations but myself, my companion repeated with the same fixed intentness of look. Can you appreciate, I wonder, what this would mean to me? Rank and fortune and London, said I. No, no! He sprang to his feet and threw wide his ragged arms with a swift, passionate gesture. It means life and Helen. Oh, my God! he went on, speaking almost in a whisper. I, I never knew how much I wanted her, how much I had willfully tossed aside. Till now, I never realized the full misery of it all. Till now, I could have starved very well in time, and managed it as quietly as most other ruined fools. But now— to see the chance of beginning again, of coming back to self-respect, and— Oh, Helen, my God! And of a sudden he cast himself upon his face, and so lay tearing up the grass by handfuls. Then almost as suddenly he was upon his feet again, and had caught up his hat. Sir, said he somewhat shamefully, smoothing its ruffled nap with fingers that still quavered, pray forgive that little ebullition of feeling. It is over, quite over, but your tidings affected me, and I am not quite myself at times. As I have already said, turnips and unripe blackberries are not altogether desirable as a diet. Indeed, said I, you seem strangely perturbed. Mr. Vibbert, said he, staring very hard at the battered hat and turning it round and round. Mr. Vibbert, the devil is surprisingly strong in some of us. True, said I. My cousin, Sir Jasper, is a bookish fellow, and, as I have said, a fool where anything else is in question. If this meeting is allowed to take place, I feel that he will most certainly be killed, and his death would mean a, a new life, more than life to me. Yes, said I. And, for a moment, Mr. Vibbert, I was tempted to sit down in the ditch again and let things take their course. The devil, I repeat, is remarkably strong in some of us. Then what is your present intention? I am going to London to find Sir Maurice Vibbert to stop this duel. Impossible, said I. 
but you see sir it so happens that i am possessed of certain intelligence which might make sir maurice's existence in england positively untenable nevertheless said i it is impossible that remains to be seen mr vibbert said he and speaking turned upon his heel one moment said i was not your cousin sir jasper of the middle height slim built and fair haired with a habit of plucking at his lips when at all nervous or excited exactly you know him sir no i answered but i have seen him very lately and i say again to stop this duel is an impossibility do you mean he began and paused now as his eyes met mine the battered hat escaped his fingers and lay all unheeded do you mean he began again and again stopped yes said i i mean that you are too late sir jasper was killed at a place called deep dean wood no longer since than to-day at half-past seven in the morning it was raining at the time i remember but the day grew glorious later for a long moment mr beverley stood silent with bent head then apparently becoming aware of the hat at his feet he sent it flying with a sudden kick and watched it describe a wide parabola ere it disappeared into the ditch some yards away which done he walked after it and returned brushing it very carefully with his ragged cuff and are you sure quite sure mr vibbert he inquired smoothing the broken brim with the greatest solicitude i stood behind a hedge and watched it done said i then oh my god i am sir peregrine beverley i am sir peregrine beverley of burnham hall very much at your service jasper dead a knight banneret of kent and justice of the peace how utterly preposterous it all sounds but to-day i begin life anew ah yes a new life a new life to-day all things are possible again the fool has learned wisdom and i hope become a man but come said he in a more natural tone let us get back to our ditch and while you tell me the particulars if you don't object i should much like to try a whiff at that pipe of yours so while i recounted the affair as briefly as i might he sat puffing at my pipe and stirring away into the distance but gradually his head sank lower and lower until his face was quite hidden from me and for a long moment after i had ended my narration there was silence poor jasper said he at last without raising his head poor old jasper i congratulate you sir peregrine said i and i used to pummel him so when we were boys together at eton oh, poor old jasper and presently he handed me my pipe and rose mr vibbert said he it would seem that by no effort or virtue of my own i am to win free of this howling desolation of nowhere in particular after all believe me i would gladly take you with me had i not met with you it is rather more than probable that i should never have seen another dawn so if if ever i can be of use to you pray honour me so far you can always hear of me at burnham hall pembry good-bye mr vibbert i am going to her in all my rags for i am a man again so i bade him good-bye and sitting in the ditch watched him stride away to his new life presently reaching the brow of the hill <laughs> there are hills everywhere in the south country i saw him turn to flourish the battered hat ere he disappeared from my sight book one chapter fifteen in which i meet with a peddler by the name of gabbing dick you won't be ever wantin a broom now i sat up sleepily and rubbed my eyes the sun was gone and the blue sky had changed to a deep purple set here and there with a quivering star yet the light was still strong enough to enable me to distinguish the speaker a short thick-set man 
Upon his shoulder he carried a bundle of brooms, a pack was slung to his back, while around his neck there dangled a heterogeneous collection of articles, ribbons, laces, tawdry neck-chains, and the like. Indeed, so smothered was he in his wares that, as he stood there, he had more the aspect of some disordered fancy than of a human being. "'You won't be wantin' ever a broom now,' he repeated in a somewhat melancholy tone. "'No,' said I. "'Nor yet a mop?' "'Nor that either,' said I. "'A belt, now?' he suggested mournfully. "'A fine leather belt, with a steel buckle made at Brummingham, as ever was, and all for a shillin'. What do you say to a fine belt?' "'That I have no need of one, thank you.' "'Ah, oh, well,' said the man, spitting dejectedly at a patch of shadow, "'I thought as much. You ain't got the look of a buyer.' "'Then why ask me?' "'Hinstinct,' said he. "'It's just hinstinct. "'It comes as natural to me "'as eatin' or walkin' these ere roads. "'Have you come far to-day?' "'Twenty mile, maybe,' he answered, "'setting down his bundle of brooms. "'Are you tired?' "'Course I'm tired.' "'Then why not sit down and rest?' "'Because I'd have to get up again, wouldn't I?' "'Are you hungry?' Hungry aren't the word for it. And how is trade? Couldn't be worse. I perceive you are a pessimist, said I. No, said he, I'm a peddler. Baptismal name Richard, commonly known as Gavin Dick. At least yours is a fine healthy trade, said I. How so? A life of constant exercise and fresh air. Today, for instance. Ought is a hoven, said he. "'Yet there was a good cool wind,' said I. "'Ah, and with dust enough to choke a man. "'And then there's the loneliness of these ere roads.' "'Loneliness?' said I. "'That's the word. "'Sometimes it'll get so bad as I'm minded to do away with myself.' "'Strange,' I began. Oh, "'Not a bit,' said he. "'When you've been a-walkin' in a-walkin' all day, past edge and edge, and a tree and tree, it's bad enough. But it's worse when the sun's gone out, and you follow the glimmer of the road on and on. Past edges is ain't edges, and trees is ain't trees. But things as touch you as you pass, and reach out after you, in the dark behind. There's one of them, back there on the Cranbrook Road. Looks like an oak tree in the daytime. <laughs> oh, and a big un. It's nearly had me three times already. Once by the leg, once by the arm, and once by the neck. I don't pass it after dark no more, but it'll have me yet, mark my words. It'll have me one of these fine nights, and they'll find me a-dangling in the grey of the dawn. Do you mean that you are afraid? I inquired. No, not a fear, exactly. It, it's just the loneliness the lonely quietness why lord you aren't got no notion of the tricks the trees and edges gets up to at nights nobody as but as tramps the roads bill nye knowed same as i know but bill nye's dead cut his throat he did with one of his own razors under a edge and what for i inquired as the peddler paused to spit lugubriously into the road again "'Nobody knowed but me. "'William Nye, he were a tinker, "'and a rare marion he were, "'a little man, always up to his jinkin' "'and jokin' and laughin'. "'Dick,' he used to say, uh, "'but Richard I were baptized, "'though they calls me Dick for short. "'Dick,' he used to say, "'do you know that there big oak tree? "'The big oller oak is stands "'at the crossroads a mile and a half "'out of Cranbrook?' A man might do for hisself very nice and quiet, tucked away inside of it. Dick, says he, it's such a nice, quiet place, so snug and dark, I wonder as nobody does. I never pass by, says he, but I takes a peep inside, just to make sure as there aren't no legs a-danglin', nor nobody hunched up dead in the dark. It's such a nice, quiet place, he used to say, shaking his head and smiling sad-like. I wonder as nobody's never thought of it afore. Well, one day, sure enough, poor Bill Nye disappeared. Nobody knowed where. 
Bill, as I say, was a merry sort, always ready with a joke, and that's apt to get a man friends, and they searched for him high and low. But neither I nor e'er a poor Bill did they find. At last, one evening I happened to pass the big oak, the oller oak, and, mind in Bill's words, thinks I, ears to see if tis empty as Bill said. Going up to it, I got down on my hands and knees, and striking a light looked inside. And there, sure enough, was poor Bill Nye hunched up inside of it with a razor in his hand, and his head nigh cut off. And what with one thing and another, a very unpleasant sight he were. And why, why did he do it? I asked. Because he had to, of course. It's just the loneliness. They'll find me some day dangling. I never could abide blood myself. Dangling to the thing as looks like a oak tree in the daytime. What do you mean? said I. The peddler sighed, shook his head, and shouldered his brooms. <sighs> "'It's just the loneliness,' said he, and, spitting over his shoulder, trudged upon his way. End of Section 6 Section 7 of The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader Book One, Chapter Sixteen, How I Heard the Steps of One Who Dogged Me in the Shadows. And in a little while I rose, and buckled on my knapsack. The shadows were creeping on apace, but the sky was wonderfully clear, while, low down upon the horizon, I saw the full-orbed moon, very broad and big. It would be a brilliant night later, and this knowledge rejoiced me not a little. Before me stretched a succession of hills, that chain of hills which I believe is called the Weald, and over which the dim road dipped and wound with, on either hand, a rolling country, dark with wood and coppice, full of mystery. The wind had quite fallen, but from the hedges came sudden rustlings and soft, unaccountable noises. Once something small and dark scuttered across the road before me, and once a bird, hidden nearby, set up a loud complaint, while from the deeps of a neighboring wood came the mournful note of a night-jar. And as I walked, I bethought me of poor Bill Nye the tinker. I could picture him tramping upon this very road, his jingling load upon his back, and the loneliness upon and around him. A small man he would be, with a peaked face, little, round, twinkling eyes, grizzled hair, and long blue chin. How I came to know all this I cannot tell, only it seemed he must be so. On he went, his chin first upon one shoulder, and now upon the other, shooting furtive glances at hedges which were not hedges, and trees which were not trees. Somewhere there was a thing that looked like a big oak tree in the daytime, a hollow oak. On he went through the shadows, on and on. Presently he turned out of the road, and there, sure enough, was the oak itself. Kneeling down, he slipped off his burden and pushed it through a jagged hole at the root. Then he glanced around him, a long, stealthy look, down at the earth and up at the sky, and crept into the tree. In the dimness I could see him fumble for the thing he wanted, pause to thumb its edge, and, throwing up his chin, raise his hand. Folly! said I aloud, and stopped suddenly in my stride. The moon's rim was just topping the trees to my left, and its light, feeble though it was as yet, served to show that I had reached a place where four roads met. Now, casting my eyes about me, they were attracted by a great tree that grew near by, a tree of vast girth and bigness. And as I looked, I saw that it was an oak tree, near the root of which there was a jagged black hole. How long I stood staring at this I cannot say, but all at once the leaves of the tree were agitated as by a breath of wind, 
and rustled with a sound indescribably desolate, and from the dark mass rose the long-drawn, mournful cry of some night-bird. Heedless of my direction, I hurried away, yet, even when I had left it far behind, I glanced back more than once ere its towering branches were lost to my view. So I walked on through the shadows, past trees that were not trees, and hedges that were not hedges, but frightful phantoms, rather lifting menacing arms above my head, and reaching after me with clutching fingers. Time and again, ashamed of such weakness, I cursed myself for an imaginative fool, but kept well in the middle of the road, and grasped my staff firmly, notwithstanding. I had gone, perhaps some mile or so in this way, alternately rating and reasoning with myself, when I suddenly fancied I heard a step behind me, and swung round upon my heel with ready stick. But the road stretched away, empty as far as I could see. Having looked about me on all sides, I presently went on again, yet immediately it seemed that the steps began also keeping time with my own, now slow, now fast, now slow again. But whenever I turned, the road behind was apparently as empty and desolate as ever. I can conceive of few things more nerve-wracking than the knowledge that we are being dogged by something which we can only guess at, and that all our actions are watched by eyes which we cannot see. Thus with every step I found the situation grow more intolerable, for though I kept a close watch behind me and upon the black gloom of the hedges, I could see nothing. At length, however, I came upon a gap in the hedge where was a gate, and beyond this, vaguely outlined against a glimmer of sky, I saw a dim figure. Hereupon, running forward, I set my hand upon the gate, and leaping over, found myself face to face with a man who carried a gun across his arm. If I was startled at this sudden encounter, he was no less so, and thus we stood eyeing each other as well as we might in the half-light. "'Well,' I demanded at last, "'what do you mean by following me like this?' "'I ain't followed ye,' retorted the man. "'But I heard your steps behind me. "'Not mine, master. "'I've sat and waited here off an hour or more for a poaching cove. "'But someone was following me. "'Well, it weren't I.' A keeper I be, a lookin' for a poachin' cove just about your size, and it's precious lucky for you as you were a-wearin' that there bell-crowned hat. Why so? Because if you hadn't appeared to be a-wearin' that there bell-crowner, and I hadn't happened to be of a argifyin' and inquirin' turn o' mind, I should have filled you for a buckshot. Oh, said I. Yes, said he, nodding, while I experienced a series of cold chills up my spine. Not a blessed doubt of it. Poachers! he went on, don't wear bell-crowned hats as a rule. I never seed one as did, and so, where I was a-watchin' of you behind this ere edge, I argues the matter in my mind. Robert, I says to myself, Robert, says I, did you ever happen to see a poachin' cove and a bell-crowner afore? No, you never did, says I, but on the other hand, this ere cove is the very spit of the poachin' cove as I'm lookin' for. True, says I to myself, what this here cove is a-wearin' a, a bell-crowner at, but the poachin' cove never wore a bell-crowner, nor never will. Still, I must say I come very near pullin' trigger on ye, just to make sure. So, you see, it were precious lucky for you, as you was a-wearin' o' that there— It certainly was, said I, turning away. That there bell-crowner, and likewise, is I'm a man of a natural gift for argument, and of an acquirin'— "'Without doubt,' said I, vaulting over the gate into the road once more, "'I turn a mind, cause if I hadn't a been— and you adding a war that there bell crowner the consequences are unpleasantly obvious said i over my shoulder as i walked on down the road i should have shot you like a dog he shouted hanging over the gate to do so and when i had gone on some distance i took off that which the man had called a bell crowner and bestowed upon it a touch and looked at it as i had never done before and there was gratitude in look and touch for to-night it had, indeed, stood my friend. Slowly, slowly, the moon, at whose advent the starry host paled their ineffectual fires, mounted into a cloudless heaven, higher and higher, in queenly majesty, until the dark world was filled with her glory, 
and the road before me became transformed into a silver track splashed here and there with the inky shadow of hedge and trees, and leading away into a land of fairy. Indeed, to my mind, there is nothing more delightful than to walk upon a country road, beneath a midsummer moon, when there is no sound to break the stillness, save, perhaps, the murmur of wind in trees, or the throbbing melody of some hidden brook. At such times the world of every day, the world of things material, the hard, hard world of common sense, seems to vanish quite, and we walk within the fair haven of our dreams, where imagination meets and kisses us upon the brow, and at this touch the impossible straightway becomes the possible, the abstract becomes the concrete, our fondest hopes are realized, our most cherished visions take form and stand before us. Surely, at such an hour, the gods come down to walk with us a while. From this ecstasy I was suddenly aroused by hearing once more the sound of a footstep upon the road behind me. So distinct and unmistakable was it that I turned sharp about, and, though the road seemed as deserted as ever, I walked back, looking into every patch of shadow, and even thrust into the denser parts of the hedges with my staff. But still I found no one. And yet I knew that I was being followed persistently, step by step, but by whom and for what reason. A little farther on, upon one side of the way, was a small wood or coppice, and now I made towards this, keeping well in the shadow of the hedge. The trees were somewhat scattered, but the underbrush was very dense, and amongst this I hid myself where I could watch the road, and waited. Minute after minute elapsed, and, losing patience, I was about to give up all hope of thus discovering my unknown pursuer, when a stick snapped sharply nearby, and glancing round I thought I saw a head vanish behind the bole of an adjacent tree. Wherefore I made quickly towards that tree, but, ere I reached it, a man stepped out, a tall, loose-limbed fellow he was, clad in rough clothes, that somehow had about them a vague suggestion of ships and the sea, and with a moth-eaten fur cap crushed down upon his head. His face gleamed pale, and his eyes were deep-sunken and very bright. Also I noticed that one hand was hidden in the pocket of his coat. But most of all, I was struck by the extreme pallor of his face, and the burning brilliancy of his eyes. And with the glance that showed me all this, I recognized the outside passenger. Book One, Chapter Seventeen How I Talked with a Madman in a Wood by Moonlight. Good evening, sir he said in a strange, hurried sort of way. The moon, you will perceive, is very nearly at the full to-night. And his voice immediately struck me as being at odds with his clothes. Why do you stand and peer at me? said I sharply. Peer at you, sir? Yes, from behind the tree yonder. As I spoke, he craned his head towards me, and I saw his pale lips twitch suddenly. And why have you dogged me? Why have you followed me all the way from Tunbridge? Why, sir, surely there is nothing so strange in that. I am a shadow. What do you mean by a shadow? Sir, I am a shadow cast by neither sun, nor moon, nor star, that moves on unceasingly in dark as in light. Sir, it is my fate, in common with my kind, to be ever upon the move, a stranger everywhere without friends or kindred. I have been, during the past year, all over England, east and west and north and south. Within the past week, for instance, I have travelled from London to Epsom, from Epsom to Brighton, from Brighton back again to London, and from London here. And I peer at you, sir, because I wished to make certain what manner of man you were before I spoke, and though the moon is bright, yet your hat-brim left your face in shade. Well, are you satisfied? So much so, sir, so very much so, that I should like to talk with you, to, to ask you a question, he answered, passing his hand, a thin white hand, across his brow, and up over the fur cap that was so out of keeping with the pale face below. 
a question if you will be so obliging as to listen sir let us sit a while for i am very weary and with the words he sank down upon the grass after a momentary hesitation i followed his example for my curiosity was piqued by the fellow's strange manner yet when we were sitting opposite each other i saw that his hand was still hidden in the pocket of his coat perhaps sir said he in his nervous hurried manner perhaps you would be better able to answer my question were i first to tell you a story an ordinary a very commonplace one i fear but with the virtue that it is short and soon told my time is entirely my own said i leaning with my shoulders against the tree behind me proceed with your story first then my name is strickland john strickland here he paused and though his head was bent i saw him watching me beneath his brows well said i i am a supercargo again he paused expectantly but seeing i merely nodded he continued upon one of my voyages our vessel was wrecked and so far as i know all save myself and six others four seamen and two passengers were drowned the passengers i speak of were an old merchant and his daughter a very beautiful girl her name was angela sir once again he paused and again he eyed me narrowly well said i well sir he resumed speaking in a low repressed voice we seven after two miserable days in a drifting boat reached an island where that same night the old merchant died sir the sailors were wild rough men the island was a desolate one from whence there was seemingly no chance of escape it lying out of the usual track of ships and this girl was as i have said very beautiful under such conditions her fate would have been unspeakable degradation and probably death but sir i fought and bled for her not once but many times and eventually i killed one of them with my sheath knife and i remember to this hour how his blood gushed over my hands and arms and sickened me after that they waited hourly to avenge his death and get me out of their way once and for all but i had my long knife and they but such rude weapons as they could devise day after day and night after night i watched for an opportunity to escape with the boat until at last one day while they were all three gone inland not dreaming of any such attempt for the sea was very dangerous and high with the girl's help i managed to launch the boat and so stood out to sea and i remember those sailors came running with great shouts and cries and flung themselves down upon the beach and crawled upon their knees praying to be taken off along with us and begging us not to leave them to perish after three days buffeting at the mercy of the seas we were picked up by a brig bound for portsmouth and six months later were in england sir it is impossible for a man to have lived beside a beautiful woman day by day to have fought for and suffered with her not to love her also thus seeing her friendless and penniless i wooed and won her to wife we came to london and for a year our life was perfect until through stress of circumstances i was forced to take another position aboard ship well sir i bade farewell to my wife and we set sail the voyage which was to have lasted but three months was lengthened out through one misadventure after another so that it was a year before i saw my wife again at first i noticed little difference in her save that she was paler but gradually i came to see that she was unhappy often i have wakened in the night to find her weeping silently oh sir he broke out i do not think there is anything more terrible than to witness in one we love sorrow we are unable to reach here he paused and i saw that the sweat stood out upon his brow and that his hand was tight clenched as he drew it across his temples at last sir he went on speaking once more in a low repressed tone returning home one day i found her gone 
Gone, said I. Gone, sir. And she left no trace? No letter? No, she left no letter, sir, but I did find something, a something that had rolled into a corner of the room. And what was that? This, sir. As he spoke, his burning eyes never leaving mine, he thrust a hand into his bosom. His left hand, for his right, was where it had been all along, hidden in his pocket, and held out to me a gold seal such as gentlemen wear at their fobs. Ah! I exclaimed. Take it, said the man, thrusting it towards me. Look at it. Obediently I took the trinket from him, and, examining it as well as I might, saw that a letter was engraved upon it, one of those ornamental initials surrounded by rococo scrolls and flourishes. "'What letter does it bear?' asked the man in a strangled voice. "'It looks very like the letter Y,' I answered. "'The letter Y!' cried the man, and then, with a gesture sudden and fierce, he snatched the seal from me, and thrusting it back into his bosom, laughed strangely. "'Why do you laugh?' said I. "'To be sure,' said he harshly, "'the light must be better, and yet, well, well, my story is nearly done. I lived on in my lonely house from day to day and month to month, hoping and waiting for her to come back to me. And one day she did come back to me. Just about this hour it was, sir, and on just such another evening. And that same night she died.' "'Good God!' I exclaimed. "'Poor fellow!' And leaning forward I laid my hand upon his knee, but at my touch he drew back so quickly, and with a look so evil, that I was startled. "'Hands off!' said he, and so sat staring at me with his smouldering eyes. "'Are you mad?' said I, and sprang to my feet. "'Not yet!' he answered, and once again he passed his hand up and over his face and brow. "'No!' "'Not yet, sir.' Here he rose and stood facing me, and I noticed that one hand was still hidden in his pocket, and thereafter, while I listened to him, I kept my eyes directed thither. "'That night, before she died, sir,' he continued, "'she told me the name of the man who had destroyed her, and killed my soul. "'And I have been searching for him ever since, east and west, and north, and south. Now, sir, here is my question. If I should ever meet that man face to face, as I now see you, should I not be justified in killing him? For a moment I stood with bent head, yet conscious all the while of the burning eyes that scanned my face, then, yes, said I. The man stood utterly still, his mouth opened as if he would have spoken, but no word came. All at once he turned about, and walked unsteadily five or six paces. Now, as I looked, I saw him suddenly draw his hand from his pocket. Then, as he wheeled, I knew, and hurled myself face downward as the pistol flashed. Madman! I cried, and next moment was on my feet but with a sound that was neither a groan nor a scream, and yet something of both, he leapt into the thickest part of the underbrush, and made off. And standing there, dazed by the suddenness of it all, I heard the snapping of twigs grow fainter and fainter as he crashed through in headlong flight. Book One, Chapter Eighteen The Hedge Tavern Twigs whipped my face, thorns and brambles dragged at my clothes, hidden obstacles lay in wait for my feet, for the wood grew denser as I advanced, but I pushed on, heedless alike of these and of what direction I took. But as luck would have it, I presently blundered upon a path which, in a short time, brought me out very suddenly into what appeared to be a small tavern-yard, for on either hand was a row of tumble-down stables and barns, while before me was a low, rambling structure which I judged was the tavern itself. I was yet standing, looking about me, when a man issued from the stables upon my right, bearing a hammer in one hand, and a lantern in the other. "'Hello!' said he, staring at me. 
"'Hello,' said I, staring at him. "'You don't chance to have a axle-bolt about you, I suppose?' "'No,' said I. "'Humph!' he grunted, and lowering his lantern, began searching among the cobblestones. "'Is this it?' I inquired, picking up a rusty screw-bolt at my feet. "'Ah!' said he, taking it from me with a nod. No I dropped it here some ears. You see, he went on, couldn't get another round here to-night, and that cussed axle's got to be in place to-morrow. Yes, said I. Ah, nodded the man. Chase come in here half an hour ago with two gentlemen and a lady, in the Lord's own hurry, too. Mend this axle, me man, says one on em. A top sawyer be the looks on em. Mend this axle, and quick about it. Can't be done, me lord, says I. Why not? says he, showing his teeth savage-like. Because it can't, says I. Not know how, me lord, says I. Well, after cussing hisself well nigh black in the face, he orders me to have it ready fust thing to-morrow. And if you hadn't found that there bolt for me, it wouldn't have been ready fust thing to-morrow, which would have been mighty bad for me, for this here gentleman's a fire and fury out and outer, and no error. Can I have a bed here, do you think? I inquired. Ah, said he, I think you can. For how much do you suppose? To you, sixpence. Why, that seems reasonable, said I. It are, nodded the man, and a fine feather bed, too. But then, Lord, one good turn deserves another. Meaning? This here bolt. <laughs> are you the landlord, then? I be, and if you feel inclined for a mug of good ale, say the word. <laughs> Most willingly, said I. But what of the axle? Plenty of time for the axle nodded the landlord, and, setting down his hammer upon a bench hard by, he led the way into the tap. The ale was very strong and good. Indeed, this lovely county of Kent is justly famous for such. Finding myself very hungry, the landlord forthwith produced a mighty round of beef, upon which we both fell to, and ate with a will. Which done, I pulled out my negro-head pipe, and the landlord, fetching himself another, we sat a while smoking, and presently, learning I was from London, he began plying me with all manner of questions concerning the great city, of which it seemed he could not hear enough, and I, to describe its wonders as well as I might. At length, bethinking him of his axle, he rose with a sigh. Upon my requesting to be shown my room, he lighted a candle, and led the way up a somewhat rickety stair, along a narrow passage, and, throwing open a door at the end, I found myself in a fair-sized chamber with a decent white bed, which he introduced to my notice by the one word, feathers. Hereupon he pinched off the snuff of the candle with an expression of ponderous thought. "'And so, the Tower of London ain't a tower?' he inquired at last. No, I answered. It is composed of several towers, surrounded by very strong, battlemented walls. Ah, to be sure, said he. Ah, to, to be sure. And me have always thought on it like it was a great big tower standing in the midst of the city, and I is a mountain. Humph! Not a tower. Ah, disappointed I be. Humph! "'Good night, master. Disappointed I be, yes.' And having nodded his head ponderously several times, he turned and went ponderously along the passage and down the stair. At the end of my chamber was a long low casement, and, drawn thither by the beauty of the night, I flung open the lattice and leaned out. I looked down upon a narrow, deeply rutted lane, one of those winding, inconsequent byways which it seems out of all possibility can ever lead the traveller anywhere, and I was idly wondering what fool had troubled to build a tavern in such a remote, out-of-the-way spot, when my ears were saluted by the sound of voices. Now immediately beneath my window there was a heavy porch, low and squat, from which jutted a beam with a broken signboard and it was from beneath this porch that the voices proceeded, the one loud and hectoring, the other gruff and sullen. I was about to turn away when a man stepped out into the moonlight. His face was hidden in the shadow of his hat-brim, but from his general air and appearance I judged him to be one of the gentlemen whose chase had broken down. As I watched him he walked slowly round the angle of the house and disappeared. In a little while I drew in my head from the casement, and, having removed my dusty boots, 
together with my knapsack and coat, blew out the candle, and composed myself to sleep. Now it seemed to me that I was back upon the road, standing once more beside the great oak tree, and as I watched, a small hunched figure crept from the jagged opening in the trunk, a figure with a jingling pack upon its back, at sight of which I turned and ran, filled with an indescribable terror. But as I went, the tinker's pack jingled loud behind me, and when I glanced back I saw that he ran with head dangling in most hideous fashion, and that his right hand grasped a razor. On I sped, faster and faster, but with the tinker ever at my heels, until I had reached this tavern. The door crashed too behind me, only just in time, and I knew as I lay there that he was standing outside in the moonlight, staring up at my casement with his horrible, dead face. Here I very mercifully awoke, and lay for a while, blinking in the ghostly radiance of the moon, which was flooding in at the window directly upon me. Now whether it was owing to the vividness of my dream I know not, but as I lay there leapt up within me a sudden conviction that somebody was indeed standing outside in the lane, staring up at my window. So firmly was I convinced of this that, moved by a sudden impulse, I rose and, cautiously approaching the window, peered out. And there, sure enough, his feet planted wide apart, his hands behind his back, stood a man staring at my window. His head was thrown back so that I could see his face distinctly, a fleshy face with small, close-set eyes and thick lips, behind which I caught the gleam of big, white teeth. This was no tinker, but as I looked, I recognized him as the slenderer of the two Corinthians with whom I had fallen out at the checkers. Hereupon I got me back to bed, drowsily wondering what should bring the fellow hanging about a dilapidated hedge tavern at such an hour. But gradually my thoughts grew less coherent, my eyes closed, and in another moment I should have been asleep, when I suddenly came to my elbow, broad awake and listening, for I had heard two sounds, the soft creak of a window opened cautiously nearby, and a stealthy footstep outside my door. End of section 7section 8 of the broad highway by geoffrey farnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john leader book 1 chapter 19 in which i become a squire of dames who does not recognize the solemn majesty of night that season of awesome stillness when tired mankind lies supine in that strange inertia so like death when the soul quitting the wearied body for a space, flies hence, but whither? What wonder is it if, at such an hour as this, we are prone to magnify trifles, or that the most insignificant thing becomes an omen full of ghastly meaning and possibilities? The creak of a door in the silence, a rustle in the dark, become to us of infinitely greater moment than the crash of falling empires. Thus, for a space I lay, with ears on the stretch, and every nerve tingling, waiting for, I knew not what. In a little I became conscious of yet another sound, indescribably desolate, the low, repressed sound of a woman's sobbing. Once more I rose, and, looking down into the lane, found it deserted. The watcher had vanished. I also noticed that the casement next to mine had been opened wide, and it was from here, as it seemed, that the weeping proceeded. After some little hesitation I knocked softly upon the wall, at which the weeping was checked abruptly, save for an occasional sob, whereupon I presently rapped again. At this, after a moment or so, I saw a very small white hand appear at the neighboring window, and next moment was looking into a lovely flushed face framed in bright hair, with eyes woefully swelled by tears. But a glance showed me that she was young, and of a rare and gentle beauty. Before I could speak, she laid her finger upon her lip with a warning gesture. "'Help me! Oh, help me!' she whispered hurriedly. 
they have locked me in here and i dare not go to bed and and oh what shall i do locked you in i exclaimed oh what shall i do she sobbed i tell you i am afraid of him his hateful wicked eyes here a tremor seemed to shake her and she covered her face with her hands to-night when i found the key gone from the door and remembered his look as he bade me good-night i thought i should have died i waited here close beside the window listening listening once i thought i heard a step outside my door and opened the casement to throw myself out he shall not find me here when he comes no said i he shall not find you here when he comes all this she had imparted to me in broken whispers and with her face still hidden but at my words she peeped at me through her fingers you mean you must run away but the door is locked there remains the window the window she repeated trembling you would find it easy enough with my help quick then she exclaimed and held out her hand wait said i and turned back into my room hereupon having locked the door i got into my boots slipped on my coat and knapsack and last of all threw my blackthorn staff out of the window where i was sure of finding it and climbed out after it the porch i have mentioned upon which i now stood sloped steeply down upon two sides so that i had no little difficulty in maintaining my foothold on the other hand it was no great distance from the ground and i thought that it would be easy enough of descent at this moment the lady reappeared at the lattice what is it i whispered struck by the terror in her face quick she cried forgetting all prudence in her fear quick they are coming i hear someone upon the stair oh you are too late and sinking upon her knees she covered her face with her hands without more ado i swung myself up and clambered over the sill into the room beside her i was looking round for something that might serve me for a weapon when my eye encountered a tall oak press a heavy cumbersome affair but save the bed the only furniture the room possessed setting my shoulder to it therefore i began to urge it towards the door but it was soon apparent that i could not get it there in time for the creeping footstep was already close outside and next moment a key was softly inserted in the lock quick hide yourself i whispered over my shoulder and stepping back from the door to give myself room i clenched my fists there was a faint creak as the key turned the door was opened cautiously and a man's dim figure loomed upon the threshold he had advanced two or three paces on tiptoe before he discovered my presence for the room was in shadow and i heard his breath catch suddenly and hiss between his teeth then without a word he sprang at me but as he came i leapt aside and my fist took him full and squarely beneath the ear he pitched sideways and falling heavily rolled over upon his back and lay still as i leaned over him however for the blow had been a heavy one he uttered a groaning oath whereupon pinning him forthwith by the collar i dragged him out into the passage and whipping the key from the lock transferred it to the inside and locked the door waiting for no more i scrambled back through the casement and reached my hand to the lady come said i and almost as quickly as it takes to set it down here she was beside me upon the roof of the porch clinging to my arm exactly how it was managed i am unable to say all that i remember being the vision of a slender foot and ankle and excellently shaped leg our farther descent to the ground proved much more difficult than i had supposed but though i could feel her trembling my companion obeyed my whispered instructions and yielded herself implicitly to my guidance so that we were soon standing in the lane before the house safe and sound except for a few rents to our garments what is it she whispered seeing me searching about in the grass my staff said i a faithful friend i would not lose it but they will be here in a minute we shall be seen i cannot lose my staff said i oh hurry hurry she cried wringing her hands and in a little while having found my staff we turned our backs upon the tavern and began to run up the lane side by side as we went 
came the slam of a door behind us, a sudden clamor of voices, followed a moment later by the sharp report of a pistol, and in that same fraction of time I stumbled over some unseen obstacle, and my hat was whisked from my head. "'Are you hurt?' panted my companion. "'No,' said I, "'but it was a very excellent shot, nevertheless. For as I picked up my hat, I saw a small round hole that pierced it through and through, midway between crown and brim. The lane wound away between high hedges, which rendered our going very dark, for the moon was getting low and difficult by reason of the deep wheel-ruts. But we hurried forward notwithstanding, urged on by the noise of the chase. We had traversed some half-mile thus, when my ears warned me that our pursuers were gaining upon us, and I was inwardly congratulating myself that I had stopped to find my staff, and wondering how much execution such a weapon might reasonably be capable of, when I found that my companion was no longer at my side. As I paused, irresolute, her voice reached me from the shadow of the hedge. "'This way,' she panted. "'Where?' said I. "'Here.' And as she spoke, her hand slipped into mine, and so she led me through a small gate into a broad, open meadow beyond. But to attempt crossing this would be little short of madness, for, as I pointed out, we could not go a yard without being seen. "'No, no,' she returned, her breath still laboring. "'Wait, wait till they are past.' And so, hand in hand, we stood there in the shadow, screened very effectively from the lane by the thick hedge, while the rush of our pursuer's feet drew nearer and nearer until we could hear a voice that panted out curses upon the dark lane, ourselves, and everything concerned. At sound of which my companion seemed to fall into a shivering fit, her clasp tightened upon my hand, and she drew closer to me. Thus we remained, until voices and footsteps had grown faint with distance, but even then I could feel that she was trembling still. Suddenly she drew her fingers from mine and covered her face with her hands. "'Oh, that man!' she exclaimed in a whisper. "'I didn't quite realize till now what I have escaped. Oh, that beast!' "'Sir Harry Mortimer?' said I. "'You know him?' she cried. Oh, "'Heaven forbid!' I answered. "'But I have seen him once before at the Checkers Inn at Tunbridge, and I never forget names or faces, especially such as his.' Oh, "'How I hate him!' she whispered. "'An unpleasant animal, to be sure,' said I. "'But, come, it were wiser to get as far from here as possible. "'They will doubtless be returning soon.' "'So we started off again, running in the shadow of the hedge. "'We had thus doubled back upon our pursuers, "'and, leaving the tavern upon our left, "'soon gained the kindly shadow of those woods "'through which I had passed in the early evening. "'Borne to us upon the gentle wind "'was the haunting perfume of hidden flowers, and the sinking moon sent long shafts of silvery light to pierce the leafy gloom, and make the shadows more mysterious. The path we followed was very narrow, so that sometimes my companion's knee touched mine, or her long silken hair brushed my brow or cheek, as I stooped to lift some trailing branch that barred her way, or open a path for her through the leaves. So we journeyed on through the mysteries of the woods together. Book One, Chapter Twenty, Concerning Demons in General, and One in Particular. In certain old books you shall find strange mention of witches, warlocks, succubi, spirits, demons, and a thousand other powers of darkness, whose pronounced vocation was the plague of poor humanity. Within these books you may read, if you will, divers wondrous accounts, together with many learned disquisitions upon the same, and most minute and particular descriptions of witch-marks and the like. Aforetime, when a man committed some great offence against laws human or divine, he was said to be possessed of a demon, that is to say, he became the medium and instrument through, and by which, the evil was wrought. Thus, when in due season he came to be hanged, tortured, or burned, it was inflicted not so much as a punishment upon him the man, as to exorcise, once and for all, the devil which possessed him. In these material common-sense days we are wont to smile the superior smile at the dark superstitions and deplorable ignorance of our forefathers. 
yet life is much the same now as then the devil goeth up and down in the world spirits demons and the thousand powers of darkness abide with us still though to-day they go by different names for there is no man in this smug complacent age of ours but carries within him a power of evil greater or less according to his intellect scratch off the social veneer lift but a corner of the very decent cloak of our civilization and behold there stands the primal man in all his old wild savagery and with the devil leering upon his shoulder indeed to-day as surely as in the dim past we are all possessed of a devil great or small weaker or stronger as the case may be a demon which though he sometimes seems to slumber is yet watchful and ever ready to spring up and possess us to the undoing of ourselves and others thus as i followed my companion through the wood i was conscious of a demon that ran beside me leaping and gambling at my elbow though i kept my eyes straight before me anon his clutching fingers were upon my arm and fain i would have shaken him off but could not while as i watched the swing and grace of the lithe feminine body before me from the little foot to the crowning glory of her hair she seemed a thousand times more beautiful than i had supposed and i had saved her to-night from what there had been the fear of worse than death in her eyes when that step had sounded outside her chamber door hereupon as i walked i began to recall much that i had read in the old romances of the gratitude of rescued ladies truly said i to myself in olden days a lady well knew how to reward her rescuer ha <laughs> woman is woman the same to-day as then try her try her chuckled the demon and now as i looked more fully at this demon he seemed no demon at all but rather a jovial companion who nodded and winked and nudged me slyly with his elbow what are pretty faces for but to be admired said he in my ear what are slender waists for but to be pressed and as for a kiss or two in a dark wood with no one to spy they like it you dog they like it so we traversed the alleys of the wood now in shadow now in moonlight the lady the demon and i and always the perfume of hidden flowers seemed sweeter and stronger the gleam of her hair and the sway of her body the more alluring and always the voice at my ear whispered try her you dog try her at last being come to a broad grassy glade the lady paused and standing in the full radiance of the dying moon looked up at me with a smile on her red lips they can never find us now she said no they can never find us now i repeated while the demon at my elbow chuckled again and oh sir i can never never thank you she began don't said i not looking at her don't thank me till we are out of the wood i think she went on slowly that you can guess from from what you saved me and can understand something of my gratitude for i never can express it all indeed said i indeed you overestimate my service you risk your life for me sir said she her eyes glistening surely my thanks are due to you for that and i do thank you from my heart and with a swift impulsive gesture she stretched out her hands to me for a brief moment i hesitated then seized them and drew her close but even as i stooped above her she repulsed me desperately her loosened hair brushed my eyes and lips blinded maddened me my hat fell off and all at once her struggles ceased <gasps> sir maurice vibbert she panted and i saw a hopeless terror in her face but the demon's jovial voice chuckled in my ear oh peter vibbert act up to your cousin's reputation who's to know the difference my arms tightened about her then i loosed her suddenly and turning smote my clenched fist against a tree which done i stooped and picked up my hat and blackthorn staff madam said i looking down upon my bleeding knuckles i am not sir maurice vibbert it seems my fate is to be mistaken for him wherever i go 
my name is peter plain and unvarnished and i am very humbly your servant now as i spoke it seemed that the demon no longer the jovial companion was himself again horns hoof and tail nay indeed he seemed a thousand times more foul and hideous than before, as he mouthed and jibed at me in baffled fury. Wherefore I smiled, and turned my back upon him. "'Come,' said I, extending my hand to the trembling girl, "'let us get out of these dismal woods.' For a space she hesitated, looking up at me beneath her lashes, then reached out and laid her fingers in mine, and as we turned away— I knew that the demon had cast himself upon the ground, and was tearing at the grass in a paroxysm of rage and bafflement. "'It is strange,' said I, after we had gone some little distance, "'very strange that you should only have discovered this resemblance here and now, for surely you saw my face plainly enough at the inn.' "'No. You see, I hardly looked at you. And now that you do look at me, am i so very much like sir maurice not now she answered shaking her head for though you are of his height and though your features are much the same as his your expression is different but a moment ago when your hat fell off yes said i your expression your your face looked demoniac i suggested yes she answered yes said i so we went upon our way nor paused until we had left the demon and the dark woods behind us then i looked from the beauty of the sweet pure earth to the beauty of her who stood beside me and i saw that her glance rested upon the broken knuckles of my right hand meeting my eyes her own drooped and a flush crept into her cheeks and though of course she could not have seen the demon yet i think that she understood. Book One, Chapter Twenty One Journey's End in Lovers' Meetings. The moon was fast sinking below the tree tops to our left, what time we reached a road, or rather, cart track that wound away up a hill. Faint and far, a church clock slowly chimed the hour of three, the solemn notes coming sweet and silvery with distance. "'What chimes are those?' I inquired. "'Cranbrook Church. Is it far to Cranbrook? One mile this way, but two by the road yonder.' "'You seem very well acquainted with these parts,' said I. "'I have lived here all my life. Those are the Camburn Woods over there.' "'Camburn Woods?' said I. "'Part of the Sefton Estates,' she continued. "'Camburn Village lies to the right, beyond.' "'The Lady Sophia Sefton of Camburn?' said I thoughtfully. "'My dearest friend,' nodded my companion. "'They say she is very handsome,' said I. "'They speak truth, sir.' "'She has been described to me,' I went on, "'as a peach, a goddess, and a plum. "'Which should you consider the most proper term?' "'My companion shot an arch glance at me "'from the corners of her eyes, "'and I saw a dimple come and go "'beside the curve of her mouth. "'Goddess, to be sure,' said she. "'Peaches have such rough skins, and plums are apt to be sticky. "'And goddesses,' I added, "'were all very well upon Olympus, "'but in this matter-of-fact age must be sadly out of place. "'Speaking for myself, have you ever seen this particular goddess?' "'inquired my companion. Oh, "'Never. Then wait till you have, sir.' The moon was down now, yet the summer sky was wonderfully luminous, and in the east I almost fancied I could detect the first faint gleam of day. And after we had traversed some distance in silence, my companion suddenly spoke, but without looking at me. "'You have never once asked me who I am,' she said, almost reproachfully, I thought, "'nor how I came to be shut up in such a place, with such a man.' "'Why, as to that,' I answered. I make it a general rule to avoid awkward subjects when I can, and never to ask questions that it will be difficult to answer. I should find not the least difficulty in answering either, said she. Besides, I continued, it is no affair of mine, after all. Oh, said she, turning away from me, and then very slowly, no, I suppose not. 
"'Certainly not,' I added. "'How should it be?' "'How, indeed!' said she, over her shoulder. And then I saw that she was angry, and wondered. "'And yet,' I went on, after a lapse of silence, "'I think I could have answered both questions the moment I saw you at your casement.' "'Oh!' said she, this time in tone of surprise, and her anger all gone again, for I saw that she was smiling, and again I wondered. "'Yes,' I nodded. "'Then,' said she, seeing I was silent, "'whom do you suppose me?' "'You are, to the best of my belief, the Lady Helen Dunstan.' My companion stood still, and regarded me for a moment in wide-eyed astonishment. "'And how, sir, pray, did you learn all this?' she demanded, with the dimple once more peeping at me slyly from the corner of her pretty mouth. "'By the very simple method of adding two and two together,' I answered. "'Moreover, no longer ago than yesterday I broke bread with a certain Mr. Beverley.' I heard her breath come in a sudden gasp, and next moment she was peering up into my face while her hands beat upon my breast with soft, quick little taps. Beverly she whispered beverley uh, no no why they told me sir harry told me that peregrine lay dying at tunbridge then sir harry mortimer lied to you said i for no longer ago than yesterday afternoon i sat in a ditch eating bread and cheese with a mr peregrine beverley oh are you sure are you sure oh, quite sure and as we ate he told me many things and among them of a life of wasted opportunities, of foolish riot and prodigal extravagance, and of its logical consequence. Want. My poor Perry, she murmured. He spoke also of his love for a beautiful and good woman, and its hopelessness. Oh, my dear, dear Perry, she said again. And yet, said I, all this is admittedly his own fault, and, as I think Heraclitus says, Suffering is the inevitable consequence of sin or folly. And he is well? she asked. Quite, quite well? He is, said I. Oh, thank God, she whispered. Tell me, she went on, is he so very, very poor? Is he much altered? I have not seen him for a whole long year. Why, a year is apt to change a man, I answered. Adversity is a hard school, but sometimes a very good one. Were he changed, no matter how, were he a beggar upon the roads, I should love him, always, said she, speaking in that soft, caressing voice which only the best of women possess. Yes, I had guessed as much, said I, and found myself sighing. A year is a long, long time, and we were to have been married this month but my father quarrelled with him and forbade him the house. So poor Perry went back to London. Then we heard he was ruined, and I almost died with grief. You see, his very poverty only made me love him the more. Yesterday, that man— Sir Harry Mortimer, said I. Yes, he was a friend of whom I had often heard Perry speak, and he told me that my Perry lay at Tunbridge dying and begging to see me before the end. He offered to escort me to him, assuring me that I could reach home again long before dusk. My father, who I knew would never permit me to go, was absent, and so I ran away. Sir Harry had a carriage waiting, but almost as soon as the door was closed upon us, and we had started, I began to be afraid of him, and—and— and "'Sir Harry, as I said before, is an unpleasant animal,' I nodded. "'Thank heaven,' she pursued. "'We had not gone very far before the chase broke down. "'And the rest you know.' "'The footpath we had been following now led over a stile into a narrow lane or byway. "'Very soon we came to a high stone wall wherein was set a small wicket. "'Through this she led me and we entered a broad park where was an avenue of fine old trees, beyond which I saw the gables of a house, for the stairs had long since paled to the dawn, and there was a glory in the east. "'Your father will be rejoiced to have you safe back again,' said I. "'Yes,' she nodded. "'But he will be very angry.' 
and hereupon she stopped and began to pull and twist and pat her shining hair with dexterous white fingers, talking thus the while. My mother died at my birth, and since then father has worshipped her memory, and his face always grows wonderfully gentle when he looks upon her portrait. They say I'm greatly like her, although she was a famous beauty in her day. And indeed, I... I think there must be some truth in it, for, no matter how I may put him out, my father can never be very angry when my hair is dressed so. With the word she turned, and truly I thought the face peeping out from its clustered curls even more lovely and bewitching than before. I very much doubt if any man could, said I. As we approached the house I saw that the smooth gravel was much cut up as though by the coming and going of many wheels and horses, and also that one of the windows still shone with a bright light, and it was towards this window that my companion led me. In a while, having climbed the terrace steps, I noticed that this was one of those French windows opening to the ground. Now looking through into the room beyond, I beheld an old man who sat bowed down at a table with his white head pillowed upon his arms, sitting so very still that he might have been asleep but for the fierce grip of his twitching hands. Now upon the table, at no great distance from him, between the guttering candles, lay a hat, a very ill-used, battered-looking object, which I thought I recognized. Wherefore, looking about, I presently espied its owner leaning against the mantel. He was powdered with dust from head to foot, and his worn garments looked more ragged than ever. And as he stood there, in the droop of his head and the listless set of his shoulders, there was an air of the most utter dejection and hopelessness, while upon his thin cheek I saw the glisten of a great solitary tear. But as I looked, the window was burst suddenly open. Perry! Love, surprise, joy, pity! All were summed up in that one word, yet deeper than all was love. And at that cry the white head was raised, raised in time to see a vision of loveliness caught up in two ragged arms. Father! And now the three heads, the white, the golden, and the black, were drawn down together, drawn and held close in an embrace that was indeed reunion. Then, seeing my presence was become wholly unnecessary, I turned away and was soon once more deep among the trees. Yet, as I went, I suddenly heard voices that called upon my name. But I kept on, and in due season came out upon the broad highway. And in a little, as I went, very full of thought, the sun rose up. So I walked along through a world all glorious with morning. End of section 8section 9 of the broad highway by geoffrey farnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john leader book 1 chapter 22 in which i meet with a literary tinker even in that drowsy semi-conscious state that most delightful borderland which lies midway between sleeping and waking i knew it could not be the woodpecker who as i judged from sundry manifest signs lodged in the tree above me no woodpecker that ever pecked could originate such sounds as these two quick light strokes followed by another and heavier thus tap 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 and pause and then tap 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 again and so on whatever doubts i may have yet harbored on this subject however were presently dispelled by a fragrance sweeter to the nostrils of a hungry man than the breath of flowers, the spices of the East, or all the vaunted perfumes of Arabia. In a word, the odor of frying bacon. Hereupon I suddenly realized how exceedingly keen was my appetite, and sighed, bethinking me that I must first find a tavern before I could satisfy my craving, when a voice reached me from no great distance, a full, rich, sonorous voice singing a song. And the words of the song were these. 
A tinker am I, oh, a tinker am I. A tinker I'll live, and a tinker I'll die. If the king in his crown could change places with me, I'd laugh so I would, and I'd say unto he, A tinker I am, oh, a tinker am I. A tinker I'll live, and a tinker I'll die. It was a quaint air, with a shake at the end of the first two and last two lines, which, altogether, I thought very pleasing. I advanced, guided by the voice, until I came out into a grassy lane. Seated upon an artfully contrived folding-stool was a man. He was a very small man, despite his great voice, who held a kettle between his knees, and a light hammer in his hand, while a little to one side of him there blazed a crackling fire of twigs, upon which a hissing frying-pan was balanced. But what chiefly drew and held my attention was the man's face. Narrow and peaked, with little round twinkling eyes set deep in his head, close black hair, grizzled at the temples, and a long blue chin. And presently, as I stood staring at him, he finished his song, and, chancing to raise his eyes, stared back at me. "'Good morning,' said he at last, with a bright nod. "'So then you didn't cut your throat in the hollow oak, after all,' said I. "'Nor likely to either, master,' he answered, shaking his head. "'Lord love your eyes and limbs, no.' "'But,' said I, "'some day or so ago I met a man—' "'Ah,' nodded the tinker, "'to be sure you did. "'A peddler of brooms and ribbons—' "'Gabbing Dick,' nodded the tinker, "'who told me very seriously "'that I'd been found in the big holler oak with my throat cut,' nodded the tinker. "'But what did he mean by it? "'Why, you see,' explained the tinker, leaning over to turn a frizzling bacon rasher very dexterously with the blade of a jackknife. "'You see, Gabbing Dick is uh, uncommon fond of murders, hangings, suicides, and such like. It's just a way he's got.' "'A very unpleasant way,' said I. "'But very harmless when all's done and said,' added the tinker. "'You mean?' "'A little weak up here,' explained the tinker, tapping his forehead with the handle of the jackknife. "'His father was murdered the day before he were born, d'ye see, which drove his poor mother out of her mind, which conditions is apt to make a man a little strange.' "'Poor fellow,' said I, while the tinker began his tap-tapping again. "'Are you hungry?' he inquired suddenly, glancing up at me with his hammer poised. "'Very hungry,' said I. Hereupon he set down his hammer, and, turning to a pack at his side, proceeded to extract therefrom a loaf of bread, a small tin of butter, and a piece of bacon, from which last he cut sundry slices with a jackknife. He now lifted the hissing rashers from the pan to a tin plate, which he set upon the grass at my feet, together with the bread and the butter, and— having produced a somewhat battered knife and fork, handed them to me with another bright nod. "'You are very kind,' said I. "'Why, and the man is as fine a company, you see, especially of one who can think and talk, and you have the face of both. I am, as you might say, a literary cove, being fond of books, novels, and such like.' And in a little while, the bacon being done to his liking, we sat down together and began to eat. "'That was a strange song of yours,' said I, after a while. "'And did you like it?' he inquired, with a quick tilt of his head. "'Both words and tune,' I answered. "'I made the words myself,' said the tinker. "'And do you mean it?' "'Mean what?' asked the tinker. "'That you would rather be a tinker than a king.' "'Why, to be sure I would,' he rejoined. "'Be in a literary cove I know some of history.' "'And a king's life weren't all lavender, not by no manner of means, nor yet a bed of roses.' "'Yet there's much to be said for a king.' Oh, "'Very little, I think,' said the tinker. "'A king has great advantages.' "'Which he generally abuses,' said the tinker. "'There have been some great and noble kings.' "'But a great many more bad uns,' said the tinker. "'And then look how often they got themselves pisoned, or stabbed, or had their heads chopped off. "'No, if you axes me, I prefer to tinker a kettle under a hedge.' "'Then you are contented?' Eh, "'Not quite,' he answered, his face falling. "'Me being a literary cove, as I think I've mentioned afore, "'it has always been my wish to be a scholar.' "'Far better a tinker,' said I. "'Young fellow, 
said the tinker, shaking his head reprovingly. You're off the mark there. Knowledge is power. Why, Lord love my eyes and limbs. What's finer than to be able to read in the Greek and Latin? To possess the capacity of earning an honest livelihood, said I. Why, I tell you, continued the tinker, unheeding my remark, I'd give this here left hand of mine to be able to read the very words of such men as Plato, Aristotle, Epictetus, Xenophon, and all the rest of them. There are numerous translations, said I. Ah, to be sure, sighed the tinker, but then they are translations. There are good translations as well as bad, said I. Maybe, returned the tinker, maybe, but a translation's only an echo, after all, however good it be. As he spoke, he dived into his pack and brought forth a book, which he handed to me. It was a smallish volume in battered leathern covers, and had evidently seen much long and hard service. Opening it at the title page, I read, Epictetus, his Enchiridion, with Simplicius, his Comment, made English from the Greek by George Stanhope, late fellow of King's College in Cambe, London. Printed for Richard Sayre at Gray's Inn Gate in Holborn and Joseph Hindmarsh against the Exchange in Cornhill, 1694. You've read Epictetus, perhaps? inquired the tinker. I have. Not in the Greek, of course. Yes, said I, smiling, though by dint of much labor. The tinker stopped chewing to stare at me wide-eyed, then swallowed his mouthful at one gulp. Lord love me, he exclaimed, and you so young, too. No, said I, I'm twenty-five. And Latin, now. Don't tell me you can read the Latin. But I can't make a kettle, or even mend one, for that matter, said I. But you're a scholar, and it's a fine thing to be a scholar. And I tell you again, it is better to be a tinker, said I. How so? It is a healthier life, in the first place, said I. That I can believe, nodded the tinker. It is a happier life, in the second place. That I doubt, returned the tinker. And in the third place, it pays much better. That I don't believe, said the tinker. Nevertheless, said I, speaking for myself, I have, in the course of my twenty-five years, earned but ten shillings, and that, but by the sale of my waistcoat. Lord love me, exclaimed the tinker, staring. A man, I pursued, may be a far better scholar than I, may be full of the wisdom of the ancients, and the teachings of all the great thinkers and philosophers, had yet starved to death, indeed frequently does. But who ever heard of a starving tinker? "'But a scholar may write great books,' said the tinker. "'A scholar rarely writes a great book,' said I, shaking my head. "'Probably for the good and sufficient reason that great books never are written.' "'Young fellow,' said the tinker, staring, "'what do you mean by that?' "'I mean that truly great books only happen, and very rarely.' "'But a scholar may happen to write a great book,' said the tinker. Oh, to be sure, he may, a book that nobody will risk publishing, and, if so, a book that nobody will trouble to read, nowadays. Why so? Because this is an eminently unliterary age, incapable of thought, and therefore seeking to be amused. Whereas the writing of books was once a painful art, it has of late become a trick very easy of accomplishment, requiring no regard for probability, and little thought so long as it is packed sufficiently full of impossible incidents through which a ridiculous heroine and a more absurd hero duly sigh their appointed way to the last chapter. Whereas books were once a power, they are of late degenerated into things of amusement with which to kill an idle hour and be promptly forgotten the next. Yet the great books remain, said the tinker. Yes, said I, but... Who troubles their head over Homer or Virgil these days? Who cares to open Steele's Tatler or Addison's Spectator, while there is the latest novel to be had, or Bell's Life to be found on any coffee-house table? And why, said the tinker, looking at me over a piece of bacon, skewered upon the point of his jackknife, why don't you write a book? I probably shall some day, I answered. And supposing, said the tinker, eyeing the piece of bacon thoughtfully, supposing nobody ever reads it. The worse for them, said I. Thus we talked of books, and the making of books, something of which I have already set down in another place, until our meal was at an end. 
"'You are the rather strange young man, I think,' said the tinker, as, having duly wiped knife and fork and plate upon a handful of grass, I handed them back. "'Yet you are a stranger tinker. How so? Why, who ever heard of a tinker who wrote verses, and worked with a copy of Epictetus at his elbow? Which I don't deny is I'm a great thinker,' nodded the tinker. "'To be sure, I think a powerful lot.' "'A dangerous habit,' said I, shaking my head, "'and a most unwise one.' "'Eh?' cried the tinker, staring. "'Your serious thinking man,' I explained, "'is seldom happy. "'As a rule has few friends, "'being generally regarded askance, "'and is always misunderstood by his fellows. "'All the world's great thinkers, "'from Christ down, "'were generally misunderstood, "'looked at askance, "'and had very few friends.' "'But these are all great men,' said the tinker. "'We think so now, but in their day they were very much despised. And who was more hated, by the very people he sought to aid, than Christ?' "'By the evildoers, yes,' nodded the tinker. "'On the contrary,' said I. "'His worst enemies were men of learning, good citizens and patterns of morality, who looked upon him as a dangerous zealot, threatening the destruction of the old order of things, Hence they killed him, as an agitator. Things are much the same today. History tells us that Christ, or the Spirit of Christ, has entered into many men who have striven to enlighten and better the conditions of their kind, and they have generally met with violent deaths, for humanity is very gross and blind. The tinker slowly wiped his clasp-knife upon the leg of his breeches, closed it, and slipped it into his pocket. Nevertheless, said he at last, I am convinced that you are a very strange young man. Be that as it may, said I, the bacon was delicious. I have never enjoyed a meal so much, except once in an inn called the Old Cock. I know it, nodded the tinker, a very poor house. But the ham and eggs are beyond praise, said I. Still, my meal here under the trees with you will long remain a pleasant memory. Good-bye, then, said the tinker. "'Good-bye, young man, and I wish you happiness.' "'What is happiness?' said I. The tinker removed his hat, and, having scratched his head, put it on again. "'Happiness?' said he. "'Happiness is the state of being content with oneself, the world, and everything in general.' "'Then,' said I, "'I fear I can never be happy.' "'And why not?' "'Because, supposing I ever became contented with the world, and everything in general, which is highly improbable, I shall never, never, be contented with myself. Book One, Chapter Twenty Three, Concerning Happiness, a Plowman, and Silver Buttons. Now, as I went, pondering on true happiness and the nature of it, I beheld a man plowing in a field hard by, and as he plowed, he whistled lustily. And drawing near to the field, I sat down upon a gate and watched, for there are few sights and sounds I am fonder of than the gleam of the ploughshare and the sighing whisper it makes as it turns the fragrant loam. A truly noble occupation, said I to myself, dignified by the ages, I, old, well nigh, as the green earth itself. No man need be ashamed to guide a plough. And indeed a fine sight it made, the straining horses, the stalwart figure of the ploughman with the blue sky, the long brown furrows, and, away and beyond, the tender green of leaves, while the jingle of the harness, the clear, merry whistled notes, and the song of a skylark high above our heads, all blended into a chorus it was good to hear. As he came up to where I sat upon the gate, the ploughman stopped, and, wiping the glistening moisture from his brow, nodded good-humouredly. "'A fine morning,' said I. "'So be it, sir. Now you come to mention it, it do be a fine day, surely.' "'You at least seem happy,' said I. "'Happy?' he exclaimed, staring. "'Yes,' said I. "'Well, I beant. "'And why not?' The ploughman scratched his ear, and carried his glance from my face up to the sky and down again. "'I don't know,' he answered, "'but I beant. "'Yet you whistle gaily enough.' "'Why, a man must do summit. "'Then you seem strong and healthy. "'Yes, I do be fine and hearty. "'And sleep well? <laughs> "'Like a blessed log. "'And eat well? "'Eat!' he exclaimed with a mighty laugh. <laughs> "'Lord, 
I should think so. Why, I'm always eatin' or thinkin' of it. Oh, I'm a fine eater, I am. And I beant no chicken at drinkin' neither. Then you ought to be happy. Ah, but I beant, he repeated, shaking his head. Have you any troubles? None as I can think on. You earn good money every week? Ten shillin'. You are not married? Not me. Then, said I, you must be happy. The ploughman pulled at his ear again, looking slowly all round the field, and finally shook his head. Well, said he, I beant. But why not? His eye roved slowly up from my boots to the buttons of my coat. Them be fine buttons, said he. Do you think so? Look like silver. They are silver, said I. <laughs> Lord, he exclaimed, you wouldn't part with they buttons, I suppose. Well, that depends. On what? On how much you would give for them. The ploughman thrust a hand into a deep pocket and brought up five shillings. I were a-goin' to buy a pair of boots on my way home, he explained, but I'd rather have they buttons, if five shillin' will buy em. The boots would be more serviceable, said I. Maybe, sir, but then everybody wears boots, but there beant many as can show buttons the like of them. So if you're willin'... Lend me your knife, said I and forthwith I sawed off the eight silver buttons and dropped them into his palm, whereupon he handed me the money with great alacrity. "'And now,' said I, "'tell me why you are not happy.' "'Well,' returned the ploughman, back at his ear again, "'you see, it being as you ask so sudden-like, I can't exactly say. But if you was to pass by in a day or two, why, maybe I could tell ye." So, pocketing the buttons, he whooped cheerily to his horses, and plodded off, whistling more merrily than ever. Book One, Chapter Twenty Four, which introduces the reader to the ancient. The sun was high when I came to a place where the ways divided, and while I stood hesitating which road to take, I heard the cool splash and murmur of a brook at no great distance. Wherefore, being hot and thirsty, I scrambled through the hedge and, coming to the brook, threw myself face down beside it and catching up the sweet pure water in my hands, drank my fill. Which done, I bathed my feet and hands and face, and became much heartened and refreshed thereby. Now, because I have ever loved the noise of running waters, in a little while I rose and walked on beside the stream, listening to its blithesome melody. So, by devious ways, for the brook wound prodigiously, I came at length to a sudden declivity down which the water plunged in a miniature cascade, sparkling in the sun, and gleaming with a thousand rainbow hues. On I went, climbing down as best I might, until I found myself in a sort of green basin, very cool after the heat and glare of the roads, for the high tree-clad sides afforded much shade. On I went, past fragrant thickets and bending willows, with soft lush grass underfoot and leafy arches overhead, and the brook singing and chattering at my side, albeit a brook of changeful mood, now laughing and dimpling in some fugitive ray of sunshine, now sighing and whispering in the shadows, but ever moving upon its appointed way, and never quite silent. So I walked on beside the brook, watching the fish that showed like darting shadows on the bottom, until, chancing to raise my eyes, I stopped, and there, screened by leaves, shut in among the green, stood a small cottage or hut. My second glance showed it to be tenantless, for the thatch was partly gone, the windows were broken, and the door had long since fallen from its hinges. Yet, despite its forlornness and desolation, despite the dilapidation of broken door and fallen chimney, there was something in the air of the place that drew me strangely. It was somewhat roughly put together, but still very strong, and seemed, save for the roof, weather-fast. A man might do worse than live here, thought I, with the birds for neighbours and the brook to sing him to sleep at night. Indeed, a man might live very happily in such a place. I was still looking at the hut, with this in my mind, when I was startled by hearing a thin, quavering voice behind me. "'Be you am looking at de cottage, master?' Turning sharp round, I beheld a very ancient man in a smock-frock, who carried a basket on one arm and leaned upon a stick. "'Yes,' I answered. I was wondering how it came to be built in such an out-of-the-world spot. "'Why, twere built by a wanderin' man of the roads.' 
"'It's very lonely,' said I. "'You may well say so, sir. Haunted it be, too.' "'Haunted?' said I. "'Haunted as ever was,' answered the old man, with a sprightly nod, strangely contrasting with his wrinkled face and tremulous limbs. "'No one ventures nigh the place after dark, and few enough in the daytime, for that matter.' "'On account of the ghost?' "'Ah!' nodded the ancient. "'Moans he do, and likewise groans. There's some as says he twitters, too, and shakes chains.' "'Then nobody has lived here of late?' Oh, "'Bless ye, no, nor wouldn't know, not if you paid him, too. Nobody's come an eye the place, you may say, since t'were built by the wandering man. Lived here all alone, he did. Killed himself here likewise.' "'Killed himself?' said I. "'Ah! Hung himself behind the door yonder. Sixty and six year ago come August, and twere me as found him. You see, said the old man, setting down his basket, and seating himself with great nicety on the moss-grown doorstep, you see, twere a terrible storm that night, rain and wind, with every now and then a girt, crackling flame of lightning. I mind I'd been up to the farm, a courtin' on Nancy Brent. She am dead now, poor lass, years and years ago, but she were a fine buxom maid in those days, do you see? Well, I were coming home, and what with one thing and another, I lost my way, and presently, as I were stumbling along in the dark, comes another crackle of lightning, and looking up, what should I see but this here cottage? Twere newer looking then, with a door and winders, but the door was shut, and the winders was dark, so there I stood in the rain, not liking to disturb the stranger, for he were a girt fierce, unfriendly kind of chap and uncommon fond of being left alone. Howsoever, after a while, up I goes to the door, and knocks, for I were a good, strong, stoppin' well-lookin' figure of a man myself, in those days, do you see, I could give a good buffet, and take one, too. And so up I goes to the door, and knocks with my fist clenched, all ready, and a tidy, sizable fist it were in those days. But, Lord, nobody answered, and so at last I lifted the latch. Here the ancient paused to draw a snuff-box from his pocket, with great deliberation, noting my awakened interest with a twinkling eye. Well? I inquired. Well, he continued slowly, I lifted the latch, and give a push to the door, but it would only open a little way, an inch, perhaps, and stuck. There he tapped, and opened his snuff-box. Well? I inquired again. Well, he went on, I give it a girt big push with my shoulder. I were a fine strong chap in those days, and just as it flew open comes another flash of lightning, and the first thing I seen was a boot. A boot? I exclaimed. A boot as ever was, nodded the ancient, and took a pinch of snuff with great apparent gusto. Go on, said I, go on. Oh! "'It's a fine story, a fine story,' he chuckled. "'There bean't many men of my age as has fund a hung man in a thunderstorm. "'Well, as I tell you, I seen a boot, likewise a leg, "'and there were this ear wandering man of the robes a detangling behind the door from a steeple. "'Look ye!' he exclaimed, rising with some little difficulty and hobbling into the hut. "'There be the very steeple, so it be.' and he pointed up to a rusty iron staple that had been driven deep into the beam above the door. "'And why?' said I. "'Why did he hang himself?' "'You see, he had no friends, and never told nobody. Nobody ever knowed,' answered the old man, shaking his head. "'But uh, on that there staple he hung himself, and on that there staple I found him, on a stormy night sixty and six year ago come August.' "'You have a wonderful memory,' said I. Ay, to be sure, a wonderful memory, a wonderful memory. Sixty and six years is an age, said I. Eh, so be it, nodded the ancient. I were a fine young chap in those days. Tall I were, and straight as an error. I be a bit different now. Why, you are getting old, said I. So's the staple yonder, but to staple looks nigh as good as ever. Iron generally wears better than flesh and blood said I. It's only natural. Hi, but he can't last forever, said the ancient, frowning and shaking his head at the rusty staple. 
I've watched un, month in and month out, all these years, and seen un growin' rustier and rustier. I'll last ye out yet, I've said to him. He knows it. <laughs> He've heard me. Many and many a time. I'll last ye out yet, I've said, and so I will, too. He can't last forever, and I be a vigorous man, a mortal vigorous man, bein't I? <laughs> Wonderfully, said I. And so strong as a bull? To be sure. And to staple can't last much longer. Eh, maister? <laughs> so old and rusty as he be? Oh, one would hardly think so. Not so long as a terrible vigorous man like I be? He inquired, with a certain wistful appeal in his eyes. No, I answered impulsively. I knowed it! <laughs> I knowed it! He chuckled, feebly brandishing his stick. Such a poor old staple as tis, all eat up with rust. Every time I come here, a gatherin' watercress, I come and give it a look, and watch em rustin' away, and rustin' away. I'll see him go first, after all, so I will. And with another nod at the staple, he turned and hobbled out into the sunshine. And seeing how, despite his brave showing, he labored to carry the heavy bucket, I presently took it from him, disregarding his protests, and set off by his side. Yet, as he went, I turned once to look back at the deserted hut. You am uh, thinkin' tis a terrible bad place at night, said the old man. On the contrary, I answered, I was thinking it might suit a homeless man like me very well indeed. Do you mean to live there? exclaimed the ancient. Yes, said I. Then you bean't afraid of the ghost? No, I answered. Perhaps you be one of they fools as think there bean't no ghosts. As to that, I answered, I don't know. But I don't think I should be much afraid, and it is a great blessing to have some spot on this unfriendly world that we can call home, even though it be but a hut and haunted. In a little while the path he followed led up a somewhat steep ascent which, though not so precipitous as the place where I had entered the hollow, was a difficult climb notwithstanding. Seeing which, I put out a hand to aid my aged companion, but he repulsed me almost sharply. Let be, he panted, let be. Nobody's ever helped me up this here path, and nobody never shall. So up we went, the ancient and I, side by side and very slowly, until, the summit being reached, he seated himself, spent and breathless, upon a fallen tree, which had doubtless served this purpose many times before, and mopped at his wrinkled brow with a trembling hand. You see, he cried, as soon as he had recovered his breath sufficiently. You see, I be wonderful spry and active, could dance ye a hornpipe any day, if I was so minded. On my word, said I, I believe you could. But where are you going now? To Sissenhurst. How far is that? About a mile across the fields. You can see the pint at Joel Amos's oast house above the trees yonder. Is there a good inn at Sissinghurst? Ay, there's the bull, comfortable, and draws fine ale. Then I will go to Sissinghurst. Ay, ay, nodded the old man. If it be good ale in a comfortable inn you want, you need seek no further nor Sissinghurst. Ninety and one years I've lived there, and I know. Ninety one years, I repeated. As ever was, returned the ancient, with another nod. Hey, be the oldest man in these parts, except David Ralph, and he died last year. "'Why, then, if he's dead, you must be the oldest,' said I. "'No,' said the ancient, shaking his head. "'You see, it be this way. "'David were my brother, and uncommon proud he were of being the oldest man in these parts. "'And now that he be dead and gone, it do seem a poor thing, ah, a very poor thing, "'to take advantage of a dead man, and deem my own brother.' "'Saying which, the ancient rose, and we went on together, side by side, Toward Sissinghurst Village. End of section nine. Section ten of the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book one, chapter twenty five. Of Black George the Smith and How He Threw the Hammer. The Bull is a plain, square, whitewashed building with a sloping roof 
and before the door an open portico, wherein are set two seats on which one may sit of a sunny afternoon with a mug of ale at one's elbow, and watch the winding road, the thatched cottages bowered in roses, or the quiver of distant trees where the red conical roof of some oast house makes a vivid note of colour amid the green. Or one may close one's eyes and hark to the chirp of the swallows under the eaves, the distant lowing of cows, or the clink of hammers from the smithy across the way. And presently, as we sat there drowsing in the sun, to us came one from the tap, a bullet-headed fellow, small of eye and nose, but great of jaw, albeit he was become somewhat fat and fleshy, who, having nodded to me, sat him down beside the ancient, and addressed him as follows. "'Black George be took again, gaffer.' "'Ah, I knowed twould come sooner late, Simon,' said the ancient, shaking his head. "'I knowed as he'd never last the month out.' "'Seemed going on all quiet and regular, though,' said the bullet-headed man, whom I discovered to be the landlord of the bull. "'Seemed nice and quiet, and nothing out of the way, when, about an hour ago it were, he ups and eaves Sam out into the road.' "'Ah!' said the old man, nodding his head again. "'To be sure, I've noticed, Simon, as tis generally about the twentieth of the month as charge gets took.' "'Ye've got a wonderful head, have the gaffer,' said Simon, turning to me. "'Yes,' said I, "'but who is Black George, and how comes he to be taken, and by what?' "'Gaffer,' said the innkeeper, "'you tell him.' <laughs> "'Why, then,' began the ancient, nothing loath, "'Black George be a girt big strong man, "'the biggest, girtest, and strongest in the South Country, do you see? "'Almost as fine a man as I were in my time, "'and off and on gets took with terrans and rages, "'at which times he don't mind who he eats. <laughs> "'No, nor where,' added the innkeeper. "'Oh, he be a bad man, be Black George, when he's took, "'for he have a knack, do you see. "'I was taking hold of the one nighest turn, and even an over his head. Extremely unpleasant, said I. Just what he done this morning with Sam, nodded the innkeeper. Hoven out into the road he did. And what did Sam do? I inquired. Oh, Sam are mighty glad to get off so easy. Sam must be a very remarkable fellow, undoubtedly a philosopher, said I. He be naught to look at, said the ancient. Now at this moment there came a sudden deep bellow, a hoarse, bull-like roar from somewhere near by, and looking round in some perplexity through the white doorway of the smithy opposite, I saw a man come tumbling, all arms and legs, who, having described a somersault, fell, rolled over once or twice, and, sitting up in the middle of the road, stared about him in a dazed sort of fashion. "'That's Job,' nodded the ancient. "'Poor fellow!' said I, and rose to go to his assistance. "'Oh, that weren't nothing,' said the ancient, laying a restraining hand upon my arm. Oh, "'Nothing at all. Job bein't hurt. Why, I've seen him fall further nor that afore now, but you see Job be pretty heavy handling, even for Black George.' And in a little while Job arose from where he sat in the dust, and, limping up, sat himself down on the opposite bench, very black of brow and fierce of eye and after he had sat there silent for maybe five minutes, I said that I hoped he wasn't hurt. Hurt? he repeated with a blank stare. How should I be hurt? Why, you seem to fall rather heavily, said I. At this Job regarded me with a look half resentful, half reproachful, and immediately turned his back upon me, from which, and sundry winks and nods and shakes of the head from the others, it seemed that my remark had been ill-judged, and after we had sat silent for maybe another five minutes, the ancient appeared to notice Job's presence for the first time. "'Why, you be at workin's afternoon, then, Job?' he inquired solemnly. "'No.' "'Goin' to take holiday, perhaps?' "'Ah, oh, I'm done with Smithin, leastways for Black George. And him with all that raft to work in, Job, pretty fix he'll be in, with no one to strike for him.' said Simon. "'Sarves and right, too,' retorted Job, furtively rubbing his left knee. "'But what'll he do without a helper?' persisted Simon. Hey, "'Lord knows,' returned the ancient, "'unless Job thinks better of it.' "'Not me,' 
said the individual, feeling his right elbow with tender solicitude. I'm done with Black George, I am. Ain't I broke my back for me once afore, but this is the last time. I never swing a sledge for Black George again, danged if I do. And him to mand the old church screen up to Cranbrook Church, sighed the ancient. A wonderful screen, a wonderful screen. Older than me. <laughs> ah, a sight older. Hundreds and hundreds of years older. They wouldn't let nobody touch it but Black George. He be the best smith in the South Country, nodded Simon. Eh, and a bad man to work for as ever was, growled Job. I'll work for them no more. My mind's made up. And when my mind's made up, there beant no moving me. Like a rock I be. Uh, Twould have been a fine thing for a Sissonist man to have mended to old screen, said the ancient. Twould that, nodded Simon. A shame it is, as it should go to others. Hereupon, having finished my ale, I rose. "'Be you a-goin', young mister?' inquired the ancient. "'Why, that depends,' said I. I. "'I understand this man, Black George, needs a helper, so I have decided to go and offer my services.' "'You!' exclaimed Job, staring in open-mouthed amazement, as did also the other two. "'Why not?' I rejoined. "'Black George needs a helper, and I need money.' "'My chap,' said Job warningly, "'don't you do it. "'You be a tidy, sizable chap, "'but Black George would make no more of you "'than I should of a baby. "'Don't you do it.' "'Better not,' said Simon. "'On the contrary,' I returned. "'Better run a little bodily risk "'and satisfy one's hunger "'rather than lie safe but famishing "'beneath some hedge or rick. "'What do you think, ancient?' The old man leaned forward and peered up at me sharply beneath his hanging brows. "'Well?' said I. "'You am right,' he nodded. "'And a man with eyes the like o' yearn bein't one as tis easy to turn aside, even though it do be Black George as tries.' "'Then,' said Job, as I took up my staff, "'if your back's broke, my chap, why don't go for to blame me, that's all. You'll be a sight too cocksure, ah, that you be. I'm thinking Black George would find this chap a bit different to Job, remarked the ancient. What do you think, Simon? It looks as if he might take a good blow, ah, and give one for that matter, returned the innkeeper, studying me with half-closed eyes and his head to one side, as I have seen artists look at pictures. He be pretty wide in the shoulders, and full in the chest, and, by the look of him, quick on his pins. You've been a fightin' man, Simon, and you ought to know. But you've got summat better still. And what might that be, Gaffer? inquired the innkeeper. A good straight bright eye, Simon, with a look in it as says, I will. <laughs> ah, but what a charge, cried Job. Black charge don't mind a man's eyes, except to black frequent. He don't mind nothing or nobody. A job, said the ancient, tapping his snuff-box. There's some things as is better nor girt, big muscles and girt strong fists. If you wasn't a danged fool, you'd know what I mean. Young man, he went on, turning to me, you puts me in mind of what I were at your age, though to be sure I were taller than you by about five or six inches, and maybe more. But don't go for to be too cocksure for all that. Black jarge aren't to be sneezed at. And if you must hitten, added the innkeeper, why, go for the chin. There aren't a better place to hit a man than on the chin. If so be, you can thump it right, and hard enough. I mind twas so I put out Tom Brock a Bedford. A sweet pretty blow it were, too, though I do say it. Thank you, said I. Should it come to fighting, which heaven forfend, I shall certainly remember your advice. Saying which, I turned away, and crossed the road to the open door of the smithy, very conscious of the three pairs of eyes that watched me as I went. Upon the threshold of the forge I paused to look about me, and there, sure enough, was the smith. <laughs> Indeed a fine big fellow he was, with great shoulders and a mighty chest, and arms whose bulging muscles showed to advantage in the red glow of the fire. In his left hand he grasped a pair of tongs wherein was set a glowing iron scroll, upon which he beat with the hammer in his right. 
I stood watching until, having beaten out the glow from the iron, he plunged the scroll back into the fire and fell to blowing with the bellows. But now, as I looked more closely at him, I almost doubted if this could be Black George after all, for this man's hair was of bright gold, and curled in tight rings upon his brow, while, instead of the black, scowling visage I had expected, I beheld a ruddy, open, well-featured face, out of which looked a pair of eyes of a blue you may sometimes see in a summer sky at evening. And yet again his massive size would seem to proclaim him the famous Black George, and no other. It was with something of doubt in my mind, nevertheless, that I presently stepped into the smithy and accosted him. "'Are you Black George?' I inquired. At the sound of my voice he let go the handle of the bellows and turned. As I watched I saw his brows draw suddenly together, while the golden hairs of his beard seemed to curl upward. "'Suppose I be!' "'Then I wish to speak with you.' "'Be that what you am come for?' "'Yes.' "'Be you come far?' "'Yes.' "'That's a pity.' "'Why?' "'Cause you'll have a good way to go back again.' "'What do you mean?' "'Well, for one thing, I mean as I don't like your looks, my chap.' "'And why don't you like my looks?' "'Lord!' exclaimed the smith. "'How should I know? But I don't. Of that I am certain sure.' "'Which reminds me,' said I, "'of a certain unpopular gentleman of the name of Fell or Pell or Snell.' "'Eh?' said the smith, staring. "'There is a verse, I remember, which runs, I think, in this wise. "'I do not love thee, Dr. Fell or Pell or Snell, "'for reasons which I cannot tell. "'But this I know and know full well. "'I do not love thee, Dr. Fell or Pell or Snell.' "'So you am a poet, eh?' "'No,' said I, shaking my head. "'Then I'm sorry for it. A man don't meet with poets every day.' Saying which, he drew the scroll from the fire and laid it glowing upon the anvil. "'You was wishful to speak with me, I think?' he inquired. "'Yes,' I answered. "Ah," oh, nodded the smith, "'to be sure,' and forthwith began to sing most lustily, marking the time very cleverly with his ponderous hand-hammer. If, I began a little put out at this, if you will listen to what I have to say. But he only hammered away harder than ever, and roared his song the louder, and though it sounded ill enough at the time, it was a song I, I came to know well later, the words of which are these. Strike, ding, ding, strike, ding, ding, the iron it glows and to love with good blows, as fire doth bellows, strike, ding, ding. Now, seeing he was determined to give me no chance to speak, I presently seated myself close by and fell to singing likewise. <laughs> Oddly enough, the only thing I could recall on the moment was the tinker's song, and that but very imperfectly, and it served my purpose well enough. Thus we fell to it with a will, with the different notes clashing and filling the air with a most vile discord, and the words all jumbled up together, something in this wise. Strike, ding, ding, a tinker I am, ho! Oh. Strike, ding, ding, a tinker am I. The iron it glows, a tinker I live, and to love with good blows, and a tinker I'll die. As fire doth bellows, if the king in his crown strike ding ding, would change places with me strike ding ding, and so forth. The louder he roared, the louder roared I, until the place fairly rang with the din, insomuch that, chancing to look through the open doorway, I saw the ancient, with Simon, Job, and several others, on the opposite side of the way, staring open mouth as well they might. But still the smith and I continued to howl at each other with unabated vigour until he stopped, all at once, and threw down his hammer with a clang. "'Dang me if I like that voice of yourn!' he exclaimed. "'Why, to be sure, I don't sing very often,' I answered. "'Which, I mean to say, is a very good thing. Oh, a very good thing. Nor do I pretend to sing. Then why do you try now? For 
company's sake. Well, I don't like it. I've had enough of it. Then, said I, suppose you listen to what I have to say. Not by no manner of means. Then what do you propose to do? Why, said the smith, rising and stretching himself, since you ax me, I'm a-going to pitch you out on yon door. You may try, of course, said I, measuring the distance between us with my eye. But if you do, seeing you are so much the bigger and stronger man, I shall certainly fetch you a knock with this staff of mine, which I think you will remember for many a day. So saying, I rose and stepped out into the middle of the floor. Black George eyed me slowly up from the soles of my boots to the crown of my hat and down again, picked up his hammer in an undecided fashion, looked it over as if he had never seen such a thing before, tossed it into a corner, and, seating himself on the anvil, folded his arms. All at once a merry twinkle leapt into the blue depths of his eyes, and I saw the swift gleam of a smile. "'What do you want, man?' said he. Now hereupon, with a sudden gesture, I pitched my staff out through the open doorway into the road, and folded my arms across my chest, even as he. "'Why did he do that?' he inquired, staring. "'Because I don't think I shall need it after all.' "'But suppose I was to come for you now?' "'But you won't.' "'You'll be a strange sort of chap,' said he, shaking his head. <laughs> "'So they tell me.' "'And what does the likes of you want with the likes of me?' "'Work. Know anything about smithing?' "'Not a thing.' <laughs> "'Then why do you come here?' "'To learn.' "'More fool you,' said the smith. "'Why?' "'Because smithing is hard work, and dirty work, and hot work, and work as is badly paid nowadays.' "'Then why are you a smith?' My father was a smith afore me. And is that your only reason? My only reason. Then you are the greater fool. You think so, do ye? Certainly. Supposin, said Black George, stroking his golden beard reflectively, supposin I was to get up and break your neck for that. Then you would, at least, save me from the folly of becoming a smith. I don't, said Black George, shaking his head. No, I do not like you. I am sorry for that. Because, he went on, you have got the gift of the gab, and a gabbing man is worse than a gabbing woman. You can gab your share if it comes to that, said I. Can I? You can. My chap, he growled, holding up a warning hand. Go easy now, go easy. Don't get me took again. Not if I can help it, I returned. I be a quiet soul till I gets took. A very quiet soul lambs being quieter but i won't answer for that neck o yarn if i do get took so look out i understand you have an important piece of work on hand said i changing the subject the old church screen yes and are in need of a helper ah to be sure but you aren't got the look of a workin cove i never see a workin cove with hands like yourn so white as a woman's they be I have worked hard enough in my time, nevertheless, said I. What might you have done now? I have translated Petronius Arbiter, also Quintilian, with a literal rending into the English of the memories of the Sieur de Branton. Oh, exclaimed the smith, that sounds a lot. Anything more? Oh, yes, I answered. I won the high jump and throwing the hammer. Throwing the hammer? repeated Black George, musingly. Was it anything like that there? and he pointed to a sledge nearby. Something, I answered. And you want work? I do. Tell you what, my fellow, if you can throw that there hammer further nor me, then I say done, and you can name your own wages. But if I beat you, and I'm fair sure I can, then you must stand up to me for ten minutes, and I'll give you a good trouncing to ease my mind. What do you say? After a momentary hesitation, I nodded my head. Done, said I. <laughs> <laughs> More fool you, grinned the smith, and catching up his sledgehammer, he strode out into the road. Before the bowl, a small crowd had gathered, all newly come from field or farmyard, for most of them carried rake or pitchfork, having doubtless been drawn thither by the hellish outcry of Black George and myself. 
Now I noticed that while they listened to the ancient, who was holding forth, snuff-box in hand, yet every eye was turned towards the smithy, and in every eye was expectation. At our appearance, however, I thought they seemed, one and all, vastly surprised and taken aback, for heads were shaken, and glances wandered from the smith and myself to the ancient and back again. "'We'll all be danged!' exclaimed Job. "'I knowed it! I knowed it!' cried the ancient, rubbing his hands and chuckling. "'Knowed what, Gaffer?' inquired Black George, as we came up. "'Why, I knowed as this young chap would come out a-walkin' upon his own two legs, and not like Job, a-rollin' and a-wallerin' in the dust of the road, like a hog!' "'Why, you see, Gaffer,' began the smith, almost apologetically, it seemed to me, "'it do come sort of natural to heave the likes of Job about a bit.' You Job's made for it, you might say. But this chap's different. So he be, charge, so he be, nodded the ancient. Though mark me, gaffer, I aren't no how in love with this chap neither. He gabs too much to suit me by a long sight. He do that, chimed in Job, edging nearer. What I says is, if he do get his back broke, he aren't got nobody to blame but hisself. So cock sure as he be. Job! said the ancient. Hold the tongue. I says he's a cocksure cove, repeated Job doggedly. And a cocksure cove he be. What do you think, Charge? Job, returned the smith, I don't chuck a man into the road and talk with him both on the same day. In this conversation I bore no part, busying myself in drawing out a wide circle in the dust, a proceeding watched by the others with much interest and not a few wondering comments. "'What be going to do with the hammer, George?' inquired the ancient. "'Why,' explained the smith, "'this chap thinks he can throw it further nor me.' At this there was a general laugh. "'If so be he can,' pursued Black George, "'then he comes to work for me at his own price. But if I beat him, then he must stand up to me with his fists for ten minutes.' Ten minutes?' cried a voice. He won't last five. See if he do. Feel sorry for him, said a second. He do be so pale as a sheet already. So would you be if you was in his shoes, chimed a third, whereat there was a general laugh. Indeed, as I looked round the ring of grinning, unresponsive faces, it was plain to see that all sympathy was against the stranger, as is the way of bird, beast, fish, but especially man, the world over and I experienced a sudden sense of loneliness, which was, I think, only natural. Yet, as I put up my hand to loose the strap of my knapsack, I encountered another already there, and, turning, beheld Simon the innkeeper. "'If it do come to fightin,' he whispered close in my ear, "'if it do come to fightin, and I'm fair sure it will, keep away as much as you can. You look quick on your pins. Moreover, whatever you do—' Watch is right, and when you do see a chance to strike, go for his chin, a little to one side, and strike danged hard. Many thanks for your friendly advice, said I with a grateful nod, and slipping off my coat, would have handed it to him, but that the ancient hobbled up, and, taking it from me, folded it ostentatiously across his arm. Mark my words, Simon, said he, this young chap is as like what I were at his age as one pea is to another. I says so, and I mean so. Come, said Black George at this juncture, I've work waiting to be done, and my forge fire will be out. I'm quite ready, said I, stepping forward. It was now arranged that, standing alternately within the circle, we should each have three throws, whoever should make the two best throws to win. Whereupon the smith took his place within the circle, hammer in hand. Wait, said I. The advantage usually lies with the last thrower. It would be fairer to you were we to toss for it. No, answered Black George, motioning the onlookers to stand back. I've got the hammer, and I'll throw first. Now, as probably everyone knows, it is one thing to swing a sledgehammer in the ordinary way, but quite another to throw at any distance, for there is required, beside the bodily strength, a certain amount of knowledge without which a man is necessarily handicapped. Thus, despite my opponent's great strength of arm, I was fairly sanguine of the result. 
Black George took a fresh grip upon the hammer shaft, twirled it lightly above his head, swung it once, twice, thrice, and let it go. With a shout, Job and two or three others ran down the road to mark where it had fallen, and presently returned, pacing out the distance. Fifty-nine, they announced. Can he beat that? inquired Black George complacently. I think I can, I answered, as, taking up the hammer, I, in turn, stepped into the ring. Gripping the shaft firmly, I whirled it aloft, and began to swing it swifter and swifter, gaining greater impetus every moment, till, like a flash, it flew from my grasp. Panting, I watched it rise, 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 and then plunge down to earth in a smother of dust. "'You've beat it!' cried the ancient, flourishing his stick excitedly. "'Lord love me! You've beat it!' "'Ah, you've beat it, surely!' said a man who carried a rake that was forever getting in everybody's way. "'And by a goodish bit, too!' shouted another. "'Ah, but George aren't got his arm in yet,' retorted a third. "'George can do better nor that by a long sight.' But now all voices were hushed as Job paced up. Eighty-two, he announced. Black George looked hard at me, but, without speaking, stepped sulkily into the ring, moistened his palms, looked at me again, and, seizing the hammer, began to whirl it as he had seen me. Round and round it went, faster and faster, till, with a sudden lurch, he hurled it up and away. Indeed, it was a mighty throw. Straight and strong it flew, describing a wide parabola ere it thudded into the road. The excitement now waxed high, and many started off to measure the distance for themselves, shouting one to another as they went. As for the smith, he stood beside me, whistling, and I saw that the twinkle was back in his eyes again. One hundred and twenty, cried half a dozen voices. And a half, corrected Job, thrusting the hammer into my hand and grinning. Can he beat that? inquired Black George again. Aye, can he beat that? echoed the crowd. It was a marvellous throw, said I, shaking my head and indeed in my heart I knew I could never hope to equal, much less beat, such a mighty cast. I therefore decided on strategy, and, with this in mind, proceeded, in a leisurely fashion, once more to mark out the circle, which was obliterated in places, to flatten the surface underfoot, to roll up my sleeves and tighten my belt. In fine, I observed all such precautions as a man might be expected to take before some supreme effort. At length, having done everything I could think of to impress this idea upon the onlookers, I took up the hammer. "'Means to do it this time!' cried the man with the rake, knocking off Job's hat in his excitement, as, with a tremendous swing, I made my second throw. There was a moment's breathless silence as the hammer hurtled through the air. Then, like an echo to its fall, came a shout of laughter, for the distance was palpably far short of the giant smith's last. A moment later Job came pacing up and announced, Eighty-seven! Hereupon arose a very babble of voices. You got him beat already, George! Well, I knowed it from the start. Let him alone! cried Simon. You've got another chance yet. Much good it'll do him. Ah, might as well give in now and take his thrashing and had done with it. That my ruse had succeeded with the crowd was evident. They, to a man, believed I had done my best, and already regarded me as hopelessly beaten. My chance of winning depended upon whether the smith, deluded into a like belief, should content himself with just beating my last throw, for, should he again exert his mighty strength to the uttermost, I felt that my case was indeed hopeless. It was with a beating heart, therefore, that I watched him take his place for the last throw. His face wore a confident smile, but nevertheless he took up the hammer with such a business-like air that my heart sank, and, feeling a touch upon my arm, I was glad to turn away. "'I be going to fetch a sponge and water,' said Simon. "'A sponge and water! Ah, likewise some vinegar. There's nothing like vinegar. And remember, the chin, a little to one side preferred.' "'So then you think I shall be beaten?' "'Why, I don't say that. But it's best to be prepared, aren't it, now?' And with a friendly nod the innkeeper turned away. In that same minute there arose another shout from the crowd as they greeted Black George's last throw, and Job, striding up, announced, 
Ninety-eight. Then, while the air still echoed with their plaudits, I stepped into the ring, and, catching up the hammer, swung it high above my head, and, at the full length of my arms, began to wheel it. The iron spun faster and faster, till, setting my teeth with the whole force of every fibre, every nerve and muscle of my body, I let it fly. The blood was throbbing at my temples and my breath coming fast as I watched its curving flight. And now all voices were hushed, so that the ring of the iron could be plainly heard as it struck the hard road, and all eyes watched Job as he began pacing towards us. As he drew nearer I could hear him counting to himself thus. Ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred, one hundred and one, one hundred and two, one hundred and two. Next moment, as it seemed to me, an inarticulate ancient was desperately trying to force me into my coat, wrong side first, and Simon was shaking my hand. "'You tricked me!' cried a voice, and, turning, I found Black George confronting me with clenched fists. "'And how did I trick you?' "'I could have chucked farther nor that.' Well, "'Then why didn't you?' "'Because I thought you was beat. I say you tricked me and I tell you the match was a fair one from start to finish. "'Put up your hands,' said the smith, advancing in a threatening manner. "'No,' said I. "'A bargain is a bargain.' And turning my back upon him, I fell to watching the man with the rake, who, not content with Job's word, was busily pacing out the distance for himself. "'Put up your hands,' repeated Black George hoarsely. "'For the last time, no.' said I over my shoulder. Strike me if you will, I went on, seeing him raise his fist. I shall not defend myself. But I tell you this, Black George, the first blow you strike will brand you coward and no honest man. Coward, is it? cried he, and with the word had seized me in a grip that crushed my flesh, and nigh swung me off my feet. Coward, is it? he repeated. Yes, said I. None but a coward would attack an unresisting man. So for a full minute we stood thus, staring into each other's eyes, and once again I saw the hairs of his golden beard curl up and outwards. What would have been the end, I cannot say, but there came upon the stillness the sound of flying footsteps. The crowd was burst asunder, and a girl stood before us, a tall, handsome girl with raven hair and great, flashing black eyes. "'Oh, you, George, think shame on yourself. Think shame on yourself, Black George. Look,' she cried, pointing a finger at him, "'look at the great strong man, as is a coward.' I felt the smith's grip relax. His arms dropped to his sides, while a deep red glow crept upon his cheeks till it was lost in the clustering curls of gleaming yellow hair. "'Why, Prue!' he began in a strangely altered voice, and stopped. The fire was gone from his eyes as they rested upon her, and he made a movement as though he would have reached out his hand to her, but checked himself. "'Why, Prue!' he said again, but choked suddenly, and, turning away, strode back towards his forge without another word. On he went, looking neither to right nor left, and I thought there was something infinitely woebegone and pitiful in the droop of his head. Now as I looked from his forlorn figure to the beautiful, flushed face of the girl, I saw her eyes grow wonderfully soft and sweet, and brim over with tears. And when Black George had betaken himself back to his smithy, she also turned, and, crossing swiftly to the inn, vanished through its open doorway. She the fine spirit of that daughter of yourn, Simon. Oh, a fine spirit he ever was, chuckled the ancient. Prue art afeard of Black George, never was, returned Simon. She could manage en, allus could. You'll mind she could allus tame Black George with a look, gaffer. <laughs> ah, she am a granddaughter to be proud on, be Prue, nodded the ancient, and proud I be too. What, said I, is she your daughter, Simon? 
Eh, for sure. And your granddaughter, Ancient? Aye, <laughs> that she be, that she be. Why, then, Simon must be your son. <laughs> son as ever was, nodded the old man. And a goodish shot he be, too. Oh, I've seen worse. And now, added Simon, come in, and you shall taste as fine a jug of ale as there be in all Kent. Wait, said the old man, laying his hand upon my arm. I've took to you, young chap. Took to you amazing. What might your name be? Peter, I answered. A good name, a fine name, nodded the old man. Peter, <laughs> Simon, said he, glancing from one to the other of us. Simon Peter! Minds me of the disciple of our blessed Lord it do. A fine name be Peter. So Peter I became to him thenceforth, and to the whole village. End of section 10《Section Eleven of the Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book One, Chapter Twenty Six, wherein I learn more concerning the ghost of the ruined hut. And after the ancient and Simon and I had very creditably emptied the jug between us, I rose to depart. Peter said the ancient, "Where be going?" Home said I. "'And where be that?' "'The cottage in the hollow,' said I. "'What? The haunted cottage?' he cried, staring. "'Yes,' I nodded. "'From what I saw of it, I think with a little repairing, it might suit me very well.' "'But the ghost?' cried the old man. "'Have you forgot the ghost?' "'Why, I never heard of a ghost really harming anyone yet,' I answered. "'Peter,' said Simon quietly, I wouldn't be too sure of that. I wouldn't go in either place myself. <laughs> once is enough for me. Simon, said I, what do you mean by once? Now when I asked him this, Simon breathed hard and shuffled uneasily in his chair. I mean, Peter, as I've heard him, he replied slowly. Heard him? I repeated incredulously. You? Are you sure? Sure as death, Peter. I've heard un a shriekin' and a groanin' to hisself, same as Gaffer has, and lots of others. Why, Lord bless ye, there'd be scarce a man in these parts but has heard un an one time or another. Eh, I've heard un, and seen un too, croaked the ancient excitedly. A girt tall think he be, with a horn on his head, and likewise a tail. Some might have thought twas the wandering man of the roads as I found hangin on de staple. Some of em do, but I knowed better. I knowed twere old Nick hisself, all flame and brimstone, and with a babby under his arm. A baby, I repeated. A babby as ever was, nodded the ancient. And you say you have heard it too, Simon, said I. Eh, nodded the innkeeper. I went down into the holler one evening, about six months ago, with Black Jarge, for we had a mind to knock the old place to pieces and get rid of the ghost that way. Well, charge ups with his hammer, and down comes the rotten old door with a crash. Charge had swung up his hammer for another blow when, all at once, there comes a scream. Here Simon shivered involuntarily and glanced uneasily over his shoulder and round the room. A scream? said I. Ah, nodded Simon. But twas worse nor that. Here he paused again, and looking closer at him, I was surprised to see that his broad, strong hands were shaking, and that his brow glistened with moisture. What was it like? I inquired, struck by his apparent weakness in one so hardy and full of health. Twere a scream with a bubble in it, he answered, speaking with an effort. Twere like somebody shrieking out with his throat choked up with blood. "'Jarge and me didn't wait for no more. We run. "'And as we run, it followed, groaning after us till we was out upon the road, "'and then it shrieked at us from the bushes. "'He card! It do make me cold to talk of it even now. "'Jarge left his best sledge behind him, and I my crowbar, "'and we never went back for them, nor never shall, no.' "'Here Simon paused to mop the grizzled hair at his temples.' 
I tell ye, Peter, that place aren't fit for no man at night. If so be you am a-looking for a bed, my chap, there's one you can have at the bowl, ready and willing. And gratis, added the ancient, tapping his snuff-box. Thank you, said I, both of you, for the offer, but I have a strange fancy to hear, and, if possible, see this ghost for myself. Don't you do it, admonished the ancient. So dark and lonesome as it be, don't ye do it, Peter. Why, ancient, said I, it isn't that I doubt your word, but my mind is set on the adventure. So if Simon will let me have three penny worth of candles, and some bread and meat, no matter what, I'll be off, for I should like to get there before dusk. Nodding gloomily, Simon rose and went out, whereupon the ancient leaned over and laid a yellow claw-like hand upon my arm. Peter, said he, Peter, I've took to your a knees at just a few inches taller, say a couple, and you'd be the very spit to what I were at your age, the very spit. Thank you, ancient, said I, laying my hand on his. Now, Peter, would be a hideous thing, a very hideous thing, if, when I come a-gatherin' watercress in the mornin', I should find you a-danglin' on to staple, cold and stiff, like t'other, or lying a cord with your throat cut. T'would be a hitches, a hitches thing, Peter. Oh, but, oh, t'would make a fine story in the tellin'. In a little while Simon returned with the candles, a tinder-box, and a parcel of bread and meat, for which he gloomily but persistently refused payment. Last of all he produced a small, brass-bound pistol, which he insisted on my taking. "'Not as it'll be much use again a ghost,' said he, with a gloomy shake of the head, "'but a pistol's a comfortable thing to have in a lonely place, especially if that place be very dark.' which last, if something illogical, may be none the less true. So, having shaken each by the hand, I bade them good night, and set off along the darkening road. Chapter 27, which tells how and in what manner I saw the ghost. Now as I went, my mind was greatly exercised as to a feasible explanation of what I had just heard, that a man so old as the ancient should see things, I could readily believe, by reason of his years, for great age is often subject to such hallucinations. But with Simon, a man in the prime of his life, it was a different matter altogether. That he had been absolutely sincere in his story I had read in his dilating eye, and the involuntary shiver that had passed over him while he spoke. Here indeed, though, I scouted all idea of supernatural agency there lay a mystery that piqued my curiosity not a little. Ghosts! Pshaw! What being endowed with a reasoning mind could allow himself to think, let alone believe in such folly? Ghosts! Fiddle-dee-dee, sir! Yet here, and all at once, like an enemy from the dark, old stories leaped at and seized me by the throat. Old tales of spectres grim and bloody, of goblins and haunted houses from whose dim desolation strange sounds would come, tales long since heard and forgot, till now. Ghosts! Why, the road was full of them. They crowded upon my heels, they peered over my shoulders. I felt them brush my elbows, and heard them gibbering at me from the shadows. And the sun was setting already. Ghosts! and why not? There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. Involuntarily I hastened my steps, but the sun had set ere I reached the hollow. Yes, the sun had set, and the great basin below me was already brimful of shadows which, as I watched, seemed to assume shapes, vast, nebulous, and constantly changing. Down there amid the purple gloom of the trees. Indeed, it looked an unholy place in the half-light, a pit framed for murders, and the safe hiding of tell-tale corpses, the very haunt of horrid goblins and spectres, grim and ghastly. So evilly did the place impress me that it needed an effort of will ere I could bring myself to descend the precipitous slope. Bats flitted to and fro across my path, 
now and then emitting their sharp, needle-like note, while, from somewhere in the dimness beyond, an owl hooted. By the time I reached the cottage it had fallen quite dark here in the hollow, though the light still lingered in the world above. So I took out my tinder-box, and one of the candles, which, after several failures, I succeeded in lighting, and, stepping into the cottage, began to look about me. The place was small, as I think I have before said, and comprised two rooms shut off from each other by a strong partition with a door midway. Lifting the candle, I glanced at the staple on which the builder of the cottage had choked out his life so many years ago, and, calling to mind the ancient's fierce desire to outlast it, I even reached up my hand and gave it a shake. But, despite the rust of years, the iron felt as strong and rigid as ever, so that it seemed the old man's innocent wish must go unsatisfied after all. The second room appeared much the same size as the first, and like it in all respects, till, looking upwards, I noticed a square trap-door in a corner, while, underneath, against the wall, hung a rough ladder. This I proceeded to lift down, and, mounting, cautiously lifted the trap. Holding the candle above my head to survey this chamber, or rather garret, the first object my eye encountered was a small tin pannikin, and beyond that a stone jar or demijohn. Upon closer inspection I found this last to be nearly full of water, quite sweet and fresh to the taste, which, of itself, was sufficient evidence that someone had been here very lately. I now observed a bundle of hay in one corner which had clearly served for a bed, beside which were a cracked mug, a tin plate, a pair of shoes, and an object I took to be part of a flute or wind instrument of some kind. But what particularly excited my interest were the shoes, which had evidently seen long and hard service, for they were much worn and had been roughly patched here and there. Very big they were, and somewhat clumsy, thick-soled, and square of toe, and with a pair of enormous silver buckles. These evidences led me to believe that whoever had been here before was likely to return, and, not doubting that this must be he who had played the part of ghost so well, I determined to be ready for him. So, leaving all things as I found them, I descended, and, having closed the trap, hung up the ladder as I had found it. In the first of the rooms there was a rough fireplace built into one corner, and as the air struck somewhat damp and chill, I went out and gathered a quantity of twigs and dry wood, and had soon built a cheerful, crackling fire. I now set about collecting armfuls of dry leaves which I piled against the wall for a bed. By the time this was completed to my satisfaction, the moon was peeping above the tree-tops, filling the hollow with far-flung shadows. I now lay down upon my leafy couch, and fell to watching the fire, and listening to the small, soft song of the brook outside. In the opposite wall was a window, the glass of which was long since gone, through which I could see a square of sky, and the glittering belt of Orion. My eyes wandered from this to the glow of the fire many times, but gradually my head grew heavier and heavier, until at length the stars became confused with the winking sparks upon the hearth, and the last that I remember was that the crackle of the fire sounded strangely like the voice of the ancient croaking. A hideous thing, Peter! A hideous thing! I must have slept for an hour, or nearer two, for the room was dark, save for a few glowing embers on the hearth, and the faint light of the stars at the window, when I suddenly sat bolt upright with every tingling nerve straining as if to catch something which had, but that very moment, eluded me. I was yet wondering what this could be when, from somewhere close outside the cottage, there rose a sudden cry, hideous and appalling a long, drawn-out, bubbling scream, no other words can describe it, that died slowly down to a wail, only to rise again higher and higher, till it seemed to pierce my very brain. Then all at once it was gone, and silence rushed in upon me, a silence 
fraught with fear and horror unimaginable. I lay rigid, the blood in my veins jumping with every throb of my heart, till it seemed to shake me from head to foot, and when the cry began again, deep and hoarse at first, but rising, rising until the air thrilled with a scream such as no earthly lips could utter. Now the light at the window grew stronger and stronger, and all at once a feeble shaft of moonlight crept across the floor. I was watching this most welcome beam when it was again obscured by a something indefinable at first, but which I gradually made out to be very like a human head peering in at me. But if this was so, it seemed a head hideously misshapen. And there, sure enough, rising from the brow, was a long, pointed horn. As I lay motionless, staring at this thing, my hand, by some most fortunate chance, encountered the pistol in my pocket, and from the very depths of my soul I poured benedictions upon the honest head of Simon the innkeeper, for its very contact seemed to restore my benumbed faculties. With a single bound I was upon my feet, and had the weapon leveled at the window. Speak! said I. Speak, or I'll shoot! There was a moment of tingling suspense, and then, Oh, man, didn't do that, said a voice. Then come in and show yourself. Herewith the head incontinently disappeared. There was the sound of a heavy step, and a tall figure loomed in the doorway. Wait, said I, as, fumbling about, I presently found tinderbox and candle, having lighted which I turned and beheld a man, an exceedingly tall man, clad in the full habit of a Scottish Highlander. By his side hung a long, straight, basket-hilted sword. Beneath one arm he carried a bagpipe, while upon his head was not a horn, but a Scots bonnet with a long eagle's feather. "'Oh, man,' said he, eyeing me with a somewhat wry smile, "'I'm just thinking you're no afeard of bogus, whatever.'" Chapter Twenty Eight the Highland Piper. "'Who are you?' said I, in no very gentle tone. "'Don't know's my name, sir, and if you had an eye for the tartan, you'd ken I was a Stuart. And what do you want here, Donald Stuart? The vera question should be asking yourself. What cares you to come gawkin' and spearin' aboot here at such an hour?' "'It is my intention to live here for the future,' said I. "'Hoot, hoot! Ye'll be no mean in it. But I do mean it. Hey, man, but you maun ken the place is no canny, what with pixies and warlocks and kelpies forby. Indeed, they told me it was haunted, but I determined to see for myself. Weel, well, I am glad to find it haunted by nothing worse than a wandering Scots piper. The Highlander smiled his wry smile, and taking out a snuff-box, inhaled a pinch, regarding me the while. "'Ye're the first as ever stayed, after they'd heard the first bit squeaky, to find out if twere a real bogey or no. But how in the world did you make such awful sounds?' "'I'm thinking it's the bit squeaky ye'll be meanin'?' he inquired. "'Yes. How did you do it?' "'Oh, it's choose the pipes,' he answered, patting them affectionately. "'Will I show you the new?' "'Pray do,' said I. Hereupon he set the mouthpiece to his lips, inflated the bag, stopped the vents with his fingers, and immediately the air vibrated with the bubbling scream I have already attempted to describe. "'Oh, man!' he exclaimed, laying the still groaning instrument gently aside. "'Oh, man! Is it no just wonderful?' "'But what has been your object in terrifying people out of their wits in this manner?' "'Sir, it's on account of the snuff.' "'Snuff? Just that?' snuff said i again what do you mean the piper smiled again a slow smile that seemingly dawned only to vanish again it was indeed if i may so express it a grave and solemn smile and his nearest approach to mirth for not once in the days which followed did i ever see him give vent to a laugh i here also take the opportunity to say that i have greatly modified his speech in the writing for it was so broad that I had much ado to grasp his meaning at times. 
the piper smiled then and unwinding the plaid from his shoulder spread it upon the floor and sat down you man ken he began that i have no love for the snuff and snuff is unco expensive in these parts well said i you maun ken in the second place that my brother alan can abide the snuff your brother alan said i wondering my brother alan he nodded gravely but what of him what has he to do with man by the wee i'm coming to that well, go on then said i i'm listening well i'd hae ye taken i'm a brow bonny piper and my brother alan he's a bonny piper too no sic a fair ground piper as me being somewhat uncertain with his warblers ye can but a bonny piper whatever a will maybe a year or sing i fell in love with a lassie which would have been a richt if my brother alan hadna fallen in love with her too so that she poor lassie didn't ken which to take donald says alan can you no love another lassie she can no marry the twa o us that's sure then alan says i we'll just play for her which i think ill own was a grand idee only the lassie couldna just make up her mind which o us piped the best so the end of it was we agreed my brother alan and i to pipe her way through england for a year and the man what came back with a maist sealer should wed the lassie and a very fair proposal said i but whist man juiced here's where we come to the snuff for look ye every time i bought a paper o snuff i minded me that my brother alan not tackin it himself was so much siller to the good and oh man it used to grieve me sir till one day i lighted on this bit hoosie well said i what do you not see it no indeed i answered hey man me brither alan doesna buy the snuff but he must hae a roof to shelter him in a bed to lay in a nights and pay for it too ye ken four pence or a bobby or a shillin as the case may be whilst here i have bathed for the taken and oh man many's the nicht i slept the sweeter for thinking of that saxpence or shillin that alan's a parting with for a bed little better than mine so wish for to keep this bit hoosy to myself seeing twas haunted as they call it i just to keep up the illusion on account of trampers wandering gypsies and sich like dirty tykes <laughs> eh but twas fair ground to see him runnin away as if the devil were after him spirit back o'er their shoulders and by reason of a bit squeaky o the pipes here and so sir ye ha it i now proceeded to build and relight the fire during which the scot drew a packet of bread and cheese from his sporran together with a flask which having uncorked he held out to me with one word whisky thank you donald but i rarely drink anything stronger than ale said i a will said he if you winna you winna and there's but a wee drappy left to be sure whereupon after two or three generous gulps he addressed himself to his bread and cheese and i following his example took out the edibles simon had provided and you're minded to bide here you tell me he inquired after a while yes i nodded but that need not interfere with you two can live here as easily as one and now that i have had a good look at you i think we might get along very well together sir said he solemnly my race is royal i am a stuart here's a stuart's hand and he reached out his hand to me across the hearth with a gesture that was full of a reposeful dignity indeed i never remember to have seen donald anything but dignified how do you find life in these parts i inquired indifferent sir very indifferent to be sure at fairs and sick like i'm often had as much as ten shillin in my bonnet at a time but it's just the kilties that draw em they had no real love for the pipes whatever a rantin real pleases em well enough but eh hey, they hae no hankerin for the good music that is a question open to argument donald said i can any one play real music on a bagpipe think you sir returned the scot setting down the empty flask and frowning darkly at the fire the pipes is the king of our instruments tis the sweetest the truest the oldest whatever 
"'True, it is very old,' said I thoughtfully. "'It was known, I believe, to the Greeks, "'and we find mention of it in the Latin as Tibia Utricularia. "'Suetonius tells us that Nero promised to appear publicly as a bagpiper. "'Then, too, Chaucer's Miller played a bagpipe, "'and Shakespeare frequently mentions the drone of a Lincolnshire bagpipe. "'Yes, it is certainly a very old and, I think, a very barbarous instrument.' "'Hoot, hoot! The man talks like a muckle fool!' said Donald, nodding to the fire. "'For instance,' I continued, "'there can be no comparison between a bagpipe and a fiddle, say.' "'A fiddle!' exclaimed Donald in accents of withering scorn, and still addressing the fire. "'You can just tell him to gang to the devil with his fiddle!' Music is, I take it, the expression of one's mood or thought, a dream translated into sound, said I thoughtfully. Therefore, have you ever heard the pipes? Why, yes, but long ago. Then, said Donald, you shall just hear em again. So saying, he wiped his mouth, took up his instrument, and began slowly inflating it. Then, all at once, from drones and chanter, there rushed forth such a flood of melody as seemed to sweep me away upon its tide. First I seemed to hear a roar of wind through desolate glens, a moan of trees, and a rush of sounding waters. Yet softly, softly, there rises above the flood of sound a little rippling melody which comes and goes, and comes again, growing ever sweeter with repetition. And now the roar of wind is changed to the swing of marching feet, the tread of a mighty host whose step is strong and free. And, lo, they are singing as they march, and the song is bold and wild, wild, wild. Again and again, beneath the song, beneath the rhythm of marching feet, the melody rises, very sweet but infinitely sad, like a silver pipe or an angel's voice tremulous with tears. Once again the theme changes, and it is battle, and death sudden and sharp. There is the rush and shock of charging ranks, and the surge and tumult of conflict, above whose thunder, loud and clear and shrill, like some battle-cry, the melody swells, one moment triumphant, and the next lost again. But the thunder rolls away, distant and more distant, the day is lost and won. But sudden and clear the melody rings out once more, fuller now, richer and complete. The silver pipe has become a golden trumpet. And yet, what sorrow, what anguish unspeakable rings through it, the weeping and wailing of a nation! So the melody sinks slowly to die away in one long-drawn minor note, and Donald is looking across at me with his grave smile, and I will admit both his face and figure are sadly blurred. Donald, said I after a little, Donald, I will never speak against the pipes again. They are indeed the king of all instruments, played as you play them. Oh, hey! "'I'm a bonny piper, I'll no deny it,' he answered. "'I'm glad ye like it, for, sassanash though ye be, it proves ye hae the music. "'Tis a bit pibroch I made to Wooly Wallace, him as the damned did sassanach murdered. "'Black be their fa. "'Aweel, it was done afore your time or mine, so good nicht to ye, Sotheran.' "'Saying which, he rose, saluted me stiffly, and stalked majestically to bed.' End of section 11section 12 of the broad highway by Geoffrey Farnell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by John leader book 1 chapter 29 how black george and i shook hands the world was full of sunshine the blithe song of birds and the sweet pure breath of waking flowers as I rose next morning, and, coming to the stream, threw myself down beside it, and plunged my hands and arms and head into the limpid water whose contact seemed to fill me with a wondrous gladness in keeping with the world about me. In a little while I rose, with the water dripping from me, and, having made shift to dry myself upon my neckcloth, nothing else being available, returned to the cottage. Above my head I could hear a gentle sound, rising and falling with a rhythmic measure, that told me Donald still slept. So, clapping on my hat and coat, 
I started out to my first day's work at the forge, breakfastless, for the good and sufficient reason that there was none to be had, but full of the glad pure beauty of the morning. And I bethought me of the old psalmist's deathless words, Though sorrow endure for a night, yet joy cometh in the morning. Brave, true words, which shall go ringing down the ages to bear hope and consolation to many a wearied, troubled soul. For now, as I climbed the steep path where bats had hovered last night, and turned to look back at the pit which had seemed a place of horror, behold, it was become a very paradise of quivering green, spangled with myriad jewels where the dew yet clung. Indeed, if any man would experience the full ecstasy of being alive, the joie de vivre, as the French have it, let him go out into the early morning, when the sun is young, and look about him with a seeing eye. So, in a little while, with the golden song of a blackbird in my ears, I turned villagewards, very hungry, yet nevertheless content. Long before I reached the smithy I could hear the ring of Black George's hammer, though the village was not yet astir, and it was with some trepidation as to my reception that I approached the open doorway. There he stood, busy at his anvil, goodly to look upon in his bare-armed might, and with the sun shining in his yellow hair, a veritable son of Anak. He might have been some hero or demigod come back from that dim age when angels wooed the daughters of men rather than a village blacksmith, and a very sulky one at that for though he must have been aware of my presence, he never glanced up or gave the slightest sign of welcome or the reverse. Now, as I watched, I noticed a certain slowness, a heaviness in all his movements, together with a listless, slipshod air which, I judged, was very foreign to him. Moreover, as he worked, I thought he hung his head lower than was quite necessary. George! George went on hammering. George, said I again. He raised the hammer for another stroke, hesitated, then lifted his head with a jerk, and immediately I knew why he had avoided my eye. What do you want with me? I have come for two reasons, said I. One is to begin work. Then you'd best go away again, he broke in. You'll get no work here. And the second, I went on, is to offer you my hand. Will you take it, George, and let bygones be bygones? No! he burst out vehemently. No, I tell ye. Ye think to come here and crow o'er me, cause ye, because ye beat me by a trick, and because ye heard her. His voice broke, and, dropping his hammer, he turned his back upon me. Called me coward, she did. He went on after a little while. You heard her. They all heard her. I've been a danged fool, he said, more as if speaking his thoughts aloud than addressing me. But a man can't help loving a lass, like Prue, and when he loves he can't help hoping. I've hoped these three years and more, and last night she called me coward. Something bright and glistening splashed down upon the anvil, and there ensued a silence broken only by the piping of the birds and the stirring of the leaves outside. "'A fool I be,' said Black George at last, shaking his head. "'No kind of man for the likes of her. Too big I be, and rough. And yet, if she'd only given me the chance—' Again there fell a silence wherein, mingled with the bird chorus, came the tap-tapping of a stick upon the hard road and the sound of approaching footsteps, whereupon George seized the handle of the bellows, and fell to blowing the fire vigorously. Yet once I saw him draw the back of his hand across his eyes with a quick, furtive gesture. A moment after, the ancient appeared, a quaint, befrocked figure, framed in the yawning doorway and backed by the glory of the morning. He stood a while to lean upon his stick and peer about, his old eyes still dazzled by the sunlight he had just left, owing to which he failed to see me where I sat in the shadow of the forge. "'Mornin', George,' said he, with his quick, bright nod. The smith's scowl was blacker and his deep voice gruffer than usual as he returned the greeting, but the old man seemed to heed it not at all, but, taking his snuff-box from the lining of his tall, broad-brimmed hat, 
its usual abiding place, he opened it with his most important air. Charge, said he. I'm thinking you'd better take Joe back to strike for you again if you'm going to mend to old screen. What do you mean? growled Black George. Because, continued the old man, gathering a pinch of snuff with great deliberation, because, Charge, the young feller is beat ye at the throwin', him is was to have worked for ye at his own price. Be dead. What? cried Black George, starting. Dead? nodded the old man. A corpy be, eh? Such a fine promising young chap, and now a corp. Here the ancient nodded solemnly again, three times, and inhaled his pinch of snuff with great apparent zest and enjoyment. Why, began the amazed George, what? And broke off to stare open-mouthed. Last night, as ever was, continued the old man. He went down to the haunted cottage. Twarn't no matter o' use trying to turn him, no, not if I'd gone down to him or my marrow bones. He were that set on it. So off he goes bout sundown to sleep in the haunted cottage i knows charge cause i followed un and seen for myself so now i'm a goin down to find his corp he had reached thus far when his eye accustomed to the shadows chancing to meet mine he uttered a gasp and stood staring at me with dropped jaw peter he stammered at last peter be that you peter to be sure it is, said I. Bean't ye dead, then? I never felt more full of life. But ye slept in the haunted cottage last night. Yes. But, but, the ghost, Peter, is a wandering Scotsman. Why, then I can't go down and find your corp after all? <laughs> I fear not, Ancient. The old man slowly closed his snuff-box, shaking his head as he did so. "'Ah, oh, well, I won't blame you, Peter,' said he magnanimously. "'It be not your fault, lad, no. But what's come of the ghost?' "'The ghost,' I answered, "'is nothing more dreadful than a wandering Scotsman.' "'Scotsman!' exclaimed the Ancient sharply. "'Scotsman!' "'Yes, Ancient.' You amazed, Peter. Ha, amazed ye be. What aren't I heard and moaning and groaning to herself? Ah, and twittering too. As to that, said I, those shrieks and howls he made with his bagpipe. Very easy for a skilled player such as he. Someone was drawing water from a well across the road, for I heard the rattle of the bucket, and the creak of the winch in the pause which now ensued, during which the ancient, propped upon his stick, surveyed me with an expression that was not exactly anger, nor contempt, nor sorrow, and yet something of all three. At length he sighed, and shook his head at me mournfully. "'Peter,' said he, "'Peter, I didn't think as you'd try to take advantage of an old man with a tale the like of that. Such a very, very old man, Peter. Such an old, old man.' "'But I assure you it's the truth,' said I earnestly. "'Peter, I've seen Scotchmen afore now,' said he, with a reproachful look. "'Ah, oh, that I have, many's the time, and Scotchmen don't go about with tails, nor yet with horns on their heads. Leastways I've never seen one as did. And, Peter, I know what a bagpipe is. I've heard him often and often. Squeak they do, yes. But a squeak be it a scream, Peter.' nor yet a groan, no. Having delivered himself of which the ancient shook his head at me again, and, turning his back, hobbled away. When I turned to look at George, it was to find him regarding me with a very strange expression. Sir, said he ponderously, did you sleep in that haunted cottage last night? Yes, though as I have tried to explain, and unsuccessfully it seems, it is haunted by nothing more alarming than a Scots piper. Sir, said George in the same slow, heavy way, I couldn't go in either place myself, especially after dark. I'd be a, I'd be a feared to. I did go once, and then not alone, and, and I ran away. Sir, you'm a better man than me. 
you done what I durst do. Sir, if so be as you am in the same mind about it, I should like to... to shake your hand. So there, across the anvil which was to link our lives together thenceforth, Black George and I clasped hands, looking into each other's eyes. George, said I at last, I've had no breakfast. Nor I, said George. And I'm mightily hungry. <laughs> so am I, said George. Then come, let us eat. And I turned to the door. Why, so we will but not at the bowl. She be there. Come to my cottage. It be close by, that is, if you care to, sir. With all my heart, said I, and my name is Peter. What do you say to ham and eggs, Peter? Ham and eggs will be most excellent, said I. Chapter 30, in which I forswear myself, and am accused of possessing the evil eye. Smithing is a sturdy, albeit a very black art, yet its black is a good honest black, very easily washed off, which is more than can be said for many other trades, arts, and professions. Yes, a fine free manly art is smithing, and those who labor at the forge would seem, necessarily, to reflect these virtues. Since old Tubal Cain first taught man how to work in brass and iron, who ever heard of a sneaking, mean-spirited, cowardly blacksmith? To find such an one were as hard a matter as to discover the fourth dimension, methinks, or the carcass of a dead donkey. Your true blacksmith is usually a strong man, something bowed of shoulder, perhaps, a man slow of speech, bold of eye, kindly of thought, and, lastly, simple-hearted. Riches, genius, power. All are fair things, yet riches is never satisfied. Power is ever upon the wing, and when was genius ever happy? But as for this divine gift of simpleness of heart, who shall say it is not the best of all? Black George himself was no exception to his kind. What wonder was it, then, that as the days lengthened into weeks, my liking for him ripened into friendship? To us sometimes lonely voyagers upon this broad highway of life, journeying on, perchance through desolate places, yet hoping and dreaming ever of a glorious beyond, how sweet and how blessed a thing it is to meet some fellow wayfarer, and find in him a friend, honest and loyal and brave, to walk with us in the sun, whose voice may comfort us in the shadow, whose hand is stretched out to us in the difficult places to aid us, or be aided. Indeed, I say again, it is a blessed thing, for though the way is sometimes very long, such meetings and friendships be very few and far between. So, as I say, there came such friendship between Black George and myself, and I found him a man, strong, simple, and lovable, and as such I honor him to this day. The ancient, on the contrary, seemed to have set me in his black books. He would no longer sit with me over a tankard outside the bowl of an evening, nor look in at the forge with a cheery nod and word, as had been his wont. He seemed rather to shun my society, and, if I did meet him by chance, would treat me with the frigid dignity of a grand seigneur. Indeed, the haughtiest duke that ever rolled in his chariot is far less proud than your plain English rustic, and far less difficult to propitiate. Thus, though I had once had the temerity to question him as to his altered treatment of me, the once had sufficed. He was sitting, I remember, on the bench before the bull, his hands crossed upon his stick, and his chin resting upon his hands. Peter! he had answered, regarding me with a terrible eye. Peter, I, I be disappointed in ye. But upon rising, he had rapped loudly upon his snuff-box, and hobbled stiffly away. And that ended the matter, so far as I was concerned, though, to be sure, Simon had interceded in my behalf with no better success, and thus I was still left wondering. One day, however, as George and I were hard at work, I became aware of someone standing in the doorway behind me, but at first paid no heed. 
for it was become the custom for folk to come to look at the man who lived all alone in the haunted cottage. So, as I say, I worked on heedlessly. Peter, said a voice at last, and, turning, I beheld the old man leaning upon his stick, and regarding me beneath his lowered brows. Why, ancient! I exclaimed, and held out my hand. But he checked me with a gesture, and fumblingly took out his snuff-box. Peter, said he, fixing me with his eye, were it a Scotchman, or were it not? Why, to be sure it was, I answered, a Scotch piper, as I told you, and Peter, said the ancient, tapping his snuff-box, it weren't no ghost, then, eh or no? No, said I, nothing but a Peter, said the ancient, nodding solemnly. Peter, I hate ye, and turning sharp about, he tottered away upon his stick. So, that's it, said I, staring after the old man's retreating figure. Why, you see, said George, somewhat diffidently, you see, Peter, Gaffer, be so old, and all his friends be dead, and he've come to look on this here ghost as belonging to him almost. Loves to sit and tell about it, he do. It be all he've got left to live for, as you might say. And now you've been and gone, and said as there beant no ghost after all, do you see? Ah, yes, I see, I nodded, I see. But you don't still believe in this ghost, do you, George? No, not exactly, answered George, hesitating upon the word. I can't say as I believe exactly, and yet, Lord, how should I know? Then you do still believe in the ghost? Why, you see, Peter, we do know as a man hung himself there, cause Gaffer found him. Likewise, I've heard it scream. But as for believing in it, since you say contrary-wise, why, how should I know? But, but why should I deny it, George? Why should I tell you all of a Scotsman? Why, you see, Peter, said George in his heavy way, you be such a strange sort of chap. George, said I, let us get back to work. Yet in a little while I set aside the hammer and turned to the door. Peter, queer be going. To try and make my peace with the ancient, I answered, and forthwith crossed the road to the bull. But with my foot on the step I paused, arrested by the sound of voices and laughter within the tap, and loudest of all was the voice of the pseudo-blacksmith Job. If I were only a bit younger, the ancient was saying. Now, peeping in through the casement, a glance at his dejected attitude and the blatant bearing of the others explained to me the situation then and there. Ah, but you ain't, retorted old Amos. You am a old, old man, and getting older with every tick of the clock you be, and getting mazed like with years. Ha, ha, laughed Job and the five or six others. Oh, you, Job, if, if my boy Simon were here, he'd pitch you out into the road, so he would, same as Black George done, quavered the ancient. Perhaps, Gaffer, perhaps, returned Job. But I says again, I believe what Peter says, and I don't believe there never was no ghost at all. Hey, lad, but I tell ye there was. I seedin, cried the old man eagerly. Seedin with these two eyes, many's the time. You, Joel Amos, you've heard in a moanin' and a groanin'. You believe as I seedin now, don't ye now? Come! Hee <laughs> hee! chuckled old Amos. I don't know if I do, Gaffer. You see, you am getting that old. But I did, I did. Oh, you chaps, I tell ye I did. You am getting old, Gaffer, repeated Amos, dwelling upon the theme with great unction. Very, very old. But so strong as a bull I be, added the ancient, trying manfully to steady the quaver in his voice. Ha, oh, oh, ha, laughed Job and the others, while old Amos chuckled shrilly again. But I tell ye I did see him, and I seed him plain as plain, quavered the ancient in sudden distress. Old Nick it were, with horns and a tail. Why, Peter told us twere only a Scottish man with a bagpipe, returned Job. He for sure, nodded old Amos, so he did. 
a lie it be a lie a lie cried the ancient twere old nick i see un plain as i see you why you see you am getting dreffle old and helpless gaffer chuckled old amos again <laughs> and your eyes plays tricks with you ah to be sure they do added job whereupon old amos chuckled so much that he was taken by a violent fit of coughing oh you chaps you as i've seen grown up from babies aren't there one o' you to tack a old man's word and believe as i seen un the cracked old voice sounded more broken than usual and i saw a tear crawling slowly down the ancient's furrowed cheek nobody answered and there fell a silence broken only by the shuffle and scrape of heavy boots and the setting down of tankards why you see gaffer said job at last there's been a lot of talk of this here ghost and some has even said as they eared it but come to think on it nobody's never laid eyes on it but you so oh, there you were wrong my fellow said i stepping into the room i also have seen it you exclaimed job while half a dozen pairs of eyes stared at me in slow wonderment oh, certainly i have but you said it were a scotchman wi a bad pipe i heard ye we all did <laughs> and believed it like fools peter cried the ancient rising up out of his chair peter do ye mean it to be sure i do do ye mean it were a ghost peter do ye why of course it was i nodded a ghost or, or the devil himself hoof horns tail and all to say nothing of the fire and brimstone peter said the ancient straightening his bent old back proudly oh peter tell him i'm a man of truth and no liar you tell him peter oh they know that said i they know it without my telling them ancient but said job staring at me aghast do you mean to say as you live in a place as is haunted by the the devil hisself oh lord bless ye cried the old man laying his hand upon my arm peter don't mind old nick no more than i do peter aren't afraid of him cause why cause he have a clean heart of peter you don't mind old nick do we lad not in the least said i whereupon those nearest instinctively shrank farther from me while old amos rose and shuffled towards the door i've heard of folk selling theirselves to the devil afore now said he you be a danged fool joel amos exclaimed the ancient angrily fool or no i never see a chap with such a terrible dark-looking face afore and with such eyes so black and sharp and piercing as needles they be ah goes through a man like two gimblets they do now as he spoke old amos stretched out one arm toward me with his first and second fingers crossed which fingers he now opened wide apart making what i believe is called the horns and an infallible safeguard against this particular form of evil it's the evil eye said he in a half whisper the evil eye and turning about betook himself away one by one the others followed and as they passed me each man averted his eyes and i saw that each had his fingers crossed so it came to pass that i was thenceforward regarded askance if not openly avoided by the whole village with the exception of simon and the ancient as one in league with the devil and possessed of the evil eye chapter thirty one in which donald bids me farewell halcyon days my masters happy carefree halcyon days to waken to the glory of a summer's morning and shaking off dull sleep like a mantle to stride out into a world all green and gold breathing a fragrant air laden with sweet earthy smells to plunge within the clear cool waters of the brook whose magic seemed to fill one's blood with added life and lust of living anon with gargantuan appetite to sit and eat until even donald would fall a marvelling and so through shady coppice and sunny meadow betimes to work halcyon days my masters happy carefree halcyon days with the ringing hammers the dancing sparks mounting upon the smoke the sweat the toil yet all lightened with laugh and song and good fellowship and then the labor done the fire dead 
Black George to his lonely cottage, and I to the bowl, there to sit between Simon and the ancient, waited upon by the dexterous hands of sweet-eyed prudence. What mighty rounds of juicy beef washed down by draughts of good brown ale! What pies and puddings prepared by those same slender, dexterous hands! And later, pipe in mouth, what grave discussions upon men and things, peace and war, the dead and the living, the rise and fall of nations, and Simon's new litter of pigs. At last, the good nights being said, Homer through the twilight lanes, often pausing to look upon the shadowy woods, to watch some star, or hearken to the mournful note of a night-jar, soft with distance. What wonder if, at this time, my earlier dreams and ambitions faded from my ken! What wonder that Petronius Arbiter and the jolly Sieur de Brantome lay neglected in my dusty knapsack! Go to, Petronius, go to! How stale, flat, and unprofitable were all thy vaunted pleasures compared with mine! Alas, for thy noble intellect draggled in the mire to pander to an imperial swine, and for all thy power and wise statecraft which yet could not save thee from untimely death. O thou, Brantome, old gossip, with all thy scandalous stories of ladies, always and ever très belle et fort honnête, couldst not find time among them, all to note the glories of the world wherein they lived, and moved, and had their fort honnête being. But let it not be thought my leisure hours were passed in idle dreaming and luxurious ease. On the contrary, I had, with much ado, rethatched the broken roof of my cottage as well as I might, mended the chimney, fitted glass to the casements, and a new door upon its hinges. This last was somewhat clumsily contrived, I grant you, and of a vasty strength quite unnecessary. Yet a very excellent door I considered it, nevertheless. Having thus rendered my cottage weatherproof, I next turned my attention to furnishing it, to which end I, in turn, and with infinite labor, constructed a bedstead, two elbow chairs, and a table, all to the profound disgust of Donald, who would by no means abide the rasp of my saw, so that, reaching for his pipes, he would fill the air with eldritch shrieks and groans, or drown me in a torrent of martial melody. It was about this time, that is to say, my second bedstead was nearing completion, and I was seriously considering the building of a press with cupboards to hold my crockery, also a shelf for my books, when, chancing to return home somewhat earlier than usual, I was surprised to see Donald sitting upon the bench I had set up beside the door, polishing the buckles of that identical pair of square-toed shoes that had once so piqued my curiosity. As I approached, he rose, and came to meet me with the brogues in his hand. "'Man, Peter,' said he, "'I maun Jewish to be gangin.' "'Going?' I repeated. "'Going where?' "'Back to Glenure. The year's a-most up, you ken, and I wadna hae my brother Al in afore me with the lassie, for by he's an unco bra and sonsy man, you ken, and the lassie's mind is aye a kittle thing.' True, I answered, what little I know of woman would lead me to suppose so, and yet, uh, heaven knows, I shall be sorry to lose you, Donald. Eh, I ken that fine, and ye'll be unco lonesome without me and the pipes, I'm thinking. <laughs> Very. Eh, Peter, man, if it wasna for the lassie, I'd no hae the heart to leave ye. You'll no be forgetting the woolly wallace lament? Oh, never, said I. Oh, man, Peter, it's in my mind you'll no hear sick piping again, for by there's nae man, Highlander nor Lowlander, has just the trick of the warblers like me, and it's no vera like we shall air meet again i this war, old man, Peter. But I'll aye think o' ye away there in Glenure when I play the woolly wallace bit tune. I'll aye think o' ye, Peter, man. After this we stood a while, staring past each other into the deepening shadows. Peter, said he at last, it's no a very genteel present to be making ye, I doot. And he held up the battered shoes. They're uncle-worn, and with a clout here and there, ye'll notice. 
but the buckles are good sealer, and hae nothing else to give ye. Eh, man, but it's many a weary mile I've marched in these at the head of the ninety-second, and it's mony a stark fact they've been through. Vittoria, Salamanca, Tervera, Te Quatre Bras, and Waterloo. Tack em, Peter, tack em. To mind ye sometimes a Donald Stuart. And now, give us a grip of your hand. Good keep ye, Peter, man. So saying, he thrust the brogues upon me, caught and squeezed my hand, and, turning sharp about, strode away through the shadows, his kilt swaying, and tartan streaming gallantly. And presently I went and sat me down upon the bench beside the door, with the war-worn shoes upon my knee. Suddenly, as I sat there, faint and fainter with distance, and unutterably sad, came the slow, sweet music of Donald's pipes playing the Wallace Lament. Softly the melody rose and fell, until it died away in one long-drawn, wailing note. Now, as it ended, I rose and uncovered my head, for I knew this was Donald's last farewell. Much more I might have told of this strange yet lovable man who was by turns the scarred soldier, full of stirring tales of camp and battlefield, the mischievous child delighting in tricks and rogueries of all sorts, and the stately Highland gentleman. Many wild legends he told me of his native glens, with strange tales of the second sight, but here, perforce, must be no place for such. So here, then, I leave Donald, and hurry on with my narrative. End of section 12《セクション13 of the Broad Highway by Jeffrey Farnell。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by John Leader。Book 1。Chapter 32。In which this first book begins to draw to a close。Strike, ding, ding, strike, ding, ding。The iron glows, and loveth good blows。As fire doth bellows, strike, ding, ding。Out beyond the smithy door, a solitary star twinkles low down in the night sky, like some great jewel. But we have no time for star-gazing, Black George and I, for to-night we are at work on the old church screen, which must be finished to-morrow. And so the bellows roar hoarsely, the hammers clang, and the sparks fly, while the sooty face of Black George, now in shadow, now illumined by the fire, seems like the face of some fire-god or salamander. In the corner, perched securely out of reach of stray sparks, sits the ancient, snuff-box in hand, as usual. To my mind, a forge is at its best by night, for in the red, fiery glow, the blackened walls, the shining anvil, and the smith himself, bare-armed and bare of chest, are all magically transfigured, while, in the hush of night, the drone of the bellows sounds more impressive, the stroke of the hammers more sonorous and musical, and the flying sparks mark plainly their individual courses ere they vanish. I stand, feet well apart, and swing the great sledge to whose diapason George's hand-hammer beats a tinkling melody, coming in after each stroke with a ring and clash exact and true, as is, and has been, the way of masters of the smithing craft all the world over from time immemorial. George, said I, during a momentary lull, leaning my hands upon the long hammer-shaft, you don't sing. No, Peter. And why not? I think, Peter. But surely you can both think and sing, George? Not always, Peter. What's your trouble, George? Oh, no trouble, Peter, said he, above the roar of the bellows. Well, then sing, George. Hey, George, sing, nodded the ancient. Tis a poor art is never a jices, and that's in the scriptures, so sing, George. George did not answer, but, with a turn of his mighty wrist, drew the glowing iron from the fire. And once more the sparks fly, the air is full of the clink of hammers, and the deep-throated song of the anvil, in which even the ancient joins, in a voice somewhat quavery, 
and generally a note or two behind, but with great gusto and good will notwithstanding. Strike, ding, ding, strike, ding, ding. In the middle of which I was aware of one entering to us, and presently, turning round, espied Prudence with a great basket on her arm. Hereupon hammers were thrown aside, and we straightened our backs, for in that basket was our supper. Very fair and sweet Prudence looked, lithe and vigorous, and straight as a young poplar, with her shining black hair curling into little tight rings about her ears, and with great shy eyes and red, red mouth. Surely a man might seek very far ere he found such another maid as this brown-cheeked, black-eyed village beauty. "'Good evening, Mr. Peter.' said she, dropping me a courtesy with a grace that could not have been surpassed by any duchess in the land. But as for poor George, she did not even notice him. Neither did he raise his curly head nor glance toward her. "'You come just when you are most needed, Prudence,' said I, relieving her of the heavy basket, "'for here be two hungry men.' Three, broke in the ancient. "'So hungry as a lion I be!' Three hungry men, Prudence, who have been hearkening for your step this half-hour and more. Quoth Prudence shyly, For the sake of my basket? Eh, for sure, croaked the ancient. So ravenous as a tiger I be. No, said I, shaking my head. Basket or no basket, you are equally welcome, Prudence. How say you, George? But George only mumbled in his beard. The ancient and I now set to work putting up an extemporized table, but as for George, he stood staring down moodily into the yet glowing embers of the forge. Having put up the table, I crossed to where Prudence was busy unpacking her basket. Prudence, said I, are you still at odds with George? Prudence nodded. But, said I, he is such a splendid fellow. His outburst the other day was quite natural, under the circumstances. "'Surely you can forgive him, Prudence?' "'There'll be more nor that betwixt us, Mr. Peter,' sighed Prue. "'Tis a strinkin. Six months ago he promised me never to touch another drop, and he broke his word with me.' "'But surely good ale in moderation will harm no man. Nay, on the contrary—' "'But Charles bean't like other men, Mr. Peter.' "'No, he is much bigger and stronger,' said I, "'and I never saw a handsomer fellow.' Yes, nodded the girl, so strong as a giant, and so weak as a little child. Indeed, Prudence, said I, leaning near to her in my earnestness, I think you are a little unjust to him. So far as I know him, George is anything but weak-minded, or liable to be led into anything. Hearing the ancient chuckle gleefully, I glanced up to find him nodding and winking to Black George, who stood with folded arms and bent head, watching us from beneath his brows, and as his eyes met mine, I thought they gleamed strangely in the firelight. "'Come, Prue,' said the ancient, bustling forward. "'Table's ready. Let's sit down and eat. Fainting and famishing away, I be.' So we presently sat down, all three of us, while Prudence carved and supplied our wants, as only Prudence could. And, after a while, our hunger being appeased, I took out my pipe, as did the ancient and George theirs, likewise, and together we filled them, slowly and carefully, as pipes should be filled, while Prudence folded a long paper spill wherewith to light them, the which she proceeded to do, beginning at her father's churchwarden. Now, while she was lighting mine, Black George suddenly rose, and, crossing to the forge, took thence a glowing coal with the tongs, thus doing the office for himself. All at once I saw Prue's hand was trembling, and the spill was dropped, or ever my tobacco was well alight. Then she turned swiftly away, and began replacing the plates and knives and forks in her basket. "'Be you a magone, Prue?' inquired the ancient mumblingly, for his pipe was in full blast. "'Yes, Grandfer.' "'Then tell Simon as I'll be along in half an hour or so, will ye, lass?' "'Yes, Grandfer. "'Always with her back to us.' "'Then kiss ye all, Grandfather, as loves ye, and means for to see ye well bestowed and wed one of these fine days.' Prudence stooped, and pressed her flesh, red lips, to his wrinkled old cheek, and, catching up her basket, turned to the door, 
yet not so quickly, but that I had caught the gleam of tears beneath her lashes. Black George half rose from his seat, and stretched out his hand towards her burden, then sat down again as, with a hasty, "'Good night,' she vanished through the yawning doorway, and sitting there we listened to her quick light footstep cross the road to the bull. "'She'll make some man a fine wife some day,' exclaimed the ancient, blowing out a cloud of smoke. "'Hey, she'll make some man as fine a wife as ever was some day.' "'You speak my very thought, ancient,' said I. "'She will indeed.' "'What do you think, George?' But George's answer was to choke suddenly, and thereafter to fall a-coughing. "'Smoke go to wrong way, George?' inquired the ancient, fixing him with his bright eye. "Eh," nodded George. "'Ha!' said the old man, and we smoked for a time in silence. "'So handsome as a picter she be,' said the ancient suddenly. "'She is fairer than any picture,' said I impulsively, "'and what is better still, her nature is as sweet and beautiful as her face.' "'How do you know that?' said George, turning sharply upon me. "'My eyes and ears tell me so, as you are surely must have done long ago,' I answered. "'He do think as she be a putty lass, then, Peter?' inquired the ancient. "'I think.' said I, that she is the prettiest lass I ever saw. Don't you think so, George? But again George's only answer was to choke. Eh, smoke again, George? inquired the ancient. Hey, said George, as before. Tis a fine thing to be young, said the ancient, after a somewhat lengthy pause, and with a wave of his long pipe-stem. A very fine thing. It is, said I, though we generally realize it all too late. As for George, he went on smoking. When you are young, pursued the ancient, you eats well and enjoys it. You sleeps well and enjoys it. Your legs is strong, your arms is strong, and you be in to fear of nothing nor nobody. Oh, life's a very fine thing when you're young, but youth's terrible quick a goin. The years roll slow at first, but gets quicker and quicker till, till one day, you wakes to find you am an old man, and when you am old, the way gets very hard, and toilsome, and lonely. But there is always memory, said I. You am right there, Peter. So there be, so there be. Why, I be a old, old man, with more years than airs on my head. And yet it seems but yesterday as I were holding on to my mother's skirt and wondering how the moon got lighted. Life be very short, Peter, and while we have it, tis well to get all the happiness out of it we can. The wisest men of all ages preach the same, said I, only they all disagreed as to how happiness was to be gained. More fools they, said the ancient. Eh? I exclaimed, sitting up. "'More fools they!' repeated the old man, with a solemn nod. "'Why, then, do you know how true happiness may be found?' "'To be sure I do, Peter.' "'How?' "'By marriage, Peter, and hard work, and they always goes together.' "'Marriage?' said I. "'Marriage, as ever was, Peter.' "'There I don't agree with you,' said I. "'That,' retorted the ancient, stabbing at me with his pipe-stem, that's because you never was married peter marriage said i marriage brings care and great responsibility and trouble for oneself means trouble for others what of that exclaimed the ancient tis care and responsibility is mac the man and if you marry a good wife she'll share the burden with you and ye'll find what seemed your troubles is a blessing after all when sorrow comes it is a sweet thing, oh, a very sweet thing, to have a woman to comfort you, and hold your hand in the dark hour. And there's no sympathy so tender as a woman's, Peter. Then, when you be old, like me, and full of years, it is a fine thing to have a son of your own, like Simon, and a granddaughter, like my Prue. It is worth having lived for, Peter, eh? Well worth it. It's a man's duty to marry, Peter. His duty to himself and the world. 
Don't the Bible say something about it not being good for a man to live alone? Every man as is a man should marry. The sooner the better. But, said I, to every happy marriage there are scores of miserable ones. Cause why, Peter? Cause people is in too much a hurry to marry as a rule. If a man marries a lass after knowing her a week, how is he going to know if she'll suit him all his days? No how, Peter. It are not natural. Woman takes a lot of knowing. Man in haste and repent in leisure. That aren't in the Bible, but it ought to be. And your own marriage was a truly happy one, ancient? Ah, that it were, Peter, happy as ever was. But then, you see, there was a providence in it. I were a fine young chap in them days, summat of your figure only bigger. Ah, a sight bigger. And I were sweet on several lassies, and won't say as they weren't sweet on me. The three of them especially so. One was a tall, bouncing wench with blue eyes and golden hair. Like sunshine it were. But it weren't meant as I should buckle up with her. Why not? Because it so happened as she married someone else. <laughs> and the second? The second were a fine, pretty maid, too. But I couldn't marry she. Why? Because, Peter, she, she went and took and died afore I could ax her. And the third you married? No, Peter. Though it come to the same thing in the end, <laughs> she married I. You see, though I were always at her beck and call, I could never pluck the courage to up and ax her right out. So things went on for a year or so, maybe, till one day she were making apple dumplings, Peter. Martin, says she, looking at me sideways out of her black eyes, just like prues they were. Martin, she says, you am uncommon fond of apple dumplings? For sure, says I, which I were, Peter. Martin, says she, shouldn't he like to eat em whenever you wanted to, at your very own table in a cottage of your own? Ah, if you'd make em, says I, sharp like, I would if you'd ax me, Martin, says she. And so we was married, Peter. And as you see, there was a providence in it, for if the first one hadn't married someone else, and the second hadn't died, I might have married one of they, and repented it all my days. For I were young then, and foolish, Peter, were foolish. So saying, the ancient rose, sighing, and knocked the ashes from his pipe. Talking about Prue said he, taking up his hat and removing his snuff-box therefrom, ere he set it upon his head. "'Talking about Prue,' he repeated, with a pinch of snuff at his nostrils. "'Well?' the words seemed shot out of George involuntarily. "'Talking about Prue,' said the ancient again, glancing at each of us in turn. "'There were some folks as used to think she were sweet on charge there.' But I, uh, being her lawful grandfather, knowed different, didn't I, charge? Hey, nodded the smith. And many's the time I've said to you a-sittin' in this very corner, charge, I've said, mark my words. Charge, if ever my prue does marry someone, which she will, that there someone won't be you. Them be my very words, be it they, charge. "'Your very words, Gaffer,' nodded George. "'Well, then,' continued the old man, "'here's what I was a-comin' to. "'Prue's been and fell in love with someone at last.' Black George's pipe shivered to fragments on the floor, and as he leaned forward I saw that his great hands were tightly clenched. "'Gaffer,' said he in a strangled voice, "'what do he mean?' "'I means what I says, George.' How do we know? Beant I the lass's grandfather? Be sure, Gaffer, quite sure. Eh, hey, sartin sure. Twice this week, and once the week afore, she forgot to put any salt in the soup. And that speaks Wallum's charge, Wallum's. Here, having replaced his snuff-box, the ancient put on his hat, nodded, and hobbled away. 
As for Black George, he sat there, staring blindly before him long after the tapping of the ancient stick had died away. Nor did he heed me when I spoke, wherefore I laid my hand upon his shoulder. "'Come, George,' said I. "'Another hour and the screen will be finished.' He started, and, drawing from my hand, looked up at me very strangely. "'No, Peter,' he mumbled. "'I aren't a going to work no more to-night.' And as he spoke he rose to his feet. "'What, are, are you going?' said I, as he crossed to the door. "'Eh, hey, I'm a-going.' Now, as he went towards his cottage, I saw him reel and stagger like a drunken man. Chapter 33 In Which We Draw Yet Nearer to the End of This First Book It is not my intention to chronicle all those minor happenings that befell me, now or afterward, lest this history prove wearisome to the reader, on the which head I begin to entertain grave doubts already. Suffice it, then, that as the days grew into weeks, and the weeks into months, by perseverance I became reasonably expert at my trade, so that, some two months after my meeting with Black George, I could shoe a horse with any smith in the country. But more than this, the people with whom I associated day by day, honest, loyal, and simple-hearted as they were, contented with their lot, and receiving all things so unquestioningly and thankfully, filled my life, and brought a great calm to a mind that had hitherto been somewhat self-centered and troubled by pessimistic doubts and fantastic dreams culled from musty pages. What book is there to compare with the great book of life, whose pages are forever a-turning, wherein are marvels and wonders undreamed, things to weep over, and some few to laugh at, if one but has eyes in one's head to see withal? to walk through the whispering cornfields, or the long green alleys of the hop-gardens with Simon, who combines innkeeping with farming, to hear him tell of fruit and flower, of bird and beast, is better than to read the Georgics of Virgil. To sit in the sunshine and watch the ancient, pipe in mouth, to hearken to his animate versions upon life and death and humanity, is better than the cynical wit of Rochefoucauld, or a page out of honest old Montaigne. To see the proud poise of sweet Prue's averted head, and the tender look in her eyes when George is near, and the surge of the mighty chest, and the tremble of the strong man's hand at the sound of her light footfall, is more enthralling than any written romance, old or new. In regard to these latter, I began at this time to contrive schemes and to plot plots for bringing them together to bridge over the difficulty which separated them, for, being happy, I would fain see them happy also. Now how I succeeded in this self-imposed task, the reader, if he troubled to read far enough, shall see for himself. "'George,' said I, on a certain Saturday morning, as I washed the grime from my face and hands, "'are you going to the fair this afternoon?' "'No, Peter, I aren't.' "'But Prudence is going.' said I, drying myself vigorously upon the towel. "'And how?' inquired the smith, bending in turn above the bucket in which we performed our ablutions. "'And how might you know that, Peter?' "'Because she told me so.' "'Told you so, did she?' said George, and immediately plunged his head into the bucket. "'She did,' I answered. "'And supposing?' said George, coming up very red in the face, and with the water streaming from his sodden curls. "'Supposin' she is goin' to the fair. What's that to me? I don't care where she comes, no, nor where she goes, neither.' And he shook the water from him as a dog might. "'Are you quite sure, George?' "'Ah, sartin sure. I've been sure of it now ever since she called me.' Oh, "'Pooh! Nonsense, man! She didn't mean it.' Women, especially young ones, often say things they do not mean. At least, so I am given to understand. "'Eh, hey, but she did mean it,' said George, frowning and nodding his head. "'But it ain't that, Peter, no. It aren't that. It's the knowin' as she spoke truth when she called me coward, and despisin' me for it in her heart. That's where it is, Peter.' 
Oh, nevertheless, I'm sure she never meant it, George. Then let her come and tell me so. I don't think she'll do that, said I. No more do I, Peter. Saying which he fell to work with the towel, even as I had done. George, said I after a silence. Well, Peter? Has it ever struck you that Prudence is an uncommonly handsome girl? To be sure it has, Peter. I were blind else. And that other men may see this too? Well, Peter? And someone even tell her so. His answer was a long time coming, but come it did at last. Well, Peter? And ask her to marry him, George. This time he was silent so long that I had tied my neckerchief and drawn on my coat ere he spoke, very heavily and slowly, and without looking at me. Why, then, Peter, let him. I've told ye afore, I don't care where she comes, nor where she goes, but she beant nothing to me no more, nor I to she. If so be some man is a mind to ax her for herself, all open and above board, I say again, let him. And now, let's talk of summit else. Willingly. There's to be boxing, and single stick, and wrestling at the fair, I understand. Eh? And they tell me there is a famous wrestler coming all the way from Cornwall to wrestle the best man for ten guineas. Eh, so there be. Well? Well, Peter? They were talking about it at the bull last night. The bull? To be sure. He was at the bull last night. Well? They were saying that you were a mighty wrestler, George, that you were the only man in these parts who could stand up to this Cornishman. Eh, I can wrestle a bit, Peter, he replied, speaking in the same heavy, listless manner. What then? Why then, George, get your coat, and let's be off. We are two. The fair. Black George shook his head. What, you won't? No, Peter. And why not? Because I aren't got the mind to because I aren't never going to wrestle no more, Peter, so there's an end on it. Yet in the doorway I paused and looked back. George? Peter? Won't you come, for friendship's sake? Black George picked up his coat, looked at it, and put it down again. No, Peter. End of section 13. Section 14 of The Broad Highway by Geoffrey Farnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Leader. Book 1, Chapter 34, which describes sundry happenings at the fair and ends this first book. I say, young cove. Where are you a pushin' of? The speaker was a very tall individual, whose sharp pointed elbow had, more than once, obtruded itself into my ribs. He was extremely thin and bony, with a long drooping nose set very much to one side, and was possessed of a remarkable pair of eyes. That is to say, one eyelid hung continually lower than the other, thus lending to his otherwise sinister face an air of droll and unexpected waggery that was quite startling to behold. All about us were jostling throngs of men and women in snowy smock-frocks and holiday gowns who pushed, or were pushed, laughed, or frowned, according to their several natures, while above the merry hubbub rose the blare of trumpets, the braying of horns, and the crash and rattle of drums. In a word, I was in the middle of an English country fair. "'Now then, young cove,' repeated the man I have alluded to, "'where are you a-pushin' of? Don't do it again, or mind your eye!' And saying this, he glared balefully at me with one eye, and leered jocosely with the other, and into my ribs came his elbow again. "'You seem to be able to do something in that way yourself,' I retorted. "'Oh, do I? 
Yes, said I. Suppose you take your elbow out of my waistcoat. Elber? repeated the man. What do you mean by elber? This, said I, catching his arm in no very gentle grip. If it's a fight you're wanting, begged the man. It isn't, said I. Then let go my arm. Then keep your elbow to yourself. God, I never see such a hot-headed cove. Nor I a more bad-tempered one. This altercation had taken place as we swayed to and fro in the crowd, from which we now slowly won free, owing chiefly to the dexterous use of the man's bony elbows, until we presently found ourselves in a veritable jungle of carts and wagons, of all kinds and sorts, where we stopped facing each other. "'I'm inclined to think, young cove, as you'd be short-tempered if you'd been shaded by your fellow men from your youth up,' said the man. "'What do you mean by shied at?' "'What I says. Some professions is easy, and some is hard, like mine. And what is yours?' "'I'm a professional sambo.' "'A what?' "'Well, a niggerhead, then. Blacks me face, sticks my head through a hole, and lets em shy at me. Three shies a penny, them as itch me gets a cigar, a big un, them as don't, don't.' "'Yours is a very unpleasant profession,' said I. "'A man must live.' "'But,' said I, "'supposing you get hit. "'Them as it's me gets a cigar. "'Doesn't it hurt you?' "'Oh, you gets used to it, "'though to be sure they don't hit me very often, "'or it would be a loss. "'Cigars is expensive. "'Leastways, they cost money. "'But surely a wooden image "'would serve your turn just as well. "'A wooden image!' exclaimed the man disgustedly. "'James, you must be a fool, you must. Who wants to throw at a wooden image? You can't hurt a wooden image, can you? If you throwed Evans hard at a wooden image, that there wooden image wouldn't flinch, would it? When a man throws at anything, he likes to hit it. That's human. And when he hits it, he likes to see it flinch. That's human, too. And when it flinches, why, he rubs his hands and takes another shot.' Then that's the humanist of all. So you see, young cove, you're a fool with your wooden image. Now, as he ended, I stooped very suddenly and caught hold of his wrist, and then I saw that he held my purse in his hands. It was a large hand with bony knuckles and very long fingers, upon one of which was a battered ring. He attempted at first to free himself of my grip, but finding this useless, stood glowering at me with one eye and leering with the other. "'Ha!' Ah, said I. "'Hello!' said he. "'A purse!' said I. "'Why, so it is!' he nodded. Well, "'Leastways, it looks uncommonly like one, don't it?' "'What's more, it looks like mine.' Oh, "'Does it? I could swear to it anywhere. Could you?' I could. Then perhaps you'd better take it, young cove, and very welcome, I'm sure. So you've been picking my pocket, said I. Oh, never picked a pocket in my life. Should scorn to. I put away my recovered property, and straightway shifted my grip to the fellow's collar. Now, said I, come on. Why, what are you a-doing of? What does one generally do with a pickpocket? But I had hardly uttered the words when, with a sudden cunning twist, he broke my hold and, my foot catching in a guy rope, I tripped and fell heavily, and ere I could rise he had made good his escape. I got to my feet, somewhat shaken by the fall, yet congratulating myself on the recovery of my purse, and, threading my way among the tents, was soon back among the crowds. Here were circuses and shows of all kinds, where one might behold divers strange beasts, the usual fat woman and skeleton men, who ever heard of the order being reversed, and before the shows were fellows variously attired, but each being purplish of visage, and each possessing the lungs of a stentor, more especially one, a round-bellied, bottle-nosed fellow in a white hat, who alternately roared and beat upon a drum. A red-haired man was he, with a fiery eye, which eye, chancing to single me out in the crowd, fixed itself pertinaciously upon me. 
thenceforth, so that he seemed to address himself exclusively to me thus. All my stars, young man, bang goes the drum. The wonderful wild airy and savage man from Banhula, as each snakes alive and dresses himself into sheeny serpents. Oh my eye, step up, young man. Bang. Likewise the astonishing and beautiful lady Polinolati, as will swallow swords, sabres, bayonets, also chewing up glass and bottles quicker than you can wink, young man. Bang. Not to mention Catamaplusus, the fire fiend, what burns itself with red hot irons and likes it, drinks liquid fire with gusto, playfully spitting forth the same, together with flame and sulphur smoke, and all for sixpence, young man. Bang. Oh, my stars, step up, young man, and all for a tanner. Bang. Presently his eye being off me for the moment, I edged my way out of the throng, and so came to where a man stood mounted upon a cart. Beside him was a fellow in a clown's habit, who blew loudly three times upon a trumpet, which done, the man took off his hat and began to harangue the crowd, something in this wise. I come before you, ladies and gentlemen, not for a vulgar gain, or as I might say, a kudos, which is I Italian for the same, not to put my hands into your pockets, and rifle em of your honestly earned money. No, I come before you for the good of each one of you, for the easing of suffering mankind, as I might say, the humiliation of stricken humanity. In a word, I am here to introduce to you what I call my elixir anthropos. Anthropos, ladies and gentlemen, is an old and very ancient Egyptian word meaning a man, or woman, for that matter, etc. During this exordium I had noticed a venerable man in a fine blue surtout and a wide-brimmed hat, who sat upon the shaft of a cart and puffed slowly at a great pipe, and as he puffed he listened intently to the quacksalver's address, and from time to time his eyes would twinkle and his lips curve in an ironic smile. The cart, upon the shaft of which he sat, stood close to a very small, dirty, and disreputable-looking tent towards which the old gentleman's back was turned. Now, as I watched, I saw the point of a knife gleam through the dirty canvas, which, vanishing, gave place to a hand protruded through the slit thus made, a very large hand with bony knuckles, and long fingers, upon one of which was a battered ring. For an instant the hand hovered undecidedly, then darted forward, the long skirts of the old gentleman's coat hardly stirred, yet even as I watched I saw the hand vanish with a fat purse in its clutches. Skirting the tent, I came round to the opening, and, stooping, peered cautiously inside. There, sure enough, was my pickpocket, gazing intently into the open purse, and chuckling as he gazed. Then he slipped it into his pocket, and out he came where I immediately pinned him by the neckerchief. And after a while, finding he could not again break my hold, he lay still beneath me, panting, and, as he lay, his one eye glared more balefully, and his other leered more waggishly than ever, as I, thrusting my hand into his pocket, took thence the purse, and transferred it to my own. "'Avs, mate,' he panted, "'avs, and we'll cry quits.' "'By no means.' said I, rising to my feet, but keeping my grip upon him. Then what's your game? I intend to hand you over as a pickpocket. That means transportation, said he, wiping the blood from his face, for the struggle, though short, had been sharp enough. Well, said I, it'll go hard with that babby. Baby, I exclaimed. Ah, or the infant, if you like it better. One is I found in a shawl, a laying on the steps of my van one night, sleeping like a alderman, and it were snowing too. Yet you are a thief. We calls it uh, faking. 
and ought to be given up to the authorities. And who's to look after the baby? Are you married? No. Where is the baby? In my van. And where is that? Yonder. And he pointed to a gaily painted caravan that stood nearby. He's asleep now, but if you'd like to take a peep at him. I should, said I. Whereupon the fellow led me to his van, and, following him up the steps, I entered a place which, though confined, was wonderfully neat and clean, with curtains at the open windows, a rug upon the floor, and an ornamental brass lamp pendant from the roof. At the far end was a bed, or rather berth, curtained with shints, and upon this bed his chubby face pillowed upon a dimpled fist lay a very small man indeed and looking up from him to the very large bony man bending over him, I surprised a look upon the hardened face, a tenderness that seemed very much out of place. "'Nice and fat, ain't he?' said the man, touching the baby's apple-like cheek with a grimy finger. "'Yes.' "'Ah, and so he should be, James. But you should see him eat. An alderman's nothing to Lewis. I calls him Lewis, for twere at Lewisham I found him on a Christmas Eve. Snowman it was, but by James it didn't bother him, not a bit. And why did you keep him? There was the parish. Parish? repeated the man bitterly. I were brought up by the parish myself, and a nice job they made of me. Don't you find him a great trouble? Trouble? exclaimed the man. Lewis ain't no trouble, not a bit, never was. And he's great company when I'm on the move from one town to another, learning to talk already. Now, said I, when he had descended from the van, I propose to return this purse to the owner, if he is to be found. If not, I shall hand it to the proper authorities. Walker! exclaimed the man. You shall yourself witness the restitution, said I, unheeding his remark, after which, well said he, glancing back toward his caravan, and moistening his lips as I tightened my grip upon his arm. "'What about me?' "'You can go. For Lewis's sake, if you will give me your word to live honestly henceforth.' Oh, "'You have it, sir. I swear it. On the Bible, if you like.' "'Then let us seek the owner of this purse.' So, coming in a while to where the quack doctor was still holding forth, there, yet seated upon the shaft of the cart, puffing at his great pipe, was the venerable man. At sight of him the pickpocket stopped and caught my arm. "'Come, master,' said he, "'come, you never mean to give up all that good money. There's fifty guineas, and more in that purse.' "'All the more reason to return it,' said I. "'No, don't—' "'Don't go a-wasting good money like that. It's like throwing it away.' But shaking off the fellow's importunate hand, I approached and saluted the venerable man. "'Sir,' said I, "'you have had your pocket picked.' He turned and regarded me with a pair of deep-set, very bright eyes, and blew a whiff of smoke slowly into the air. "'Sir,' he replied, "'I found that out five minutes ago.' "'The fact seems to trouble you very little,' said I. "'There, sir, being young and judging exteriorly, you are wrong. "'There is recounted somewhere in the classics "'an altogether incredible story of a Spartan youth and a fox. "'The boy, with the animal hid beneath his cloak, "'preserved an unruffled demeanour "'despite the animal's tearing teeth, "'until he fell down and died. "'In the same way, young sir, no man can lose fifty-odd guineas from his pocket and remain unaffected by the loss. Then, sir, said I, I am happy to be able to return your purse to you. He took it, opened it, glanced over its contents, looked at me, took out two guineas, looked at me again, put the money back, closed the purse, and, dropping it into his pocket, bowed his acknowledgment. Having done which, he made room for me to sit beside him. <laughs> sir, said he, chuckling, hark to that lovely rascal in the cart yonder, hark to him. Galen was an ass, and Hippocrates a dunce beside this fellow, hark to him. 
there's nothing like peels the quacksilver was saying at the top of his voice place one upon the tip of the tongue in this fashion take a drink o water beer or wine as the case may be give a couple of swallows and there you are oh there's a nothing in the world like pills and there's a nothing like my elixir anthropos for coughs colds and the rheumatics for sore throats sore eyes sore backs good for the croup measles and chicken pox a certain cure for dropsy scurvy and the king's evil there's no disease or ailment discovered or invented as my pills won't soothe heal ameliorate and charm away and all i charge is one shilling a box hand em round jonas whereupon the fellow in the clown's dress stepping down from the cart began handing out the boxes of pills and taking in the shillings as fast as he conveniently could a thriving trade said my venerable companion it always has been and always will for humanity is a many-headed fool and loves to be bamboozled these honest folk are probably paying for bread pellets compounded with a little soap yet will go home swallow them in all good faith and think themselves a great deal better for them and therefore said i probably derive as much benefit from them as from any drug yet discovered young man said my companion giving me a sharp glance what do you mean plainly sir that a man who believes himself cured of a disease is surely on the high road to recovery but a belief in the efficacy of that rascal's bread pellets cannot make them anything but bread pellets no said i but it may affect great things with the disease young man don't tell me that you are a believer in faith healing and such like tomfoolery disease is a great and terrible reality and must be met and overcome by a real means oh, on the contrary sir may it not be rather the outcome of a preconceived idea of a belief that has been held universally for many ages and generations of men i do not deny disease who could but suffering and disease have been looked upon from the earliest days as punishments wrought out upon a man for his sins now may not the haunting fear of this retributive justice be greatly responsible for suffering and disease of all kinds since the mind unquestionably reacts upon the body probably sir probably but since disease is with us how would you propose to remedy it by disbelieving in it by regarding it as something abnormal and utterly foreign to the divine order of things pooh exclaimed my venerable companion bah quite quite impracticable they say the same of the servant on the mount sir i retorted can a man wasting away in a decline discredit the fact that he is dying with every breath he draws had you or i or any man the christ power to teach him a disbelief in his sickness then would he be hale and well the great physician healed all diseases thus without the aid of drugs seeking only to implant in the mind of each sufferer the knowledge that he was whole and sound that is to say a total disbelief in his malady how many times do we read the words thy faith hath made thee whole all he demanded of them was faith or as i say a disbelief in their disease then the cures of christ were not miracles no more than any great and noble work is a miracle and do you inquired my companion removing his pipe from his lips and staring at me very hard do you believe that jesus christ was the son of god yes said i in the same way that you and i are and the quacksalver yonder but was he divine oh, surely a mighty thinker a great teacher whose hand points the higher way whose words inspire humanity to nobler ends and aims is of necessity divine you are a very bold young man 
and talk, I think, a little wildly. Heterodoxy has been styled so before, sir. And a very young, young man. Well, that, sir, will be amended by time. Here, puffing at his pipe, and finding it gone out, he looked at me in surprise. Remarkable, said he. What is, sir? While I listened to you, I have actually let my pipe go out, a thing which rarely happens with me. As he spoke, he thrust one hand into his pocket, when he glanced slowly round, and back once more to me. Remarkable, said he again. What now, sir? My purse has gone again. What, gone? I ejaculated. Vanished, said he and, to prove his words, turned inside out first one pocket and then the other. "'Come with me,' said I, springing up. "'There is yet a chance that we may possibly recover it.' Forthwith I led him to where had stood a certain gaily painted caravan. But it was gone, vanished as utterly as my companion's purse. "'Most annoying,' said he, shaking his venerable head. "'Really, most exasperating!' I particularly wish to secure a sample of that fellow's pills. The collection of quack remedies is a fad of mine, as it is. My purse is entirely at your disposal, sir, said I, though, to be sure, a very— But there I stopped, staring in my turn blankly at him. Ha! Huh? he exclaimed, his eyes twinkling. Yes, I nodded. The rascal made off with my purse also. We are companions in misfortune. Then, as such, young sir, come and dine with me. My habitation is but a little way off. Thank you, sir, but I am half expecting to meet with certain good friends of mine, though I am none the less honoured by your offer. So be it, young sir. Then permit me to wish you a very good day. And, touching the brim of his hat with the long stem of his pipe, the venerable man turned and left me. Howbeit, though I looked diligently on all hands, I saw nothing of Simon or the Ancient. Thus evening was falling, as, bending my steps homeward, I came to a part of the fair where drinking booths had been set up, and where they were preparing to roast an ox whole, as is the immemorial custom. Drinking was going on, with its usual accompaniment of boisterous merriment and rough horseplay, the vulgarity of which ever annoys me. Two or three times I was rudely jostled as I made my way along, so that my temper was already something the worse, when, turning aside to avoid all this, I came full upon two fellows, well-to-do farmers by their look, who held a struggling girl between them, to each of whom I reached out a hand, and, gripping them firmly by their collars, brought their two heads together with a sounding crack. And then I saw that the girl was Prudence. Next moment we were running, hand in hand, with the two fellows roaring in pursuit. But Prudence was wonderfully fleet and light of foot, wherefore, doubling and turning among carts, tents, and booths, we had soon outstripped our pursuers, and rid ourselves of them altogether. In spite of which Prudence still ran on, till, catching her foot in some obstacle, she tripped, and would have fallen but for my arm and looking down into her flushed face, glowing through the sweet disorder of her glossy curls, I could not but think how lovely she was. But, as I watched, the color fled from her cheeks, her eyes dilated, and she started away from me. Now turning hastily I saw that we were standing close by a certain small, dirty, and disreputable-looking tent, the canvas of which had been slit with a knife and my movement had been quick enough to enable me to see a face vanish through the canvas. And fleeting though the glimpse had been, yet in the lowering brow, the baleful glare of the eye, and the set of the great jaw, I had seen death. And after we had walked on a while together, looking at Prue, I noticed that she trembled. "'Oh, Mr. Peter!' she whispered, glancing back over her shoulder. "'Did you see?' "'Yes, Prudence, I saw.' 
and speaking I also glanced back towards the villainous little tent, and though the face appeared no more, I was aware, nevertheless, of a sudden misgiving that was almost like a foreboding of evil to come. For in those features, disfigured though they were with black rage and passion, I had recognized the face of Black George. A WORD TO THE READER Remembering the very excellent advice of my friend the Tinker as to the writing of a good novel, I am perturbed, and not a little discouraged, upon looking over these pages to find that I have, as yet, described no desperate hand-to-hand -hand encounters, no hair-breadth escapes, unless a bullet through one's hat may be justly so regarded, and above all, not one word of love. You, sir, who have expectantly borne with me thus far, may be tempted to close the book in a huff, and, hurling it from you with a deep voice anathema, clap on your hat, and sally forth into the sunshine. Or you, madam, breathing a sigh or hopes deferred, may take up needle and silk, and turn you once again to that embroidery which has engaged your dainty fingers this twelfth month and more, yet which, like Penelope's web, would seem no nearer completion. Ah, well, sir, exercise, especially walking, is highly beneficial to the liver, they tell me, and nothing, madam, believe me, unless it be playing the harp, can show off a pretty hand or the delicate curves of a shapely wrist and arm to such advantage as that self-same embroidery. But since needlework, like books and all sublunary things, is apt to grow monotonous, you may, perchance, for lack of better occupation, be driven to address yourself once more to this my narrative. And, since you, sir, no matter how far you walk, must of necessity return to your chair and chimney-corner, it is possible that, having dined adequately, and lighted your pipe, and being therefore in a more charitable and temperate frame of mind, you may lift my volume from the dusty corner where it has lain all this while, and, though probably with sundry grunts and snorts, indicative that the thing is done under protest, as it were, reopen these pages, in the hope which, dear madam, and you, noble sir, I here commence this, my second book, which, as you see, is headed thus. The Woman. End of section fourteen and end of book one. Recording by John Leader, Bloomington, Illinois.